Representatives, the President. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Senators, I invite you, as I read the prayer, to pray or reflect in your own way on your responsibilities to the people of Australia and to future generations. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou would be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Yes, President. I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. Are there new proposals for uh, committees to meet during the sitting of the Senate, Clark? Yes, President. A committee has lodged a proposal as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. Senators, today is the first anniversary of the Sex Discrimination Commissioner's Set the Standard report on the independent review into Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces Set the Standard report and uh, I welcome that one-year anniversary. As presiding officers, we again acknowledge the history of unacceptable behaviour in Parliament House and recommit the Parliament to positive change. The Set the Standard report highlighted that a high rate of people, particularly women, in Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces have experienced bullying, sexual harassment or actual or attempted sexual assault. This is unacceptable. We restate the commitment of the parliament to making lasting change to ensure this does not continue. We have an ongoing responsibility to create workplaces that attract and support the best people our country has to offer. The Parliamentary Leadership Task Force is leading meaningful change. Uh, it's doing that within the parliament, and we commend their commitment in understanding and addressing the issues that have been ignored for too long. Since February, there has already been significant progress in implementing the 28 recommendations of the report. Legislation has been amended to clarify our duties in respect of employment, anti-discrimination and work health and safety laws. Proposed codes of conduct uh, will be released shortly that cover the work of parliamentarian staff and parliamentary workplaces, and I commend that committee on its work today. Changes to the sitting calendar and hours of sitting now consider wellbeing, balance and flexibility. New parliamentarians and their staff have participated in refreshed induction processes. A feasibility study into a parliamentary health and wellbeing service is being conducted, with plans to improve services for parliamentarians and staff, including GP services, pharmaceutical and mental health supports. Work is underway to improve work health and safety, accessibility for those with disability and professional support available for parliamentarians and staff. The Parliamentary Workplace Support Service has been expanded. It is already providing confidential support and advice to those in Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces. The Senate and House Procedure Committees are examining orders and conventions to improve levels of safety and respect in the chamber and to enhance wellbeing balance and flexibility. Looking forward, some of the notable work underway includes the establishment of a new human resources function to support parliamentarians and their staff, and the development of new measures to support greater diversity 
and inclusion. The framework for action set out in the Set the Standard report is leadership, diversity and inclusion, accountability and safety and wellbeing. We all have a responsibility to display exemplary individual leadership. We all have a role to play to set the standard for an inclusive, respectful and professional workplace here in Parliament House and across Australia. Thank you, Senators. I call Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I move that the following bills be considered at the time for private senators' bills this week. Uh, the Fair Work Amendment Equal Pay for Equal Work Bill 2022 and today, and Commonwealth Electoral Amendment Banning Dirty Donations Bill 2022 on Thursday, the 1st of December. So the question is. Um, that the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe that's carried. I call the clerk. Private Senator's Bill, uh, order of the day number one, Fair Work Amendment, Equal Pay for Equal Work Bill 2022, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Roberts. Senator Roberts. Thank you. <coughs> Speaking as a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, my Fair Work Amendment Equal Pay for Equal Work Bill 2022 was drafted in response to exploitation of casual coal miners in central Queensland and the Hunter Valley. It's since been widened. My bill was referred to the Education and Legislation Committee, Employment Committee for inquiry, and I thank the committee for organising a public hearing so miners could testify on their exploitation personally. The committee found there was a need for my bill, yet then recommended waiting for the government's version. Labor announced its hollow fair work for fair pay idea back in 2018. Four years ago, Labor and the unions campaigned on their bill in the 2019 state election in New South Wales and the 2019 federal election. The problem is Labor's bill did not exist. I confirmed that and began drafting my bill in April 2021. Labor's bill was not introduced into Parliament until December of 21, a month after my bill was completed and three years after Labor first promised it. If the Labor Party was serious about fixing this issue, their bill would have appeared in 2018, not three years later, four years later, after One Nation repeatedly called them out. Labor's bill was a dog's breakfast, so the government has chosen to start over. Now, I accept the government saying it's just started meeting with stakeholders, yet a briefing with the, Prime, with the minister's advisers last week reveals that consultation has only been with the companies and union bosses that perpetrated this scandal. <clears throat> the miners, air crew, ground crew and other workers ripped off for tens of millions of dollars in wages have not yet been consulted after six months, which of course means the Labor Party, the CFMEU and the industry are trying to find a way to keep these labour hire contracts going. I'll explain why in a minute. And so I'm advancing my bill, preparing for a vote early next year. I thank Senator, Senator Babette for allowing me to use his bill's time today. Early in my career, I spent three years in the union as an underground coalface miner, including the Hunter and Queensland. My father was an underground coalface miner, senior executive and later Queensland chief inspector of mines. He was awarded an Austra Order of Australia for eliminating black lung in our state's coal industry. Having completed an honours degree in engineering, I returned to manage coal mines involving daily interaction with the CFMEU and the Hunter and in Queensland. This issue is very personal to me because the CFMEU and its predecessor, the Miners' Federation, were once strong unions that looked after and served their members. The reports I received to my Senate office in 2019 from Queensland and the Hunter have shocked me. After visiting these areas repeatedly and listening with miners, I was no longer shocked. I am outraged, outraged at the injustice. The big picture is this. Labor hire companies were employing casuals in black coal industry production despite the award not allowing it. It was illegal. Exclusion of casuals extends beyond the black coal industry. It includes airline flight crew and other awards, which I'll speak to in a moment. Back to the black coal award. Casuals are excluded for a good reason. Coal mining can be dangerous. It requires training and constant skilling to improve productivity and, most importantly, for safety. Safety of an individual miner and safety of the whole mine and everyone in it. 
Underground miners typically retire ahead of most other industries when they can no longer do a miner's physical work. That's why proper unions like the old Miner Federation negotiated high rates of pay. The modern award is much lower than negotiated rates because it assumes miners can be reskilled and redeployed into other industries after they exit from mining, allowing for a full working life. That's a fairy tale. That simply ignores the reality of life in the coal industry. Labour hire contracts are used to cut miners' wages. This represents a 40 per cent cut in wages against the pay a permanent miner earns in a mine's direct employ, doing the same job side by side. Two Australians working side by side doing the same job on the same shift and one is getting 40 per cent less than the other. That is wrong. This has been going on for 10 years. Under the Hunter CFMEU, working with some mining companies and with protection from the local Labor members, Joel Fitzgibbon and Dan, now Dan Rapicoli. Casual coal workers on labour hire contracts supposedly receive a loading for the, the loss of holiday and sick pay, yet their pay packets are still 40 per cent less. What caused this large reduction in pay, pay rate was not the absence of a loading, because that was supposedly paid. It was the very low base rate that the CFMEU installed. In 2021, One Nation supported the concept of not enabling workers paid for casual loading because that was paid. What we did was to ensure that workers retained their rights under industrial laws to take legal action for illegal pay rates. Yet the CFMEU then lied, shouting that One Nation stopped workers from getting what was this. No! We upheld miners' rights to pay and entitlements while at the same time protecting small business from being forced to pay casual loading twice as some union bosses dishonestly demanded. It was the union that signed off on these enterprise agreements that robbed workers of 40 per cent of their pay. The Hunter CFMEU pocketed union dues from labour hire casuals and money from labour hire employers for dodgy enterprise agreements with low pay rates. It was the Hunter CFMEU that jointly directed coal long service leave funds that under accrued and avoided paying employer contributions to labour hire casuals. That I exposed and that a government review later confirmed me as correct. It was originally a Hunter CFMEU owned labour hire company that collected fees from the, miners, from the mines for supplying labour under a labour hire contract. The CFMEU is clearly directing labour to protect their nice little earner, even at the expense of the workers the Hunter CFMEU supposedly pretends to represent. While hypocritically and deceitfully speaking badly of casual employment and casual workers. The committee report accurately describes the effects on communities of the reduction in local spending due to taking wages out of the community. I was lucky enough to find a lawyer who drew these agreements up on behalf of Hunter labour hire companies and who has since seen the error of his ways. His advice informed my bill. Many exploited workers contributed to my bill. I have the most knowledgeable legal minds on labour hire contracts in the coal industry contributing to my bill, and I have generations of personal experience in the coal industry. What confuses my critics is that I'm not lining the IR club's pockets with overly complex, wishy-washy nonsense that opens more loopholes than it closes, as Labor's short-lived dog's breakfast did. My bill will fix this mess. My bill sets an additional provision for Fair Work Australia to require an enterprise agreement to pass before being approved. It allows an employee to appeal an existing enterprise agreement to Fair Work if an enterprise agreement breaches this new provision. The provision is simple. A worker on a labour hire contract must be paid the same rate of pay, including allowances, as a worker who is directly employed doing the same job in the same shift roster. That is clear. If the whole crew is labour hire, then the Commissioner must make a judgment on what the rate of pay should have been based on historical information and a comparison with similar minds and similar conditions. That is clear. The cost of using labour hire contractors will now fall on the employer rather than the worker. The intention is to require the employer to project their labour requirements, employ, train and nurture their people, you know, like employers used to. One complication is that some workers are on day shift and others on rotating shift. My bill takes that into consideration. Clause 3B of this bill expressly provides that the roster the employee is working must be considered in the assessment of equal pay for equal work. The committee report correctly identifies when labour hire contracts subvert the Black Coal Mining Industry Award 2010 and the Aircraft Cabin Crew Award 2020. I've circulated an amendment to this bill to include the Airline Operations Ground Staff Award 2020, which makes provisions 
for casuals that foreign companies bypass to exploit workers through labour hire contracts. I know Senator Sheldon is leading a fight against that exploitation. My bill will give him the ammunition to drag the whole situation back to fair work. I urge Senator Sheldon and Labor to adopt it. My bill simplicity will prevent lawyers feasting because it allows fair work commissioners discretion to make value judgments. I reckon they're up to it. The remaining awards are excluded in the Fair Work Amendment, Equal Pay for Equal Work Bill 2022, as a line in the sand. While labour hire agreements are not being abused in these industries, explicitly including those awards in this legislation was designed to ensure labour hire firms do not treat these awards as a new profit centre once the opportunity for exploitation is removed from coal mining and aircraft operations. Witnesses who discussed the treatment under labour hire contracts were pleased to have the opportunity to publicly testify, and I thank the committee. These workers were not always afforded that opportunity. Stuart Bonds from the Hunter listed case after case after case where miners have been employed under labour hire agreements with 40 per cent reduction in pay rate. More troubling were the stories of exploitation and victimisation these workers received, especially following a safety report or physical harm. Simon Turner testified to the committee on his inhuman experiences as an injured worker. He's one of many, sadly. Workers like Simon tried for years to get justice. The mine owner and the labour hire company completely ignored him, tossed him on the scrap heap. The Hunter CFMEU betrayed workers. Local Labor MPs let them down. Only when workers came to One Nation was progress made. Another worker on a labour hire contract saw a safety issue and reported it. Water trucks laying down too much water, creating slippery conditions. This worker was required to report that safety issue. Her contract was terminated the next week. There's no job security in labour hire contract arrangements. Workers injured at work were refused medical treatment and not paid workers' compensation or accident pay as legally required. Workers were afraid of reporting safety issues for fear of being sacked. Workers were rostered two years in advance to work 52 weeks of the year straight, no holidays. If you're working a full-time 12-hour shift and being given these shifts two years ahead, then you're not casual, you are a permanent worker. Despite being in effect permanence, these workers are unable to get home loans, car loans and provide a future for themselves and their families because banks won't lend to casual labour hire employees. When I say exploitation, I mean exploitation. All this happened with the Hunter CFMEU doing deals enabling mining companies more interested in profits than basic human decency. Labour hire deals and contracts are used to lower wages across an entire industry. Qantas pulled this stunt on their ground crew. It fired thousands of workers and re-employed them through labour hire co companies at the lowest rate of pay. What's a worker to do? Refuse the deal and have no job, or take the deal and try to get by on 40 per cent less? Qantas are using these tricks on flight crew and pilots as well. Senator Sheldon can speak to this, so I won't. Correct loading on a plane is vital to flight safety and people on the ground. In my meeting with Qantas, their executives defended their behaviour as being necessary to maintain viability. Qantas have run their staff into the ground, cut their pay to the bone, moved staff from full-time secure jobs to casual junk jobs, worked staff on shifts with not enough time to recover, provided insufficient training and supervision, and now things are going wrong. What a surprise. And they belted loyal, long-serving employees with COVID injection mandates. One Nation's Fair Work Amendment, Equal Pay for Equal Work Bill 2022, remains the only legislation before Parliament designed to correct this unfair and dishonest corporate behaviour. It should have been in the government's Fair Work Legislation Amendment, Secure Jobs, Better Pay Bill 2022. But it's not. Yet it's not too late. Here it is. I'll now discuss specific topics in the committee report. Firstly, the bill does not act widely enough. My bill allows the minister to add more than the seven awards this bill currently covers using a disallowable instrument where exploitation occurs. It allows the minister to remove that listing should an industry stop exploiting. This is surely best practice. Only act where there's a problem and only for as long as the problem exists. Adding 700 plus awards, just in case, will needlessly add to the cost and complexity of our industrial relations system. Secondly, definitions of key concepts. The definitions enabled every submitter to correctly understand my bill's intent. Yet some of them went on to say the definitions were incomplete after correctly identifying the meaning of the words used. The wording was chosen carefully because once a term is given a specific meaning, that meaning is considered the term's full meaning. Cunning lawyers use detailed definitions to limit a term's application. 
This allows for deficiencies in definitions to be exploited as loopholes. I will not play the industrial relations club's game. It's up to the Fair Work Commissioner to decide if a labour hire agreement falls under this bill's provisions. Should the Fair Work Commission fail to honour this legislation's intent, then and only then should we wander into the legal minefield of definitions that become exclusionary rather than inclusionary. It's time to start using clear language, expressing clear principles and rely on the Fair Work Commissioner to exercise their wisdom and knowledge and to follow these principles in their judgments. My bill's intention and action. My bill provides a provision to existing provisions that enterprise agreements must pass to meet the Fair Work Commission's approval. This test is in section 321 of the Fair Work Act 20 of 2009 to show this equal pay for equal work provision is separate and additional to the better off overall test, the boot test. Section 321 is exactly where this provision belongs. In conclusion, the supposed downsides that some vested interests attribute in broad terms come from the same entities who turned industrial relations into a club for their own profit and power, at the workers' expense. These entities do very well from complexity. Workers pay the price in so many ways. This must stop. If the government is serious about equal pay for equal work, get on with it. I thank senators contributing to this debate and look forward to bringing this bill to a vote at the next opportunity. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Senator Farrell is on the new whipping list. Senator Sullivan, you're, you're, you're next. Senator Farrell. Sorry about that, Senator O'Sullivan, but um, sometimes you do get trumped in this, um, in this game. Uh, I thank um, Senator Roberts for his uh, contribution. Um, I would make this uh, observation that um, if Senator Roberts is serious about trying to improve industrial relations, um, in this country and has some genuine, um, genuine comments and contribution to make, um, then maybe the best way to start is sitting down with the, uh, <coughs> that terrific uh, minister, the Industrial Relations Minister, uh, Minister Burke, and um, start working with him um, about uh, how we might uh, improve industrial relations in this country and, uh, in particular, just how we might start the ball rolling and on, uh, on lifting, uh, lifting uh, wages so that um, workers have a chance to compete with uh, rising, uh, rising prices that um, they see everywhere. And of course we know, uh, Deputy President, uh, that it was a design feature of the former government. The former government, which Senator Roberts kept supporting over and over and over and over again uh, with all of their crazy policies that have led to the extremely difficult economic circumstances which Australian workers um, find themselves in. And maybe if Senator Roberts hadn't, uh, hadn't supported the former government as often and consistently and as regularly as he did, um, Australian workers might actually be in a slightly better position. Now, of course, they're going to be in a lot better position when the, uh, the new bill passes in the next couple of days that's going to lift the standard of, uh, of living of Australian workers and give them a chance to catch up with those rising, uh, mm -hmm. rising prices. Um, I see uh, Senator Pocock uh, in the room, Senator Barbara Pocock. When I first started uh, working with the Shop Assistance Union in 1976, we still had different rates of pay for men and women. Um, there would be one rate of pay uh, for a man, and that would appear on one side of the uh, they were wage, um, uh, wage uh, regulated um, uh, documents. Um, uh, on one, one side of the page there would be a rate for uh, the men and then on the other side of the page there would be a rate for a woman and uh, for exactly the same job. Exactly the same job in this country um, we had different rates of pay. It's hard to believe and um, you, uh, you have to go back um, a, a very long time to, um, to see that. But <coughs> In wage determinations in this country, um, there were differences between men and women. Now, of course, 
um, we have quite a different concept of um, equal pay for equal work these days. <clears throat> We're not talking about that overt discrimination that existed in wage determinations uh, in this uh, country for most of the, uh, of the last uh, century. We're talking about quite a different uh, proposition, uh, of course, and that proposition is that um, there are industries where women predominate that, if they were fairly valued, uh, would have a higher rate of pay. And that the reason uh, that their rate of pay isn't higher is because um, it's a predominantly female industry. And of course, that's, that's the issue. That's the issue uh, that the, uh, the Labor Party is seeking to, uh, to address um, and, uh, and, of course, will address in the course of, uh, of this parliament. Now, um, I will um, <coughs> talk about, firstly, what the uh, Labor Party is proposing um, to do to um, fix the problems that Senator Roberts claims that he's fixing in this bill. And again, I, I make the offer to Senator Roberts, if you're fair dinkum about trying to lift the living standards of workers in this country, maybe the best way is to cooperate with a government who is also interested in doing that and sitting down telling us um, how you think uh, we might be able to um, advance the interest of working people in this, uh, in this country. Because I haven't seen any evidence for the whole of the time that you've been in this place, uh, Senator Roberts, that you've been remotely interested in, uh, in that issue. And every single decision that you took over the previous parliaments to back in the policies of this mob when they were uh, in government did damage to the people you now say you now say senator senator hansen i i sat quietly i sat quietly and listened to the drivel of uh, senator roberts for the last 15 minutes i just appreciate the same the same courtesy i well, well, then you'll have a chance to speak on it, and I'll sit quietly while you have your contribution. But <clears throat> the courtesy is that you should listen in silence, and I'm surprised the deputy president didn't <clears throat> make that remark himself. Senator Farrell, I thought you were more than capable of handling handling the matter. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, I didn't, I didn't have a go at you, Senator. If you don't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm talking about your government. I'm talking about your government. I wasn't singling you out, although I, now that now that you've raised it, now that you mentioned it, of course, um, just like Senator Roberts, you voted for every crazy policy that put pressure on working people in this country. And this Labor government is going to do something about it uh, through our Fair Work uh, uh, <coughs> bill. Now. Um, <coughs> We took a plan to the Australian people uh, at the last election, and uh, that plan was uh, <coughs> to announce a secure Australian jobs plan, which contains a commitment to address uh, same job, same pay. So we were, we were onto this issue way, way, way before Senator Roberts even, even dreamed it up. But not only that, we took a policy to the last election. Uh, to deal with the issue. Um, so we had a plan. We had a plan for this very issue that Senator Roberts claims that he's got some, uh, uh, some interest in. Now, under the Secure Australian Jobs Plan, the government uh, committed to delivering more secure jobs, better pay and fairer workplace relations, um, including ins ensuring that labour hire workers and workers engaged in other non-standard arrangements, such as outsourcing, received no less than directly engaged employees performing the same work. Um, now, um, that's a very, very simple proposition, that if you're doing a job that's valued at a particular rate of pay under an award or, or agreement or some other instrument, uh, then if somebody else comes into your workplace um, to do the same job, then that person should receive the same pay. Um, it's a very, very simple proposition. 
Of course, under the previous government, <coughs> um, uh, abuses occurred, and even though the government was aware of it, the industrial relations minister was aware of it, nothing was done about it. We saw the problem, recognised the problem, took a proposal to the Australian people at the last election, and we were elected the government. So I would say this, um, <coughs> Acting Deputy uh, President, and I know you know a lot about these sorts of issues, I would say we've got a mandate to fix this problem, a mandate, a mandate to fix this problem, but not only do we have a mandate to fix this problem, we Order. are going to fix this problem. We're going to fix this problem. Order. We are. Thank you, thank you, Acting Deputy President. They keep attacking me, particularly up from that end, up up there. Um, Order up the other end too. <laughs> so, so we have a mandate, and um, I just see Senator Sheldon come into the uh, uh, to the uh, to the Senate, of course. He spent a lifetime, a lifetime, trying to resolve some of these issues because he's seen firsthand how unfair um, it is in a workplace where one group of workers, uh, no doubt, <coughs> um, having the benefit of a, a union negotiated agreement, which the fantastic union, the Transport Workers Union, would have negotiated for them, and then a whole lot of other workers come in and they're on a lower rate of pay. Um, so we, we are going to do something about this, and uh, as I mentioned, we've got Senator, uh, Minister Burke onto the job, uh, and he's been doing nothing else uh, since he came into this job six months ago than trying to fix the problem and create a fairer uh, workplace. Now, currently, under the Fair Work Act, <coughs> and some people, I suppose, could describe it currently as the Unfair Work Act, uh, a labour hire uh, employee and a directly employed employee may be engaged under different industrial instruments. Now, of course, as uh, <coughs> Senator Urquhart uh, would know, that's, uh, that's code for a lower rate of pay for somebody coming in uh, as a labour hire uh, employee. And I'm sure over her uh, wonderful career, she will have had. Uh, uh, issues where she's dealt with these type of uh, type of problems, and my guess is successfully sorted them out. But you can't sort them out <coughs> everywhere, and of course you do need uh, industrial relations legislation to do that, and that's what the Labor Party uh, is on about. And of course, as we've seen uh, in those circumstances, uh, uh, workers um, who are doing the same job, undertaking the same work, can be on a a vastly different set of wages and, uh, and conditions. And of course, that not only is it unfair, but it also creates tensions in the workplace because if the same people, uh, sorry, different people are, are doing the same job and they're on a, a different set of terms and conditions, well, naturally, those people um, will, uh, will be dissatisfied. Now, the government does uh, acknowledge that there may be, from time to time, le legitimate uh, uses for labour hire. Um, such as instances where employees uh, need to use labour hire to provide surge capacity or provide important expertise that is not available within its own workforce. So we're not saying ban uh, all labour hire, uh, but the proposition is that if you're doing the same job, you should be doing the same uh, rate of pay. Now, because of all those distractions, uh, Acting Deputy President, I've uh, not had a chance to actually address some of the provisions in this bill, but I'd like to do that uh, now in the remaining uh, time I have. Um, and this bill is targeted at uh, prospective contracts or arrangements entered into uh, by the employer, namely the uh, labour hire employer, with another person uh, described as the host employer. Uh, for an employee, a uh, labour hire employee, uh, for the <coughs> labour hire employer to perform work for the host uh, employer. Um, <coughs> the first observation uh, that the government would make about this le the uh, proposed legislation is that there's a lack of clarity and practicality <coughs> regarding the application of equal pay obligations. Uh, and these include <coughs> obligations uh, apply from day one and does not address situations where, for example, a labour hire employee is moving from, a, from host to host, 
and, and uh, there's only one civil remedy provision which is drafted in a manner that is not consistent with the way underpayments are ordinarily dealt with under the Fair Work Act. So it's introducing a, a whole lot of new concepts um, which are not consistent with the way um, a worker would ordinarily expect uh, to prosecute um, a case if they felt they'd been disadvantaged as a result of uh, 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 provisions in their, uh, in, in their workplace. Um, this is likely to lead to ambiguity and the bill could give rise to uh, unintended consequences if uh, legislated in this current form. And again, I make the offer to Senator Roberts, if you're fair dinkum about trying to resolve some of these issues at the workplace, come and sit down with the minister um, and, his, uh, and his staff and let's start correcting uh, all of those issues that uh, arose uh, under the life of the, uh, of the previous government. Now, the bill is targeted only at labour hire in specific um, sectors based on award coverage, namely uh, black coal mining industry award, <coughs> aircraft cabin crew award, the firefighting industry award, the maritime offshore oil and gas award, the seagoing industry award, the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation Enterprise Award um, and with a provision for the minister to add more via a legislative uh, instrument. Um, the bill does not deal with outsourcing or any other uh, arrangements. Thank you. Senator Farrell. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, it is, uh, my honour to be able to rise and speak on the Fair Work Amendment Equal Pay for Equal Work Bill and, uh, and follow Senator Farrell and, and Senator Roberts uh, before, before him. Uh, it's interesting listening to Senator Farrell, who I respect, admire in this yeah. place. Would you believe, Senator Farrell? Uh, yeah. He's a thoroughly decent person, Senator yeah. Farrell, and uh, yeah. I always, always enjoy listening to uh, his contributions. Uh, but it, but uh, <laughs> I wouldn't mind some of that wine. Yes, thank you. Thank you. But, uh, Senator Roberts, uh, uh, through you, Chair, the, uh, this, your work uh, on this bill and, indeed, working with you on the committee. I'm uh, Deputy Chair of the Education and Employment Committee with uh, Senator Sheldon as, as Chair. Uh, I, I've, I, I want to just say before I make my uh, remarks that uh, I, I always respect and admire the way that Senator Roberts uh, uh, brings issues to this place and uh, the way that he, uh, and certainly on this particular uh, inquiry, the way that he uh, very sincerely brought forward the issues that, uh, that this bill uh, contends with, and, uh, and I, I really admire and respect him, and, his, and I really appreciated his contribution and the passion and his commitment to, to this issue, and indeed the workers that are in uh, in, the, in that industry. Um, so, yeah. while I, um, while uh, you know, as, as author, uh, you know, key contributor to the additional comments that were put into the uh, into the report. Uh, uh, while, while we you know, indicated that we don't support uh, this bill, or at least the, the makeup of it and how it's, uh, or the, the particular provisions and how it's been put together, uh, I, I just wanted to say that I, I very much re respect uh, Senator Roberts' long-standing connection and, and commitment to, to, this, uh, to this issue, and indeed, uh, particularly those working in the black coal uh, mining industry. Uh, the, uh, and, and indeed, uh, you know, Senator Roberts uh, worked as a as an underground worker uh, in the in the coal mining industry. So he does have first hand experience, and he's got a obviously a, through that a very deep connection to uh, not just the issue, but indeed the people that uh, 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 that, that are connected with it. And the, the witnesses that he was able to arrange to come before the committee uh, clearly had a lot of respect for Senator Roberts and. Uh, and came and presented, uh, you know, very passionately their issues, and I, I really uh, appreciated that, and appreciated being able to sit, uh, listen, and, and uh, even inquire of them. Uh, now, th this this bill does primarily focus on the black coal industry and the aircraft uh, cabin crew award 2020, as well as uh, four other awards that currently do not have provisions for casual employment. Um, the, the coalition does believe that this bill erroneously uh, seeks a, a one-size-fits-all 
approach. Uh, it overlooks the nuances of labour hire industry. Uh, we have, uh, will have unintended consequences and ignores some of the really important fundamentals, uh, including the desire by some workers to have a flexibility and other benefits afforded to them by being labour hire employees. Now, I just want to talk briefly. Uh, I, before coming into this place, I was running an organisation called Generation One, which is which is an Aboriginal employment agency. And through that, we saw tens of thousands of long-term unemployed Aboriginal people uh, take up uh, training that led to a guaranteed job. And uh, it was something that I'm very, very proud of. And I hope in this place I can have a similar sort of impact. But I look at the uh, look at the work that I did there through the excellent team that we had there and across the country. The, the, the it, was, it was you know something that I I, I'm very proud of, of, of seeing. And, but we, we actually worked a lot with labour hire businesses in, in creating those opportunities. And, uh, and I think sometimes in this debate there's a real denigration of labour hire. And, uh, but, there, but it actually does have a place. And it, and it particularly has a place for, for those that are, have been long-term unemployed, those that have been unemployed for a long time uh, and that have, might have significant and multiple barriers to employment. For them to be able to step out of long-term unemployment and establish a pattern of work, sometimes labour hire actually provides a very uh, unique and, and flexible environment that enables them to make that transition from having you know, no work and no pattern of work to you know, maybe picking up some casual work, uh, starting maybe part-time or reduced hours and building their capacity over time. And so we actually were able to use labour hire and we worked with many different businesses, and some of them were, were subject to this inquiry, uh, that, that were actually able to provide a, a stepping stone for people uh, that, had, uh, that had been long-term unemployed with low skills, uh, but through, through that, that transitionary sort of intermediary uh, role that labour hire was able to play, they were able to transition into longer-term, sustainable uh, and um, full-time work. So I think it's really important that there is a bit of balance in this debate, and a balance that, that I know Senator Roberts did, did bring into it. But I, but I think uh, uh, we've got to be careful that labour hire isn't denigrated. Uh, and I respect uh, Senator Farrell's uh, comments that, that there is a place for labour hire. There is definitely a place for, for labour hire. But um, uh, you know, where, where it becomes a situation where it, is, it might display sexual um, you know, permanent jobs. I, I, I join with, with concern about that, uh, but, uh, but there is a place, and I think we've got to be careful that we don't, uh, don't denigrate it. Now, the Australian coal industry has played a significant role in the modern prosperity of, of this country uh, and indeed our economy. Like other sectors in the mining industry, it's provided numerous employment opportunities and benefited regional communities across Australia. The, the coal mining industry employs around 50,000 workers across Australia, with another 120,000 indirect jobs uh, by the industry. As a valuable commodity, uh, coal is Australia's second largest export after iron ore, which is primarily coming out of my home state in Western Australia, and it accounts for approximately 11.5 per cent of Australia's total exports. And while being a strong economic driver and export commodity, coal is an affordable, reliable source of electricity. And while there are detractors of coal in this place, uh, I'm not one. Uh, I'm not one to diminish and disrespect the valuable role that coal uh, places uh, within, uh, within our industries uh, and within, uh, within our economy, the, the wealth that it creates, and without doubt the, uh, uh, the coal industry uh, plays a pitiful, influential part of the narrative of the Australian success story. Uh, specifically regarding the role of labour hire, I do respect that there is a, uh, there are, is a diversity of views on this matter, uh, and as I've said, I don't, however, share the, um, the, the sentiments espoused by some who have sought to, to demonise this vital function played by the labour hire industry. Uh, many businesses, particularly when it comes to, um, to shut down work in, in the mining sector, uh, where you need a surge capacity, where you need to bring in uh, temporary workforce uh, that can have the ability to move in, move out. Uh, obviously, labour hire plays plays a, a critical critical role. Uh, contrary to representations made in relation to labour hire and, and proportion of broader workforce, the, the current use of labour hire 
in the Australian workplace is not considered at ec epidemic levels. In fact, it's only 1 per cent of the workforce. Australian workforce are employed within labour hire firms. Uh, this proportion is lower than it has ever been, or at least in the last 10 years. Uh, in their submission to the EEC, the Australian Industry Group uh, stated that, the, that uh, a policy such as equal pay for equal work is, is unfair, inappropriate and unworkable. Additionally, the AIG contends that the bill does not sufficiently define what a labour hire employer is or what a labour hire employee is, and consequently resulting in some businesses uh, inadvertently being caught up by the provisions of this bill. Now, I take—I uh, want to, just in the remaining stage, the remaining moment I've got in this debate, wanted to uh, just pick up on a couple of things that. Um, Senator Farrell said he, he said that the, in, in discussing the government's plans in this area and the government's plans around the, the Fair Work uh, uh, Bill, uh, Fair Work and, and the amendments, uh, he, he said that they, they have a mandate uh, to do some of the things that uh, they said that they're, they're going to do, and indeed uh, we'll be debating no doubt later today. Uh, now I find it really interesting that. that Senator Farrell says that there is that mandate, and it was something that they took to the Australian people. That they, that they took to the Australian people and got, got the support from the Australian people for it. Because uh, look, they, uh, granted, they, they did say it was part of their slogan throughout the campaign that uh, they'll get wages moving and lines like that, talking points like that. I, I, I give you, absolutely give you that, and, uh, and I think you know Australians supported the government. Clearly, you, you won. We, we don't deny that. It's disappointing. I'm disappointed by that result. I'm disappointed by that Order. result. But uh, but it happened. No, it happened, and we're, and we're living with it. We're living with it right now. But 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 you can't say Labor senators coming in in this place can't say that they have a mandate for the particular provisions of this bill when when they actually ruled it out. They ruled it out. Now. now um, uh, Mr Chalmers, the treasurer, the now treasurer, when he was in opposition, when he was the shadow treasurer, the head of the election, was asked on the Insiders program back in November whether or not industry-wide bargaining was part of the government's plan, and he categorically ruled it out. He said, "We have no plan for that." Now, that, maybe they're just weasel words that that uh, that, uh, that 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 members of parliament. Can, are, are very adept at using sometimes. We have no plans for this. Well, you know, well, well may, maybe the treasurer or the shadow treasurer, as he was at the time, uh, maybe he wasn't in the loop. Maybe that was the problem. He wasn't in the loop with the government's industrial relations agenda because uh, he didn't quite know what this government would do, what this opposition would do if they were to form government and bring in uh, such wide-ranging, significant changes to the industrial relations landscape. Uh, or, or, or maybe he actually knew that uh, it would be catastrophic to the economy if such a change was brought in, uh, because he said that they have no plans. And he, he, I wish they stuck to that, because the plans that the government actually have to, to change the, the landscape of the industrial relations system is so significant by bringing in multi-employer bargaining, by allowing for uh, any competitive natures to, to be brought into the bargaining system is, is going to be uh, troubling, incredibly troubling to the, to the Australian economy. Where you've got a situation where, for example, you could have Coles and Woolworths having to bargain together in a shopping centre and then rope in all the other smaller retailers that are in that shopping centre into it. And even though those businesses may not have the uh, the, the, the HR departments might not have the in-house counsel, may not have the, the legal advice readily available to them as, uh, in the same way that a big company like a Coles or a Woolworths might have. These companies could easily be, be roped in and they, I see there's a, you know, some changes to the thresholds that businesses might be able to uh, be, exclu or be excluded, you know, lifting from 15 to 20, but it doesn't take you're not actually a very big business to have 20 employees, and you, all you need to have is a pattern of regular pattern of work to uh, to be included, and so uh, casuals can easily be included, and, and so the, it, you can see situations where businesses are going to be caught up 
in, uh, in this. So, look, the government do not actually have a mandate on, on their plans, on their proposals. Uh, they do not have the mandate. Yeah, we want to see wages moving. Of course we do. Everyone does. But we can't create a situation where we're actually going to lose jobs. Like it's better to have a job than not have one. And uh, your wages are only going to go one way if you've lost it, uh, if you've lost your job. And of course, you know that's going to have a devastating impact. Uh, but look, uh, back back to back to this bill. Um, uh, I, I I do again commend um, Senator Roberts uh, for for his uh, his commitment and his approach. Uh, I. I uh, I look forward to continuing to work with him to find solutions to, to this problem. Unfortunately, what this lot over here uh, have devised is not the answer. It's not, not actually going to bring the, uh, bring the results that uh, I know you're looking for, Senator Roberts, through you, Chair. Uh, but I, I, I really hope that we can, uh, we can get things, um, you know, get ourselves in a position where we can move things. Obviously, what's happening here with this government is, uh, is going to set us back a long way, but we're going to have to work hard, work hard together uh, to, to bring about sensible ideas, sensible proposals that could actually really shake things up and shift things around. So, With that, uh, I, I thank, uh, thank the Senate for the time, and I thank Senator Roberts for, again, his commitment to this issue. Senator Sheldon. Oh, good. Thank you very much. Um, I think I should start off firstly in just uh, thanking uh, all the committee members um, that considered Senator Roberts's um, bill because um, it was a collegiate group um, talking through the pros and cons of the bill because there was a number of us on the committee, including um, the intention of Senator Roberts's um, uh, proposed bill, uh, that have a serious concern about what's happening in this country in regards to the, the misuse of labour hire, not the essence of labour hire. because. Labor hire does appropriately have a place um, in um, the Australian uh, economic market, and it has an appropriate place, but not for as a way and means of actually decreasing wages and ripping people off. And one of the things that the committee, uh, in all those discussions, and I include um, our uh, deputy chair, um, the honest and open and frank discussions, and also um, the questioning of the number of witnesses. No, and I'm pleased to say that the Minerals Council of Australia turned up. They were a little bit unpleased, uh, displeased with having to appear before the Senate inquiry, considering uh, this one of the greatest abusers um, across the mining industry of the use of labour hire. And I'll go to some of those points in a moment. But one of the things I do find particularly disturbing from the opposition is that they haven't changed their tune, because they think there isn't a problem. They think, in actual fact, when we started raising same jobs, same pay, many, many years ago, including through the um, Select Committee on Job Security Inquiry, they said it was a made-up issue. Like this was actually job insecurity, the, the um, abuse of labour hire, uh, use of labour hire in the Australian workforce was a made-up issue. Now, they, couldn't actually, they just can't get their mind around the fact that they have to hold to account also those people in our economy that are exploiting Australian workers. So they decided, we'll just pretend it doesn't even exist. That way we don't actually have to take, pretend that we're taking any side, on, but whilst they're actually taking the side of big corporations that have been abusing the use of labour hire. And some of those statistics that came out of that uh, select committee on job security, for example, uh, the number of labour hire jobs in Australia has increased from 540,622 in 2013 to 797,710 in 2019, a 48% increase in six years. The Queensland Coal Mining Board of Inquiry reported that in 1996, 94.1% of Queensland coal mine workers were directly employed. Today, just 50% are with the remainder being labour hire or contractors. And BHP confirmed to the Senate Committee on Job Security that across their nationwide coal operations, just get this, just 29.11 per cent of their staff are BHP employees. The rest are labour hire or contractors. And of course, in evidence uh, during the inquiry uh, into this bill, uh, there was evidence given also by uh, Qantas in questions on notice, where the Qantas group has 17 subsidiaries that act as employing entities just for some of the areas such as cabin crew, tech crew, engineering, 
below the wing, which is ground handling, fleet presentation and catering, freight, and other frontline roles, roles, which are, of course, described as above the wing at airports. They had 21 external companies that they engaged, all in an attempt to artificially break up the bargaining process and the bargaining position of workers, um, you know, gaming the system. And of course, we'll hear later today about not only an issues like we've heard now today um, from the opposition that this is a made-up issue. We've also heard, you know, we'll hear from examples that it's a made-up issue, that everything's fine. We don't need to change the IR legislation because, don't worry, Qantas has got the answer. You know, they know how to actually drive wages down by not paying same job, same pay, and gaming the system. And the important thing about the intent of this bill was to look at some of those aspects and some of those industries that, could, that it could address. But the committee did come to a view that there were some um, challenges in the bill, and the, and the bill requires, and this question requires, further consultation. But again, before I get into that, I think we should actually also make it clear this isn't just about aviation workers and mine workers, because in other industries uh, that was on evidence given uh, during an inquiry uh, into uh, job security um, over those 18 months in 2021 and before, that um, a meat worker, Matt uh, Chorno, uh, from the Australian Meat Industry Employees Union, said at ACC there was a worker on labour hire working besides another worker and there was a $500 a week difference. We see labour hire companies are not even paying the award in a lot of instances. Even if they do pay the award, typically our agreements would be 20 or 30 per cent higher than the award. So those workers, even if they did receive the award rates of pay, would be on a 20 to 30 per cent less than those local workers would be receiving. And this included, of course, in the public service, because there wasn't a problem, because the government at the time, the now opposition, were very happy that there was no problem, because they were also paying labour hire workers substantially less than what was being paid to direct hire workers. So rather than giving people a career path and building our public service, they just treated labour hire as a cheap form of labour. Hard working Australians doing their bit for the country, but treated by then our own government, um, the, in the case of the opposition now, uh, paying them substantially less. A labour hire worker from the NDIA, NDIA said, in my office, planners who, despite doing the same job, would pay differently when negotiations for contracts happened. We found out that other staff were being paid up to $10 more per hour. Pay between staff performing exactly the same role is often disparate, and many labour hire agencies prohibit their employees from discussing their pay, making it difficult to ask for parity. And of course, that's one of the reasons why <coughs> uh, the, government, the government now has made it clear that um, misuse of labour hire is one of the direct policy um, changes that, uh, we're taking, that uh, we're taking action on as we speak. And of course, um, Nick Thatchery, um, a labour hire worker at Australian Maritime Safety Authority, again another example of misuse of labour hire, a critical area of expertise to maintain within our um, national safety of maritime. You, know, you would think you'd want to make sure that those people felt belonged and felt connected, but no, the government at the time, now opposition, um, and Nick Th uh, didn't, didn't give those workers um, one iota of concern because, don't forget, it was a made-up issue. You know, remember that, you know, that continual um, uh, parody from uh, the then opposition, uh, now opposition, then in government. And Nick Thackeray <coughs> said from the um, AMSA, obviously the difference, and he said this on August 27th of August 2021, Obviously, there's the difference in pay, but then we don't get sick leave, we don't get miscellaneous leave, we don't get carer's leave, and we don't get things like domestic violence leave. Or if somebody close to you dies, there's no leave that, so essentially every day, depending on what's happening in your life, you make the choice. Am I going to get paid today compared with what else is happening in your life? Because as far as the opposition are concerned, these are made up issues. Now, the committee went through um, the, the issues that were raised um, in the inquiry um, into this bill. And we looked at uh, the increase of use of, use of labour hire without particular, with, without particular reference to jobs performed for the duration of employment. It appeared to have been blurred the distinction between labour hire employees and those permanently engaged by the host employer. 
Indeed, it may be contributing to the underreporting of labour hire employee numbers, with many workers who have been persistently employed by labour hire firms identifying as employees of an industry or rather a labour hire firm. And what it's said is that this is also, after I've given those substantial statistics of a massive increase in labour hire, there was a very strong feel, belief that there is an underreporting of labour hire within the country. And of course, <coughs> Ensure that there was a. <clears throat> the committee uh, supports the broad, aim, broad support of the broad aim of the um, the Fair Work Amendment Equal Pay for Equal Work Bill 2022, but to ensure that a labour hire worker doing the same job as a directly engaged employee receives the same rate of pay. But the committee did recognise that any legislative response must be effective and operate as intended, and requires further consideration. Accordingly, the committee did mu must also acknowledge the significant misgivings expressed by most inquiry participants about the limited scope of the bill and the lack of clarity concerning its key provisions and definitions. And whilst I go to that, uh, some of the details and the concerns about the bill, not, not the, the objective of the bill but the, the details of the bill, um, also to just take into account the concerns that are raised again by those in the community. And these aren't made-up people. These are real people giving real evidence, it's just as uh, Anne Baker, the mayor for Isaac Regional Council, on the 13th of July said, um, uh, and sorry, and Kelly V. Uh, v. v, uh, v uh, Deputy Mayor of Isaac Regional Council, and she said that um, casual labour has always traditionally been engaged in the mining industry, but usually for things like shutdown work and construction of new developments. So no one's saying that it's, that it's not a new concept. What we have seen absolutely in the last 10 years is a huge increase. We've never expected to see casual jobs actually being put in place of permanent jobs. We have seen permanent jobs being made redundant and being replaced with casual labour. That's just something that we've witnessed over the last 10 years. It's not a made-up issue. It's an issue of a great deal of concern. But, and this is why the, the discussion on the bill was so important for us to take, uh, for us to take place in the hearings. Um, that, was, uh, that, that took place and all those participating members um, that uh, played a role in the consideration of this bill. But several stakeholders commented on the limited scope of the bill. For example, the ACTU was concerned that businesses could move employees onto contracting arrangements to remove the risk of being covered by the provisions of the bill. It argued that the labour hire sector will no doubt swiftly evolve the language in its contracts to move any employees onto contracting arrangements to greatly limit the risk of ever being captured by the terms of the bill. And I might just sort of uh, pause there for a moment because one of the things that's also critically important, and, we've, and the government has foreshadowed this to deal with gig workers, because regulation of one part of the labour market also requires regulation of the other part of the labour market, the other part of the labour market, the gig economy, because then we will see individual contracting where it's inappropriate. Rather, as a way of avoiding responsibility, and, by, and as, as I think by now, some of the last three and a half years, most people, and certainly in this place, and many outside this place, would know that I'm a strong supporter of contract labour and a strong supporter of the rights of contract labour. So this is not about contractors not existing. This is about mechanisms being used to turn around, such as gig work, to actually go to the lowest common denominator. I don't mean the workers are the lowest common denominator. I mean their pay is being used and abused. And quite often it's not the company that directly employs, I might add that sometimes it is, but it's quite often not the company that directly engages. It's the company right at the top, what I describe as the economic employer, who makes economic demands for those companies that are down their supply chain to keep ratcheting, keep taking a section off by ratcheting down wages, conditions, and quite often they go parallel with safety arrangements uh, being lost. Now the Australian Nurses and Midwifery uh, Federation noted that this would be particularly relevant to carers and nurses working in aged care, uh, which historically have been lower wages than their public and private um, acute counterparts. The ANMF also expressed significant concerns around the use of digital platforms and independent contractors in the aged care sector. Similarly, the uh, Employer Association uh, for, the, um, for, um, for Labor Hire, uh, the RCSA, warned that some businesses would find ways to circumvent any regulations, RCSA, the employer group, argued that any equal pay for equal work scheme must consider how it can be applied across all forms of market activity, 
relating to the provisions of labour, not just to labour hire structures. It noted that any regulations need to adequately address the activity and behaviour, not the structure, if it is to have real, any real impact. And again, whilst I support the concept of this bill and, and, and it's important that uh, the government continues to have, as they are, conversations about um, same job, same pay, it also has to be running parallel with what we do with the gig economy, because that, that actually means that we actually are properly giving people minimum standards. Some stakeholders were also concerned about the limited number of modern awards that were, would initially be covered by the bill. For example, uh, Morris Blackburn lawyers argued that the bill offers no protection to workers in other parts of the economy whose labour hire arrangements are common, including construction, transport, hospitality, cleaning and aged care and disability care services. And of course, in contrast to the concerns of the bill's limited scope, some industry stakeholders raised concerns about the breadth of the proposed requirement for labour hire companies to provide additional payments based on the employee base rate of pay, including incentives, allowances, overtime, penalty rates and other identifiable amounts. Now, I think I've, I would join with, um, with many of us um, other than the opposition, so we have a very clear position, and I think the intention of uh, Senator Roberts's bill is to encompass those sorts of allowances to make sure that it is actually in actual fact same job, same pay. Um, and I think there's a number of us in this chamber, that, uh, including uh, Senator Roberts, um, that sees the importance of those, those issues also being dealt with. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Your time has expired. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you very much. And I too thank Senator Roberts for bringing forward this bill. I know that this has been an issue uh, that Senator Roberts has spent a lot of time uh, working on um, when I was on the um, Senate Education and Employment Committee in the last parliament. Um, I have to commend Senator Roberts for his tenacious questioning of, of the departments and, uh, and the agencies that came before us specifically to look to address the um, uh, what he saw and, and the advice that he was getting about uh, certain inequalities in uh, some of the awards, particularly the Black Coal Mining Industry Award, uh, and noting your interest in superannuation as well. I also note um, Senator Sheldon's true commitment to same job, same pay, and, and Senator Sheldon's ongoing um, commitment to addressing issues in the gig economy. And so I thank uh, Senator Sheldon for his contribution today too. Um, I think the key issue is that this bill does seek a one-size-fits-all approach, which overlooks the nuances in our labour hire industry. That Senator Sheldon himself said has a place in our economy and a significant place in our workforce. Um, our the coalition senators, we note the work of the. Um, the Senate Select Committee on Job Security and, and its establishment to inquire into specifically um, this issue and the impact on, of insecure or precarious, precarious employment on the economy, wages, social cohesion and workplace rights and conditions. And that was a very wide-ranging uh, committee process, and I, I thank everyone who participated in the committee. Um, and, uh, and for their comprehensive report that was raised. And one thing that I really do want to focus in on as I'm addressing the bill that is before us. Now, while the bill in its current form um, is specifically applicable to labour hire employees under the Black Coal Mining Industry Award 2020, the Aircraft Cabin Crew Award 2020, but as, as well as four other awards that currently don't have provisions for ca casual employment. It does also allow the minister to add awards by um, disallowable instrument as he sees fit. And, and so I do want to focus on, and there was a whole chapter in the committee's report um, dedicated to looking at workforce arrangements in agriculture. Because if this bill goes through as it is, it sets a precedent for a future minister to look at where else labour hire plays a significant role 
in meeting the needs of that workforce. And agriculture is one of those, as identified in the committee's own report. Um, the committee heard about the increasing prevalence of labour hire in agricultural industries, specifically in the horticulture and the meat processing industries, which are inherently seasonal in their practice, inherently uh, short-term in their labour hire needs. I know uh, blueberry growers who have a full-time staff of about five, but during their harvest season, which can come on very quickly, very rapidly, depending on weather conditions, and they, they can overnight have a call and a need for employing up to 50 people on their farm to help them meet their harvest. Now, you can't just fill those gaps um, you know, through, a, through a seek ad or through an ad in the classifieds of the local paper, um, particularly as we thankfully have an Australian unemployment figure of in the three per cent, which is great news. So that means there aren't that many Australians running around seeking employment. But these farmers and meat processors have developed agreements with labour hire com companies who have on their books a large um, availability of workforce and, and they pl play a significant role in helping us to get the fruit off the trees, the nuts off the trees, the vegetables off the ground and the meat into the packages. Um, in, in 2019, the committee heard that up to 56 per cent of labour carried out um, in those two industries alone, horticulture and meat processing, was carried out by contractors or other business uh, operators such as labour hire companies. Now, I want to remind people that horticulture is a $15 billion a year industry and meat processing is about $17 billion. So these are not small, small parts of our economy. They're quite significant. And uh, the um, Department of Agriculture and Forestry um, website shows that 60 to 70,000 people in 2021-22 employed in horticulture alone were employed on a contract of some form. And some of these contracts are provided through our Pacific Australian Labor Mobility Scheme, which is a highly successful scheme, which is a two-way diplomatic relationship between Australia and those Pacific nations and the communities from which those labourers come from and the economic support they provide back to their families and their communities. Just yesterday, uh, I met with a group um, of young people from the Pacific Australian Emergence, Emerging Leaders Summit that's run by Micro Australia and the Pacific Conference of Churches. Um, one, of, one of those young people was Rimwatia Nokiti from Kiribati, and her key message to me was to thank Australia for making provisions under the Pacific Australia Labor Mobility Scheme um, that her family participates in, that provides the economic security, but not only that, it also provides her family members, when they come here, they learn the skills that they can then take home and apply when they go home. Now, this is a scheme where a lot of those uh, visa holders come to us through or come to the, the end employer through a labour hire company. And this is where my concern with this bill, in its current format, is it leaves the door open for, for, for uh, the uncertainty in the labour hire economy. Um, so, I mean, this is why I can't. I also want to raise the issue that labour hire, while yes, it is a significant portion of our economy and it plays a strong role in our economy, contrary to some representations that we've made in relation to labour hire and the broader workforce, it is not 
epidemic levels. According to the submission to the committee from the Australian Industry Group, only 1.1 per cent of the workforce is employed by a labour hire firm. And that this proportion is perhaps, according to AIG, lower than it has been over the past 10 years. So my point is that labour hire employees fill essential needs gaps across industries, including in the black coal industry, um, that meet market demand within the workforce. And the other key point I want to make is that there are some employees who actively seek to be employed under a labour hire agreement because it provides them more flexibility than if they were employed under a full-term contract. So we need to ensure that we're not accidentally curtailing the rights of people to be employed under an arrangement that suits them and their family needs um, in an effort to address what I, I do agree uh, that Senator uh, Roberts has, has seen uh, an area that needs to be addressed, but this is not the solution. Thank you. Senator Pocock. Thank you, um, Acting Deputy Chair. Um, I thank uh, Senator Roberts for Sorry, his... Senator Pocock. The time for debate has expired. No way. Yeah. It will it'll be in control. <laughs> My apologies, Senator Pocock. Um, the Senate will now proceed to the consideration of government business, and I call the clerk. Government business, order of the day number one, Fair Work Legislation Amendment, Secure Jobs, Better Pay Bill 2022, resumption of second reading debate, and on the amendment moved by Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President and, uh, yes, Senator Pocock. This happened to me last night, uh, and I rise in continuance on the Fair Work Legislation Amendment uh, Bill of 2022. Uh, and this is a bill that will deliver secure jobs and better pay for Australians. It's a bill that puts respect for women workers at the heart of our workplace laws. And it's a bill that makes better wages a deliberate design feature of our government's agenda. Uh, and this bill is urgent because working Australians deserve a better life right now. After 10 years of low wages as a deliberate design feature of economic policy of the previous government, we've seen a race to the bottom on wages and conditions across some of our most essential sectors, uh, many of which are now uh, facing unprecedented workforce shortages. Uh, and these workers simply cannot afford to wait any longer. Uh, like early childhood educator Kylie Gray, who told me that if her wages don't improve soon, she'll have to leave the sector that she loves after 15 years, simply because she's losing hope and she can't afford to stay. Like security officer Pete Watkins, who has seen his wages fall, over the past 10 years from 7 per cent above the award back down to the award, um, all because security officers can't negotiate to protect wages across multiple employers today, and they get undercut by dodgy security operators. Um, workers like Cherie Clark can't wait a day longer. She's been living in a caravan park waiting for secure hours in her part-time contract in aged care. You know, one of Australia's most essential sectors. I mean, she's waiting for secure hours so she can prove her income uh, and sign a lease on a house. Um, this is not how we should be treating our essential workers in Australia today. These workers can't afford to wait another day, uh, let alone another 10 years, to see real change in their working lives. Our current industrial relations system it is broken and it is outdated. It's based on an economy that doesn't exist anymore. It's based on an economy that looked very different from today. And it's a system that is no longer delivering for employers or for employees. It's a system that locks out thousands of workers from the benefits of bargaining. Uh, and all work is valuable. 
and every worker deserves a chance to have a seat at the table where they can be heard, where their experience and expertise are recognised and where their work is valued. Um, and what this bill is not about is conflict. Um, this is actually about balance and it's about respect. It's about respect for the voice of working Australians, like the essential workers I just spoke about. It's also about respect for the needs of business too. Uh, this bill is about getting the balance right to build a strong and fair economy that benefits everyone. Just six months ago, we promised the people of Australia that if they elected an Albanese Labor government, we would get wages moving and we would deliver secure jobs. Because we know that good, secure jobs mean better lives. Because we know that after 10 years of falling wages, we can't afford to wait another day. And I'm proud that today we are getting on with the job, fixing a broken system, getting wages moving and delivering on our promise to deliver a better, brighter future based on good, secure jobs for all Australians. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Senator Mac Yes, Senator Rice. Attention to the State of the Chamber. Quorum yeah. yeah. required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Quorum present. Thank you, Senators. I now call on Senator McGrath. You have the call. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. And I'm speaking on uh, a bill that is called the Fair Work Legislation Amendment Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill 2022, but I, I reckon that should be renamed as to the, um, the Let's Give Union Bosses a Return on Their Investment in Their Labor Party uh, Bill 2022. Uh, you know, in terms of this, this, this new anti-corruption commission that, that's come into being, I sort of wonder whether we're going to see a, a referral to the anti-corruption commission in relation to the relationship between the unions and the Labor Party. Because what this bill is about, it's actually not about higher wages, which we, which we all, all support. What this bill is about, it's about the Labor Party government giving a return to the investment that was put in to the election of the Labor Party government by the unions. And so that is what this bill is all about. It is an acknowledgement 
that the Labor Party, which is defunct uh, on the ground, that the Labor Party won the election due to the, the campaigning strengths of, of, of the union movement as a political and campaigning movement. And so for that, the Labor Party has to return, return a favour to, to the union bosses. And that's what this bill is all about. It is about empowering union bosses. It's about empowering union thugs to go into to small businesses across Australia and intimidate business owners, intimidate workers and, and threaten them, because that is the business model of the union movement. And that, and that, as my, my colleague Senator Henderson um, has, has, has confirmed with, with her uh, helpful contribution, is that that's what John Setka, the, 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 the thug of all thugs, has, has confirmed. Um, you know, we talk about first amongst equals. Well, he is the, the thug amongst equals, the first thug, I suppose, in relation to what he wants to see out of this Labor government, and that is a return on his investment. And this is not for the interests. Of, of, of Australians. This is not for the interest of, of business owners and those who, who run businesses. This is all about the union movement. And, th and th that is sad. That is sad because you look at what is facing Australia at the moment. We look at a, a growing unemployment rate. We look at a growing inflation rate. We look at mortgage rates uh, going up. Basically, this has all happened uh, since, since May, by the way, for, for those who, who may be listening. Um, it's all happened since the election of this, uh, this Labor government, because we all know that, that Labor will always, always cost you more, uh, that, 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 that Labor will always cost you more. And what is going to happen is that Labor effectively are bringing in a, a federal payroll tax, a de facto federal payroll tax, because what they are saying to small businesses across Australia that you've got to pay anywhere between you know, fourteen dollars or $15,000 and $80,000 to, to participate in, in relation to the provisions under this bill. Now, what, what the, um, the, the, the Rhodes Scholars opposite don't realise uh, is that when you're a small business owner, you depend on the income coming in. Uh, from, from selling goods and services, but you also have your costs. And if your costs are going to go up in, in one of your columns, for example, suddenly you've got to pay seventy or eighty thousand dollars to participate in negotiating uh, wages and salaries for your employees because you're compelled to because you have union thugs on your doorstep, that means you actually an irony upon ironies, which of course the, the the road scholar runners up, runners up over there don't realise this, you actually won't be able to afford to give people the pay rises that you want to give to them. So the money is going to go into this, this great big black, black pot, this vortex, but the people who the, the, the left are claiming to want to stand up for and claiming to represent actually are going to lose out under the provisions of this bill. And, and that is very sad that, 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 that the um, that the, the Mensa Society members over there don't realise that, because what this is about, and I cannot emphasise this enough, this is not about getting Australians higher wages and higher salaries. This bill is not about that. This bill is about empowering the union movement, because when you look at what has happened to the union movement in, in, in Queensland and Australia, and in, in Queensland, I am a senator for Queensland, and the Labor Party came out, came out of, of the Shearer's strike in, in Western Queensland in, in the 1890s, and and I, you sometimes wonder what what, what those those genuine workers, those Shearers who wanted to have a political movement, would would think about when they, when they look at at the modern Labor Party and go. Really? Is this, is this the movement that's supposed to represent working Australians today? And of course it doesn't, because the Labor Party and the union movement have disintegrated their support for, for working class Australians. They've been captured by, by, by the wokers, they've been captured by, by the, the, the trendy dendies who, who like to live in, in, in the city 
and you know, like to ride their bikes everywhere and, 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 and claim to be all for public transport and fail to understand the reason that the union membership in Australia has declined from in, in the, the 50s and 60, 70 per cent of, of Australians who used to be members of unions. It's declined from that over the last 30 or 40 years because of the failure of the union movement to stand up for working Australians. I heard my colleague earlier today say that, that union membership at the moment of the workforce is, is at about 14 per cent. I actually thought it was a little bit low. I think that, um, that in the private sector it's about 10 per cent. I think the 14 per cent takes into account those who are in, in, in the public sector. So in the private sector, in small businesses, medium businesses and large businesses, only one in ten Australians are members of a union. Or the other way of putting it is that 90 per cent of working Australians are not members of a union, yet we have in front of us this bill which is all about empowering union bosses and trying to arrest the decline of union membership. And it's all about trying to ensure that, that the union bosses can turn up and on, on, on a small business doorstep and, and, and force and threaten, cajole, bully workers to try and, 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 and join, join a union. And, and that is sad. That is sad that, that, that one of the key accomplishments, so-called accomplishments of this government in the six months that have been in power is going to be a bill that actually does nothing for increasing the working, for increasing the salaries and, and, and wages of working Australians, but instead increases the power of union bosses. And so you should always look at what people say and then what they do. And what is interesting is that when the Labor Party went to the election, this was clearly a secret deal, a very much a secret deal between the union movement and the Labor Party. And why I say that, Acting Deputy President, is that no one knew about it. This, this was a secret deal that was locked away. It was clearly um, nutted out and probably signed, you know, handshake, I don't know, uh, um, you know, spit in the hand type of handshake, um, um, a, a, a wink across the room between the Prime Minister and the union bosses to say that you help us get elected and we'll repay the favour. We'll repay the favour by, by bringing in pieces of legislation that will help the union movement. Now, my, my opening comments about the National Anti-Corruption Commission weren't actually said in jest. They were actually quite serious that if there was a secret deal between the Labor Party and the union movement in terms of uh, cash for policy, of, of campaign funds for policy, of, of campaign funds for legislation, well, it's something that, that we should know. It is something that should have been put on the table before the election. It wasn't. It was secret. So therefore, what, actually, what else is in this deal between the Labor Party and the union movement? What else is, what else is there? And, and we can talk about what, uh, what the Labor Party is going to do, for example, in relation to electoral reform. We all know that the Labor Party do depend on the union movement, so they're going to, to bring forward reforms that will put a cap on expenditure. So they're going to bring in a financial gerrymander, the Queensland model. They'll bring that in here federally. That will effectively remove the fairness that exists at a federal level between political parties, between those of the left and the right, and ensure that there is a financial gerrymander that favours the parties of the left. And you can only look at, at, at Queensland, where political parties are capped at $15 million each for their electoral expenditure, but unions are capped at $10 million. There are 26 unions in Queensland. 26 times 10 is 260. So 
Unions can spend $260 million in an election in Queensland, plus the Labor Party's $15 million. The LNP, my, my party, uh, the party of, of the grassroots, um, will be outspent, so outspent 20 to 1. 20 to 1. And that is not fair. Whatever your views may be of, of, of the left and right of politics, we should all believe that, that there should be a fairness between the left and the right in terms of how they participate or how they are stopped from participating or how they are encouraged to participate in Australia's democracy. And, and what we are seeing here, what happened in Queensland, is the financial gerrymander that effectively locks the LNP out, is that Labor, through this bill, is ensuring that come the next federal election, they will be able to go to the, the union bosses and say, look, we delivered this piece of legislation. We, we, helped, we helped entrench and empower union bosses, not unions, but union bosses, in Australia's industrial and political uh, system. Therefore, we need you to make sure that you come out under the changes that we've made to, to the electoral expenditure rules at a federal level and, and campaign vigorously against the election of, of the Liberal National Party. And that is why this is of, of most concern, because this bill is not about helping working Australians. This bill is not about helping small businesses. This bill is, is cash for policy at its most base. It is if it, it, if it, is, it, is, it is bordering on corruption in terms of the, the payback between the Labor Party and, and the union movement. This bill was not taken to the election. This bill was a, 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 a secret deal between the Labor Party and the union movement, not, not to assist working class Australians, but it was all, all about helping the union, the union movement. And I say to to those business organisations, let this be a lesson to you. You thought you could sit down and deal with the Labor Party, and this shows that the Labor Party played you. This shows that for those of you who went along to that summit, which cost they had abandoned that summit, by the way, Acting Deputy President, you know, the summit they had here um, uh, a couple of months ago, they had abandoned seven thousand dollars. They paid the Labor Party used taxpayers' money to pay for a band that cost $7,000—and good on the band, we all love live music—at a summit talking about how the Labor Party can entrench itself in power. And of course, these business organisations went along and sat there and nodded their heads and said, yes, we can do a deal, and let's, we will work together. Let's go back to the, the keating hawke tripartite arrangement. Of course, that didn't happen, the Labor Party and the union movement took you like a hot dinner and they are still eating you up and asking for seconds. So I say to all those, those acronyms out there who represent businesses across Australia, stand up. Stop your wittering, stop your whinging, stop your complaining. Stand up and join the fight against this Labor Party because this, what is happening this week in the sixth month of this government shows overreach, overreach that normally happens in the third term of a government or the fourth term of a government. It's happening at the sixth month. So just imagine what is going to happen in the new year. So join the fight and stand up for small businesses. Thank, Thank you. you, Senator McGrath. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak on the Fair Work Legislation Amendment Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill 2022. There have been extensive negotiations by the Australian Greens, led by our leader Adam Bant and my wonderful colleague Senator Pocock here, um, on this bill. And some, we think that there are going to be, um, in amendments, some important changes that are going to be improving this bill overall. But overall, the Australian Greens think this bill is an incredibly important bit of legislation, which will result in better conditions. And as the bill says, um, securer jobs and better pay for workers, and particularly some of the amendments working on making sure that the better off overall test actually does mean better off overall for all workers and increasing things like um, the ability to access um, paid parental leave. Um, a central rationale for this bill, which the Greens support, 
and which has been put forward by government, has been the need to increase wages. Um, we do. We support that, and we agree. But we also believe that in the middle of a cost of living crisis we are facing, government needs to also be doing more about raising the rate of income support. And I want to focus in my speech today about the link between the benefits of raising the rate of income support and how that then flows into and feeds into better jobs, better pay, more secure work for workers. I mean, what inadequate income support means. Currently, if you are on the job seeker allowance, you get income support at the rate of $48 a day, which is not enough to live on by a long shot, where the cost of living has been feeds into um, meaning that to not be living in poverty, the estimate is that you need $88 a day to live to be not living in poverty, and yet job seeker only gives you $48 a day. And in fact, if you then the idea, of course, as people say, you know, people don't want to be on job seeker um, for long periods of time, but a lot of people are. People also are on job seeker and they do part-time, casual work. That's all that they've got access to, might be all that they're capable of doing in terms of health issues. And so they boost their income by doing small amounts of work. But at the moment, if you do those small amounts of work, you can only earn an extra $75 a week or $10 a day before your job seeker payment starts cutting out at the rate of 50 cents in the dollar. That's a 50 per cent marginal tax rate for the people on the lowest incomes in this country. And you only need to be earning um, $1,300 a week or 90, uh, a fortnight or $92 a day and your job seeker rate cuts out entirely. Note the Henderson poverty line, what you need to be not living in poverty is $88 a day, and yet job seeker completely cuts out if you are earning only $92 a day. And what this means, I mean, I have spoken many times in this chamber about the benefits for people of increasing the rate of job seeker, and I'm going to go into those again in this speech. But what this means in terms of the nexus between that rate of job seeker and better pay, better jobs for people, is that it undercuts that drastically. Because if you can only earn $92 a day before your income support cuts out entirely, what that sets up is the conditions for people working on the black market, people working cash in hand, people ex accepting really exploitative conditions that are not in the formal job market because they desperately need the money to survive. And that undercuts drastically our whole industrial relations framework because you then have one unscrupulous employer who is paying people at way below the, the award rate or the, the rates that have been bargained for on enterprise bargains because those people are desperate to get that money and without any of the checks and balances of our industrial relations system versus then other employers who are trying to do the right thing and be paying people properly and providing people with the right conditions who can't compete against those other unscrupulous employers. So raising the rate of income support in and of itself is going to be an incredibly important mechanism to be increasing wages and so making sure that people who are working are being paid an appropriate amount for the value of their labour. I do then want to talk about what then, as well as sort of being bad for workers, having people absolutely living in abject poverty on income support, but of course it's incredibly bad for the people who are having to survive, to get by, who are living in that quagmire of poverty. We know that the current rates are in inadequate. We know that they've been inadequate for years. And we've heard that from the community, from politicians, and they have clearly to told, po told politicians that the payment rate is, ad is inadequate. And we know that people are having to make really incredibly difficult choices of whether they are paying the rent or paying for food or, basic, or being able to pay for their medical bills, choosing between um, be, seeing a doctor and keeping the heating on. And people who are facing domestic violence, homelessness and many other challenges are trapped by a payment that is far too low. And as well as hearing it directly from community members, 
We have heard it directly from the peak bodies across multiple sectors, the same ones who are supporting this legislation before us today, the Australian Council of Trade Unions, the Business Council of Australia, the Australian Council of Social Services, have all at different points acknowledged the need to urgently raise the rate. And I want to share two stories with you today from people who have been forced to rely on income support payments, and, how, and which will also um, give you an example of how living on inadequate income support reduces their ability to engage in paid work. And if we are serious about getting people into work and supporting people to be in work and supporting people to be able to move into paid employment, we need to be increasing the rate of income support as well as doing all of the important measures that are in this bill. The first story I want to share you is an anonymous one. This person begins by saying, I've been living in poverty on Centrelink payments, I'll study, then new start job seeker, since leaving high school almost nine years back. I've never been able to afford housing that meets my needs as a disabled person with trauma from multiple domestic violence situations from various cohabitors. I can barely afford anywhere to live at all, actually, and the fact that I'm once again likely having to find a place to live with current prices within my greater area starting at 70 per cent of the full job seeker payment is soul crushing. I spend hundreds of dollars a month on medication and medical equipment I need to live on a day-to-day -day basis. I, can barely I can't afford to see specialists for things like my ADHD or autism. I can barely afford basic foods. Almost any meat I buy is nearly off, any veg frozen, any snack half price or made from scratch. Almost all of my money goes directly to rent, bills, food, medical. The poultry le leftovers aren't enough to keep covering my, keeping my car on the road. I have to ask for help pretty much each, each year to cover these costs. Also, almost every job I've ever applied for has specifically stated that applicants need a car, so people on JobSeeker are literally priced out of being able to work. New clothes are cast off from friends or from the clearance section at an already cheap store. I've never been able to buy my own phone, which, by the way, is needed just to access Centrelink payments, and an up-to-date phone with reasonable technical specs is a necessity for the vast majority of jobs I've worked or applied for. COVID supplements, which merely raised me to around the poverty line, not even properly out of poverty, changed how I could live and feel for about a year. I didn't have to count every cent to make sure it would last two weeks to the next pay. I was able to get medical care I desperately needed but couldn't before afford. Even then, though, I had to rely on the goodwill of those specialists to charge much less than the usual rates. I could afford car service and registration without having to beg others for help. I felt vaguely human and part of society for a brief time. My mental health, despite the turmoil of the time, had never been better. I'd like to be able to continue taking the medications that allow me to get up of a morning and do anything other than stare into the distance. I'd like to be able to afford taking any of the jobs I've been applying for, for industry, in, in, industries important for Australia but currently struggling for workers. I'd like to be able to afford glasses that don't give me a headache. I'd like to be able to afford chicken that I don't have to immediately take home and sniff and hope it's not gone bad. I'd like a lot of things that you and so many take for granted as part of your everyday lives and would cost you and Australia so very little. I just want to be human again. Is that so much to ask? The second story was from Miranda. and Miranda says, currently I am completely burned out and have been for at least five years. Five years ago, I had a 15-year-old in and out of hospital and in a wheelchair. I also had a 13-year-old living with MECFS and at school part-time when he wasn't getting a cold that left him in bed for six weeks at a time. As a single parent, I was also working 30 hours a week, twice the number of hours required, yet still needing income support. I had a breakdown that year and have never recovered. I lost my job as my bosses retired a couple of weeks before lockdown in 2020. When the COVID supplement was introduced, I was able to pay my rent, bills and provide for my kids. The younger one was bed-bound with MECFS. My second job was down to an hour a week. Once my youngest turned 18, just before Christmas, I lost family tax benefit and child support, as well as job seeker being back to the normal rate. I still have that casual job that varies a lot during the year, from three hours a week to 25 hours a week. I had another one that came to an end recently. This year, I was diagnosed with autism and ADHD. My younger kid, who still lives at home, was also diagnosed with autism. This kid is still mostly bedbound, 
with MECFS2. I can't in good conscience subject him to the torture that is mutual obligations. This will send his health backwards. I have been dealing with job search agencies and mutual obligations on and off for over 20 years, since I was fired for being pregnant. Not once have they helped me get a job. Instead, I have been advised to straight out lie to potential employers about my circumstances. I am worried about how I will continue to pay rent, as it is $10 a day more than job seeker. However, there are no rentals in the area, cheaper or otherwise. Both my son and I have high health needs, and I am still completely burned out. Job seeker needs to be raised so that I can take care of my health and my kids' health, keep a roof over our heads, pay our bills, as well as have a better chance of finding employment and other opportunities to bring in an income. So I want to say thank you to all the advocates who have been fighting to raise the rate of income support. We hear you and we will keep fighting for change. As Miranda and the others have told us, there is clear evidence that things can be better and clear evidence that raising the rate of income support is critically important for secure jobs and better way for workers. I mean, for a decade, the Liberals left the payment rate below the poverty line, but for a brief window, the COVID supplement, we saw how things could be different. And people spoke about the differences that it made in their lives, being able to afford food and a safe place to stay. People could afford their medical bills, could pay their energy research. And research showed that the COVID supplement halved the rate of poverty in Australia. And particularly, it also showed that more people were able to enter the job market. More people are actually able to get work during COVID because of the increased rate of income support. It shows, again, that connection between work and actually supporting people who are out of work on JobSeeker. So that experience in the midst of a crisis showed us that there can be a different way. We can raise the rate of income support and meaningfully re reduce poverty and increase conditions and better jobs for workers in Australia. So this is an approach that the Greens have constantly um, advocated for, and I do want to again acknowledge the important work of my predecessor in my portfolio, Sen Senator Rachel Seawitt, over many years, including particularly her work chairing the inquiry into adequacy of New Start and related payments. So we included a commitment to raise the rate of job seeker in our election, election platform with a clear costed policy. And I mean, the Labor Party who have been reluctant to do this um, have yet to put forward one of their own. At the same time, they have been carrying forward the Scott Morrison stage three tax cuts and insisting on giving $250 billion over the decade to the ultra wealthy. We've put forward clear amendments to a bill that recently passed through this place. And I thank Senator, Pocock, Senator David Pocock for his support of those amendments. I also want to thank Senator David Pocock for his important advocacy during the negotiations on this bill on the need to raise the rate and for pushing the government to act. And if the commitment put forward by the Labor Party as part of the negotiations over this bill does lead to a meaningful increase in the rate of job seeker, then we will welcome it. But there can't be an excuse for further inaction and delaying action because people are living in poverty now. The skyrocketing cost of living is real now. We need to have an increase in the rate now. So to wrap up, as my colleagues have indicated and as I said at the beginning, the Greens are supporting this bill. We will also continue to actively advocate for an increase to the rate of job seeker. So if the government's commitment as part of those negotiations leads to meaningful change, we will welcome it, but it cannot be an excuse for inaction. And we will continue to push for a guaranteed livable income so that there is genuine support for everyone who needs it. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to make uh, my contribution to uh, uh, this piece of legislation, and President, uh, Acting Deputy President, um, the reason that this legislation is so contested is that it will have a significant impact on the IR landscape in Australia. Um, quite frankly, in a negative way, we've already had small businesses and medium businesses saying that they've got unions on their doorstep. Uh, they're being threatened by the unions. And this bill isn't so much about the workforce and workers in this country. 
as the Labor Party spin ma machine would have us all believe. It's a union life support bill. It's about providing power back to the union movement, with private sector union membership sinking to somewhere about 10 per cent, or less than that. The unions are seeking a way back, and the government is providing it to them through this legislation. Businesses are already telling me, they're already saying they're being threatened by unions and being told that this legislation gives the unions the opportunity to go after non-union workplaces. We know that. Businesses that have been working cooperatively, great arrangements to their workforce, seeking to expand their workforces. We all know that there's a workforce shortage in this country right now. And so the bargaining power actually is with workers because businesses are seeking work, good workers, good employees, because that's important for their businesses. And we are seeing a growth in wages across this country because of the balance of the market in Australia. So we are seeing growth in wages. Uh, the Labor Party wants to dismiss that reality, that fact, but everywhere I go, every workplace that I talk to, they are all looking for workers. And they're all willing to pay for workers who will work hard for them and provide strong productivity. But the non-union businesses are also telling me, they're also telling me that the unions are seeing this legislation as a ticket to come after them. So don't be fooled by the rhetoric from Labor. This legislation is about reinvigorating union power. It's not about workforce. The objective is to drive up union membership by standing over workers in businesses and industry and driving up Labor Party revenues, quite frankly, through the union movement. And how do we know that for sure? Well, Acting Deputy President, the CFMMEU have bailed the cat. The CFMMEU have bailed the cat. John Sepka's out there, and he has said he looks forward to having the power to go after non-union sites. And I can tell you, people I know in the building industry, in the fit-out sector, construction industry across the country, they're hearing, hearing that all over Australia. And I remember during my time in the construction industry and seeing the impact of patent bargaining across the, the, the construction industry and understanding the impact on inflationary forces that that had, that effectively where Labor are sending us is back to those bad old days of the 70s and 80s when the unions threatened, threatened subcontractors, disrupted building sites. So when the Labor Party tell us about working to drive more affordable housing, they're kidding themselves. They are, they are kidding themselves when you think about what the impacts of this legislation are going to be on the construction industry in this country. Now, Labor say that this legislation is about delivering an election, an election commitment. Now, the Labor Party did go to the election saying they wanted to get wages moving again. They did say that. But they didn't say, they didn't say that they were going to introduce legislation to bring unions back into business across the country, to give the opportunity for unions to attack small business across the country and to drag them into processes that they don't necessarily want to be a part of. No wonder they want to ram this legislation through the parliament with a truncated Senate committee process, deals on the sides with the crossbench. They really don't want the scrutiny that they should have, that this legislation deserves, given the impact it will have on the Australian economy. They want to ram it through before Christmas 
so that the union mates can get straight into businesses across the country and they can deliver on their back door secret deal with the union movement at the expense of Australian business and the Australian economy. So much for a fairer, kinder, more open parliament and process. Obviously, although our, the Prime Minister sent out the memo, they didn't read it and then it living by it. In reality, though, there is one question that sits with this legislation. Why would Australian workers trust Labor with their industrial relations? Now, Labor make out that they are the party of the worker, but increasingly we're seeing that that's not the case. But let's not forget that the legislation that this is amending and replacing was legislation that was brought into being by the Labor Party under former Prime Minister Julia Gillard when she was the Minister for Industrial Relations to replace the legislation that was in place before that. A period of time, I might add, acting Dep uh, Deputy President, when wages did see strong growth during the Howard years. Go back and have a look at the numbers. Strong growth in wages in relation to the economy during the Howard years. Strong growth in the economy, good economic management from a coalition government, uh, alongside strong growth in wages. But the framework that workers in this country have been working to since 2009, when the Labor Party system came into place, Labor Party's legislation, Fair Work Australia, oversighting the system with Labor's hand-picked <coughs> people who have been assessing wage claims and wage increases since that legislation came into place, all Labor's legislation, all Labor's hand-picked people, all been in place since 2009. Why would, and, and they, and that process has driven the outcomes that we've seen over the last decade. It's that process. Every time the coalition sought to amend the Fair Work Act, even during COVID, even during COVID, the cry came from the other side: "Here we go again, work choices." Not prepared to amend the legislation. Not prepared to consider things that even uh, had been agreed. Uh, with workers and employers, with unions and employers, not prepared to agree to those things, knock them back. And so let's be really frank about this. The industrial relations framework that has been providing oversight to workers' wages over the last decade is Labor's. Now they want to blame the coalition for everything. That's their mantra deflect any responsibility, blame somebody else, not stand up and take appropriate responsibility for their own actions. But let's be fair dinkum about this. This is Labor legislation passed in 2009, amended a couple of times, new modern award system, and to quote the Prime Minister of the time, the Fair Work Act delivers on the Rudd government's promise for a fair and balanced laws that will allow workplaces to become more productive and competitive without stripping away basic pay and conditions. The Fair Work Act has enterprise bargaining in good faith at its heart. Enterprise level, level bargaining will be the primary means of driving future workplace improvements and productivity. And it goes on. Media release from the Honourable Julia Gillard MP, 1st of July 2009. The new workplace relations system is designed to balance the needs of employees and employers to ensure Australia is competitive and prosperous without taking away 
basic employment rights and guaranteed minimum standards. So when the Labor Party says the workplace system is broken, who broke it? The legislation is effectively the same as they introduced and came into effect on 2009. So why would any worker in this country trust Labor now? It's not about workers. This legislation is not about workers. It's about union power. We all know it. We all know it. We understand it. And the unions know it because, helpfully for us, unhelpfully for the opposition, for the government, unhelpfully for the government, John Setka belled the cat. It allows him and his mates to go after non-union sites. And at the same time, they're stripping away the ABCC that provided some oversight to that. They, they say that it was all about stickers and on hats and things of that, that nature. But we know and we've seen the outrageous, the disgraceful things that the CFMMEU have been penalised for, have been fined hundreds of thousands of dollars for. And you don't get fined hundreds of thousands of dollars for flags on cranes and stickers on hats. That is, that is, that is a complete and utter cop-out, and any person on the government side who tries to run that tripe should be ashamed of themselves. We had a statement in the parliament this morning about the Jenkins review, and yet people on the other side stand up and try and make the claim that the ABCC is just about stickers on hats. And some of the disgraceful things that I won't try and repeat in this place, but we have debated in this place before. We have debated in this place before. That's the sort of thing that the ABCC should be doing. And at the same time that they're letting the unions back in, they're taking off the oversight and controls of some of the more outrageous elements of the union movement. They should be ashamed. They should be ashamed. The opposition will support fair and reasonable workplace relations. We want to see Australians earning a good living. We are concerned, as the Labor Party say they are, about the cost of living. We wanted to make some sensible changes to the Workplace Relations Act while we were in government. The Labor opposed it with the Greens. Not unsurprising. But here we are, a bit over a decade after the current act came into place, put in place by Labor, and Labor say that we should trust them with the industrial relations system, their legislation, their hand-picked people in Fair Work Australia, making the decisions about Australian workers' wages, and they try and blame us for the impact on wages. It's all in their lap. So why should Australian workers trust them now? As I said, because we know, we know that this is about union power and they're taking away other provisions of oversight on the union movement at the same time that they're doing this. At a time of high inflation, they, we will see, because the, app, the, the business is already telling us the unions are tapping on the door, we're going to see more disruption in workplaces because the unions have more power that's been provided to them by this legislation. And Labor will do what they've done before. They don't know how to manage money, they don't know how to manage the economy, and they will can continue to contribute um, to the worsening situation in relation to inflation in this country. And we've seen it before. Unfortunately, I had to live through it during the 70s and 80s in the building industry, and we're going to see it again. Senator Roberts. Thank you. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, and to the workers and small businesses of our nation, I want to firstly thank the Minister's staff and the departmental staff for their briefings. I want to thank the many companies, unions, employer entities, workers. We listen. The Hawke-Keating years broke the previous harsh, adversarial, mutually assured destruction policy in industrial relations in this country. And then we went back with the Fair Work Act from Julie Gillard in 2009. Complex, prescriptive, the creators of this act do not understand industrial relations. A senior practical Labor MP, who I regard very highly, said that Gillard's Fair Work Act was a backward step damaging Australia. It's failed. Many want it changed. 
I know union bosses like David Noonan, Michael Ravbar, for whom I have some regard, Bukarika, uh, Alex Bukarika, the ETU's Michael Wright, say we need to change. We need to get back to basics. Employer and industry groups say the same. MPs in this chamber say the same. How hard is it for workers to know their entitlements with this? It's impossible. How hard is it to run a small business these days? Very difficult. This thing justifies the Industrial Relations Club's existence. Workers now kowtow to the Industrial Relations Club. Let's go back to basics. Unions were formed in the 19th century to pr protect workplace basics, protect pay, protect safety, protect entitlements, protect job security, protect retirement, ensure fairness, strengthen workers' bargaining power. Then we got laws to protect workers, state and federal. Unions were doing a vital job. Politically, they were omitted from being held accountable the way other organisations such as company directors were. After successful union campaigns, governments legislated worker protections in employment, safety, industry and health legislation. Unions were no longer needed for those basic protections because they were enshrined in legislation. Yet they had immunity from many provisions under the law and were effectively monopolies with no competition among unions within industries. As with all monopolies, this was a result of government legislation. As with all monopolies, they faced no accountability from competitors. As with all monopolies, some abused this privilege, some union bosses. In recent years, in this cosy life with no competition and no accountability, we saw abuses in the HSU, the SDA, the AWU, the CFMEU, in which union bosses stole workers' money for personal, financial and other benefits, including brothels. In the 1990s, I was good friends with Jim Lamley, the CFMEU Vice President. He shared with me his thoughts that the union, which was once strong and powerful and genuinely committed to its miners, was sloppy and not providing a service to its members. And that, and that at time, as times had changed, it needed to lift its game because traditional services were already legislated. As a result of neglect of union members, Union membership in the private sector outside the public service is just 9 per cent and falling. But not all large union, unions have a monopoly or, or have union bosses that want to exploit. I note the TWU and I single them out and compliment them. They've had turmoil, just like every entity, but they've sorted themselves out. They're represented here by Senator Sheldon and Senator Stirl. Excellent advocates for the, for the trade union movement, excellent advocates for workers, advocate, ev, excellent advocates for Australians. And the reason, I think, one of the reasons is that the TWU contains not only employees as truck drivers, it contains small businesses. The TWU is the largest entity with the largest membership of small businesses in this country. And they work together to provide a service. I was going to discuss the abuse, the sheer abuse and exploitation but I've, I've done that enough of people in the Hunter Valley at the hands of the, of the uh, C, CFMEU combined with BHB combined with Chandler McLeod, which is part of the, the recruit, eight, recruit holdings from Japan, the largest uh, labour hire company in the world. But instead, I'll go to ask a few questions of anyone watching today. Labour titles its bill the Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill. Let me give you a few facts and then ask you what you think. My, firstly, the new bill omits any, any uh, hint at equal pay for equal work bill, my bill that we've pushed for months now, and lifting casual pay rates. Why? The committee agreed, the committee of inquiry in the Senate agreed on the need for my bill. They said, let's wait for Labor's version, not in the bill that we see before us. My bill is ready to go with seven awards. They found no issues with it. How long do abused miners and airline staff need to wait? Let's get the experience before widening. Why not put my, include my bill in this? We've researched it thoroughly. And then I asked last week, and, the, and the, uh, the minister's staff said they've barely started consultation. And then they did so with the perpetrators of the heinous uh, acts in the, in the Hunter Valley and central Queensland. They're not interested in pay rates, in better pay. They're not interested because they've done nothing to include that. Let's look at job security. Well, job security. Look at COVID mismanagement. 
the phasing out of the coal industry and jobs under the Liberal Nationals and Labor, erosion of our rights and freedoms under COVID mismanagement, increasing energy prices, killing manufacturing and hurting agriculture, lack of much needed tax reform, lack of much needed economic reform, increasing debt, work, health and safety systems being bypassed, Australia's productive capacity being destroyed, the failure of our industrial relations systems and more. Tax reform, high immigration flooding in, putting pr downward pressure on wages, inflation. They're not interested in job security at all. Then let's have a look at the, uh, the summit. It was a sham. It was not a genuine Hawke Keating style uh, consultation. The government knew behind, beforehand what they were going to do after the summit. The key items in this bill that they've now got in front of them in the chamber were not even raised as summit topics. Joel Fitzgibbon, the previous member for Hunter, I wrote to him many times and he re refused to reply to me on the abuses in the Hunter Valley. Same with his replacement, Dan Repicoli. Same with Minister Burke, not interested in job security, not interested in fairness, not interested in the law. Now we've got a bill before us that is another 249 pages, plus government amendments, 150 of them, 150 amendments to their own bill in the, in the lower house, that's another 34 pages. They're going to just add more complexity, make it thicker, make it more difficult for people to understand. These 150 amendments confirm that the bill was hastily introduced, not thought through. If there's so many amendments and so many flaws can be identified in such a short time, how many will implementation in the real world expose? And who will pay for that? Workers will pay for that. Small business will pay for that. This is so flawed the government is making amendments to its own amendments. This is a spit and hope bill. When the, AAB, when the Australian Building and Construction Commission was introduced, there were months of consultation. When it was abolished, there was none. The same should apply to the whole bill. It needs debate, it needs to be deferred and considered properly. And who pays for this mess? The people, union members, small businesses, workers, communities in the nation. Let's have a look at the bill now. 27 parts, 13 substantive. Some are simply tidying, good. Some are worthy improvements, minor but worthy, good. Some big issues not thought through. Some big issues thought through yet deceptively hidden because they don't want the people to see it. Some issues designed deliberately to confuse and to obfuscate, all slapped behind a false labelling of enabling a pay rise and more secure jobs. This is what you get out of the south end of a north-facing bull. There is no mandate for stuff that's been hidden, no mandate at all. On the 22nd of November 2022, Small Business Minister Julie Collins failed to answer two core questions about how many small businesses will be drawn into wage bargaining and how much it will cost. They add another definition to the already 140 definitions of small business across government departments. The government tells the people of Australia that the whole rationale behind this bill is to get wages moving. Yet there's no specific detail how, when, who. Nothing concrete, just broad, fluffy statements, typical of the Labor Greens Teal coalition governing the Senate. Labor claims it will improve the bargaining position of small businesses, uh, of small business and workers and in small business. So why do thousands of small businesses oppose it? Could it be due to this? Why are union, business, union bosses given the power to veto to frustrate the bargaining process? Even if employees agree with the employer, they still can be vetoed by union bosses, remote union bosses. Why are smaller employers locked into a process they do not support if they have a headcount of more than 19 people, including those who choose to work only a few hours a week? Why isn't the full-time equivalent used? As a result, large businesses can negotiate conditions smaller businesses cannot compete with. That aids large businesses to kill off smaller competitors, leading to fewer jobs. Plus, small businesses lack the resources to deal with all the red tape. The abolition of the building, Australian Building and Construction Commission illustrates the government's aims and intent, rewarding union bosses with power. That's what's behind this bill. That means a return to the damaging days of industrial thuggery. Remember the BLF? The Dyson Hayden Royal Commission revealed so much thuggery in the CFMEU. Court cases and criminal convictions, criminal convictions. The ABCC worked, Labor abolished it, coalition reintroduced it, Labor is now abolishing it. Millions of dollars are fined, what will happen to them? Violent behaviour, industrial blackmail, killing small businesses, restrictive work practices that cost taxpayers an additional 30 per cent on building costs. 
Who's going to enforce the law now? This bill will, in the long run, harm unions. It gives more power to union bosses over members and generally in the community and over industry. Monopolies discourage responsibility and competitiveness of service and they reduce accountability. This bill entrenches the monopoly and makes it stronger. Unions may receive a short-term boost, yet long-term it will accelerate, sadly, the slide of declining union membership. Look in Queensland. Premier Palaszczuk aims to kill the Red Union. She is protecting the Queensland Nursing Union, who are big donors to Labor. She is trying to kill the Red Union that is starting freely because she wants to kill any competition to her union bosses that donate. This is not about higher, higher pay and job security. It's about giving union bosses power over industries and over companies and employers and over workers. Instead of returning to the pre-Hawk days, we need the reverse. We need to restore the primacy of the workplace, the employer-employee relationship, with employees free to bring in unions when they choose. The big picture, industrial relations needs comprehensive reform. We need to get away from the industrial relations adversarial approach that plagued this country. It locks managements, executives, union bosses, consultants, lawyers into industrial relations games, not into improving businesses. Instead of having the brightest and best lawyers and accountants focus on how we can smash the opposition in this country, we need to focus on how we can smash the opposition in South Korea and Japan and China. They're our overseas competitors. Industrial, reform, industrial relations reform needs to be comprehensive. Focus on the primacy of the employer-employee relationship. Return to the days of Hawke Keating, at least for a start. People need to focus on their business, not the corporation. Always around the world, workplaces, people focus on their workplace. That's what, that's what people love. We need to industrial relations reform that develops responsibility for the business. We need a short bill. Instead of this monstrosity, we need about 20 pages of basic entitlements. And instead of getting off the hook through lawyers with this monstrosity, we need clear provisions that if these basic provisions are violated, people go to jail. Workers are getting abused in this country. Short, small businesses are getting abused in this country. We need simple provisions, severe penalties. Well, let's consider the Teals. David Pocock has a Teal in the Labor Greens Teal Senate governing, governing Coalition. The governing coalition in this Senate is Labor Greens Teal. Fifteen amendments he announced on Sunday. The government was going to do nine anyway. Four are corrections, another four are corrections to government oversights in the bill. The job seeker rate is irrelevant to the bill, horse trading. That leaves one amendment that Senator Pocock initiated. Union bosses will still be able to drag small business into multi-employer bargaining and get out those businesses with, will, will have to engage in expense and to get out of multi-employer bargaining, those businesses will have to engage in expensive litigation. Welcome to the new Labor, Greens, Teals coalition running this country, where the love of power is more important. In conclusion, instead of the lies and pretense of this bill, we need honesty. Instead of boosting union bosses' power, we need to make the employer-employee workplace relationship the focus to get Australia talent to the fore, to make us competitive again. Instead of adding more complexity in regulations, we need comprehensive industrial relations reform. Simplicity, honesty, efficiency, protection, real protection. This mess bypasses protections, leaves workers vulnerable, exposed. Above this building, we have one flag. We are one community, we are one nation, and we work like hell to protect workers, protect small business and restore honesty and governance. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, the President. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy President. And I rise to speak against the Fair Work Amendment legislation bill before the Senate today, proudly, not only as the daughter of a small family-owned enterprise, where I tell you, if we had had the Fair Work uh, Act then, my dad wouldn't have actually got the milk run done because he didn't pay very well. Uh, but I, what I could, didn't make up in dollars, I got in big M's at the time. It was the 1980s. Uh, but family-owned enterprises teach you a whole lot of things about life and the importance of contributing and the importance of hard work. But I also rise to speak vehemently against this bill 
as the Shadow Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development. This bill will have profound impact on the construction industry, which underpins our infrastructure build across the country, on the transport industry, on our roads, our ports, our airports, and indeed on regional development. We know that the majority of country towns and regional capitals are built and sustained by small to medium-sized enterprises, because they're the, they're the enterprises that the Labor Party and their union mates are after. They've already got big, big hold in the big business, in the big businesses, where they lack um, a hold and a sway is in those small family-owned enterprises right across the country. 2.6 million uh, small businesses across this country are the target of these changes. And we've heard senators right across uh, my side of the chamber talk about the rush to get this done and the mistakes that the Labor Party's made on the way to getting that done. 150 amendments to their own legislation. They had the drafting pen. They had all the bureaucrats. They had all the legal experts in the department to get it right, but they didn't. 150 amendments to their own bill before it gets to the Senate uh, and uh, you know, a few odd minor changes by Senator Pocock, and here we are. Very, very chaotic. Why, why are they su in such a rush, Senator Cadell? Why? You know what I think it is? I think you've got to pay the ferryman sometimes. And this is more about making sure Sally McManus and the ACTU have a very, very Merry Christmas, thank you very much, as if an election of an Albanese government was enough for them in 2022 is to ensure that Sally McManus can go on uh, an extended Christmas holiday with a big smile on her face, knowing she has secured through this Labor government no, through this Labor government reaching into family-owned and run enterprises right across the country that will wreak havoc on our productivity, that won't raise wages in the way that's been talked about here today. And it is not a bill that you had a mandate for. You went uh, to the people. In fact, the Treasurer explicitly ruled out measures that are covered in this bill during the election campaign. And yet here we are, a mere six months later, seeking to legislate the most draconian windback of industrial relations in this country in 40 years. And the Prime Minister waltzes around. I'm the new hawk. You know, he's got the voice happening. He's the new Keating. He's got this. He's nowhere near the re reforming nature that the Hawke and Keating government put our economy on to the future. This will be a drag on a, uh, our economic productivity. And it's not just me saying it. It's all the small to medium enterprises and industry that are saying it. And it is not a policy that's been endorsed by the Australian um, people. When we look um, at what industry has actually been saying about um, the impact of this bill, they've been absolutely scathing. It will be back to the future on our Australian ports. Who wants to go back to where uh, farmers and small business people are actually having punch-ons with unions at ports? Because that actually is what used to happen in this country because of the severe and radical industrial reaction from unions. This is exactly where this uh, bill will be taking us back to. The government, in its arrogance, has no interest in allowing the proper time for examination of the implications of these you know, ab um, proposed reforms. And its, their arrogance is compounded by the raft of amendments and, again, the latest changes uh, negotiated on the fly. The bill will have significant impact in my portfolio area, and it's the master builders of Australia's submission um, that has said the return to industry-wide pattern deals and entrenching sector-wide strike action will actually be damaging to workplaces and the broader Australian economy. You don't believe them. We've heard a lot of talk about the feminised workforces and low-paid workers. Well, in the construction industry, that's an area uh, of the Australian economy where there has been 
wage rises going forward. You cannot find a chippy for love nor money. And rightfully, when something's in short supply, the cost of it goes up. In the construction industry and in the transport industry, um, you know, that flat rate of wage has not actually been occurring. Industry such as the construction industry uh, doesn't operate in a silo. It is part of an intricate supply chain. Think of concrete. If it doesn't get there on time, you delay the entire trajectory of that project, whether it's your backyard patio or whether it is a major construction project in a capital city uh, that will have uh, benefits to the broader community and productivity across the economy. They aren't carved out like the construction industry is. In summary, uh, the master builders have said this bill removes the enterprise from enterprise bargaining, removes agreement from enterprise agreements and gives more unions say than workers. And that's got to be a bad thing. Unions and the Labor Party say they're about workers. Well, why don't the working people vote for you? The National Party actually represents those in this country that are on the lowest median income levels. And yet, you know what? You are so non-competitive in our seats because the workers across Australia know that you do not stand up for them. You are much more interested, as we've seen in the latest Victorian election, fighting for the high income earners in capital cities against your um, green fellows than actually sticking up for the workers in this country, those who are on low incomes and in vulnerable workplaces. When we look at um, what else the uh, master builders talk about, about not actually um, businesses don't work in this economic silo. So there's been a whole song and dance around this place about, oh, we've carved out the construction industry. The CFMEU has got nothing to do with it anymore. That is not the case. If industries like shipping, transport, warehousing and logistics are adversely impacted by multiplier bargaining, so will the construction industry. If there are port strikes, if there are transport strikes, that will impact the construction industry. And it is false to come in here and say otherwise. Independent modelling from the master builders indicate that this policy to abolish the ABCC, which other senators have spoken about, will cost the economy $47.5 billion by 2030. That's a hell of a lot of roads, hospitals, schools that could be built. Why are we abolishing the ABCC? Not because they weren't doing their job, not because they weren't standing up to the sexist CFMEU, which so many of you are here as a result of, and they use your skirts to hide behind, but it's the ABCC that's actually calling out the sexism and the brutality that occurs on construction sites right across this country. And you know what? You want it abolished. Not because it's taking the CFMEU to court and winning cases. Uh, which is pretty tough to do, but because this is a deal you have done to get here. That is the facts of the business that you are in on that side, other side. Even from the most impartial observer, you can see these reforms are heavily weighted to the benefit of the government's union mates rather than uh, the transport portfolio that I represent. And I just want to briefly, in the time left to me, go to um, the impact on both the aviation uh, and the shipping industry that aren't carved out, that aren't carved out. But as an island nation, nothing gets into this country without coming from somewhere else and arriving mainly at our ports. So if our ports are not efficient, if our ports aren't productive, we all pay. We all pay right across our economy. Um, you know, and I've been quite concerned, I guess, at the fact that ports are going to be subjected um, to significant impacts in the workplace. They are critical to our supply chain efforts, uh, that were the, the fragility of which we were exposed during COVID. Um, and just some examples that uh, Switzer, for instance, they do all the tugboating, a lot of the tugboating in this country. They were forced to lock the gates due to the failure of both sides to reach an agreement. On day one, there would have only been 20 days of fuel supply for the nation. Not just cars and trucks, but airlines. 
So if you're wondering, you know, what's ports got to do with me? I don't own a yacht. No, you don't have to own a yacht. Ports are important to you because if we shut down for a couple of days, we run out of fuel. And in a country like Australia, and as diversely populated as we are, that has health impacts, that has education impacts, and that has severe economic impacts. When we actually, um, the Productivity Commission actually is doing uh, an inquiry at the moment into maritime efficiency, and there's uh, the four factors contributing to the productivity and efficiency of our ports uh, by Switzer. Their submission to that. They've got four, and one of them is the industrial relation terms that they're currently having to operate. Things like minimum crewing rules, which are not in any way linked to operational safety requirements. High penalty rates, which actually don't correlate to the work actually done. Restrictions on type of recruitments, etc., etc., etc. But one of the most concerning things that I've heard thus far when people, and I know a lot of people have been talking about the low paid. And on our side of this chamber, we want Australians to be well paid for their work. Absolutely. And that is making sure that our businesses are as supported as they can be, to be as competitive as they can be, to make sure that they can pay their workers as much as they can. And if our government hadn't taken the action we did during COVID, there would be less businesses employing Australians in this country than right now. Because guess what? Government, unless you want to live in a communist country, governments don't employ everybody. Governments don't set wages. That is not how it actually works. One of the most concerning things, though, when I think about the efficiency and productivity of ports, which won't be addressed, which will actually be exacerbated by this particular bill, was actually the Milo and Magnum clauses in the agreements uh, with our tugboat uh, companies. One of the stories that I heard about when you want to know why it costs you so much to get uh, products from overseas might be the lazy $18,000 that this company had to spend to get a helicopter drop off of a crate of magnums, magnum, not guns, people, let me assure the chamber, not guns, ice creams, because the crew refused to unload a ship because there weren't chocolate ice creams enough in the fridge on the tugboat. Now, these are not low-paid workers. These guys and gals earn in excess of $250,000 a year. These are more highly paid than some senators in this chamber. And they're not unloading a ship because you don't have enough ice creams on board. So you know what the company has to do? They have to get a helicopter, 18 grand. Here you go, boys and girls. Can you unload the ship now, please? That's our current industrial relations system, let alone what will happen under the draconian, union-friendly measures that this government is bringing before us. That will wreak havoc on our economy, wreak havoc on our ports, in our aviation sector. Qantas has said they're going to close down their marginal routes. You know what? Not going to affect you in Melbourne, Senator. Not going to worry you in Melbourne at all or Brisbane and Sydney. You know who'll pay the price for that? It'll be Longreach. It'll be Dubbo. It'll be Mildura. And you couldn't give a damn about those communities because they don't vote for you. Uh, they, but they're actually out there making the money, doing their job raising their families, contributing to this nation and, you know what, I know you hate to hear it, voting for the National Party. As Shadow Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, this is an appalling bill and we will not be supporting it. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, uh, Deputy President. I rise to speak briefly on the Fair Work Amendment Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill 2022 uh, and the reforms introduced by the bill, particularly to address the gender pay gap. I'm pleased to see movement on making gender equality an objective of the Fair Work Act, introducing a statutory equal remuneration principle, strengthening rights to flexible working arrangements and banning pay gag clauses. These are all fixes that the Greens have called for over many years and which we welcome. The overall gender pay gap in Australia remains at around 14 per cent. 
Women, on average, still have to work an extra 60 days to earn the same as men. Men are twice as likely to be higher paid than women across almost all industries, and 85 per cent of employers still have pay gaps in men's favour, even in female-dominated workplaces. For First Nations women, women from culturally diverse backgrounds, women with disability and older women, the gap can be even worse. The gender pay gap is a product of systemic and cultural factors like workplace discrimination, lack of workplace flexibility, the cost and availability of childcare and the impact of taking time out for caring work. Closing the gender pay gap will take a concerted effort by employers and governments at all levels. This bill makes a promising start, building on the work of the Workplace Gender Equality Agency in tracking gender inequality and complementing the work to be done by the Women's Economic uh, Equality Task Force. I'd like to make some comments about pay secrecy. Pay secrecy has been an ongoing contributor to the gender pay gap. And in 2015, I introduced a private member's bill, the Fair Work Amendment Gender Pay Gap Bill, to ban the use of pay secrecy clauses. So I am very pleased to see this concept being legislated today. For too long, employment contracts that insist on pay secrecy have been used to hide the gender pay gap. Britain and the US no longer allow such clauses. The European Union is set to make pay transparency a binding measure for member states, but pay uh, gag clauses remain a normal practice in Australia. This bill is an overdue measure to end that practice and to create a more level playing field for women in the workplace. No one should ever feel obligated to tell someone what they're earning, but no one should be prevented from discussing it. Promoting healthy conversations about pay is the best way to bring inequality out into the open and then address it. Now, on gender equity and equal remuneration, the easiest way to close the gender pay gap is to pay women more. A key driver of the gender pay gap is the fact that jobs dominated by women, often as a result of entrenched gender stereotypes, remain undervalued. Teaching, childcare, nursing, cleaning, retail and aged care sectors, they all have lower wages, poorer conditions, job insecurity and lower retention rates. And yet we saw through the pandemic how crucial and critical those roles are. The wages paid in those sectors need to better reflect their value. I'm very pleased that the Aged Care Work Value case recognised the gendered nature of the valuation of work and the undervaluation of work. There is no justification for pushing a wheelbarrow being valued more highly than pushing a wheelchair, and yet average wages in care sectors remain lower than those in construction. I was working at a community legal centre when the social services equal remuneration case taken by my union, the Australian Services Union, was decided. And I can tell you that the boost uh, that was provided to female-dominated sectors covered by that decision was invaluable. People were properly paid for the work they did. Organisations had some certainty that they could attract and retain staff. People felt valued and their productivity and well-being improved as a result. Women make up 61 per cent of workers being paid based on an award. So ensuring that the Fair Work Commission is tasked with considering gender equity and equal remuneration principles when making determinations will improve work conditions, productivity and wellbeing across all award sectors. I welcome these objectives and the establishment of expert panels on pay equity and the care and community sector uh, to guide that work. <clears throat> now, in relation to flexible working arrangements, um, whether they can access flexible working arrangements is a key factor for many parents in deciding whether to return to work and on what terms. According to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, most Australian women with a child under two who have returned to paid work use some kind of flexible working arrangement. Access to flexible working arrangements is also a key factor in how caring is shared between parents. For victim survivors of family, domestic or sexual violence, Flexible arrangements may be the only way to juggle work and dealing with trauma or the emotional and administrative fallout from escaping an abusive situation. Normalising flexible working arrangements recognises the productivity benefits of ensuring that all workers can juggle family, personal and work responsibilities. Later start times, shared roles, days working from home or other arrangements can improve staff retention and staff wellbeing. Many employers recognise this and will grant requests for flexibility, but some bosses will just say no without considering whether and how they could actually make it work. 
We therefore welcome the requirement for employers to grant reasonable requests for family-friendly working arrangements, accommodating the need to care for elderly or disabled relatives or recovery from family, domestic and sexual violence. Now, lastly, on uh, parental leave, the Greens have called for strong, equitable paid parental leave uh, for many, many years. And whilst we're pleased that the government has committed to 26 paid leave from 2026 and to the use it or lose it provisions, we still maintain that those uh, improvements should be implemented much sooner. And we still want superannuation included on PPL and for leave uh, to be remunerated at the parent's wage with a, with a cap. Um, so, relevantly to this bill, I congratulate my colleague Senator Barbara Pocock for her work in getting the government to agree that employers be required to consider all reasonable requests for extended unpaid parental leave. For many families, 12 months that they're currently entitled to may not be enough. If the child is unwell or requires special attention, if a parent is unwell or just needs some more time to transition back to work, or if they live in a childcare desert, something that the government would also need to address, and they have no family support to help with childcare. Being able to request an extension of unpaid parental leave and know that employers will properly consider that request will be a significant comfort for many families. These provisions won't impact all families, but for those who need a bit of extra time without risking their job, these provisions will be very welcome. So, in conclusion, can I commend the work of Greens leader Adam Bant and our new and very capable Senator Barbara Pocock in negotiate, uh, negotiating improvements to this bill that will not only uh, help women but that will better protect workers, particularly lower paid workers? The Greens commend this bill to the chamber. Senator Scar. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to speak in relation to this bill, which I consider to be the wrong bill being introduced at the wrong time. At a time of very high inflation in this country, we're looking at 8 per cent inflation by the end of the year. Electricity prices, as announced in the last budget, are going up by approximately 56 per cent over the course of the next two years, and gas prices are going up uh, by approximately 40 to 44 per cent over the next 12 months. So, the government has chosen in that high cost environment, that high inflationary environment where uh, the economic outlook for the world amongst our trading partners and our, in our own country is, is very dangerous. It's choosing to introduce this bill at that time. And I'm gravely concerned, gravely concerned at the impact this bill will have in terms of the Australian economy and in terms of people actually having jobs. That, that is my grave concern. Uh, as I consider this bill, which is before the Senate. I was left to reflect last night as I listened to my good friend Senator Susan Macdonald give her presentation in relation to this bill that we heard last night from someone who's actually owned and operated a business. And Senator Macdonald owned a uh, number of butcher stalls called Super Butcher in my home state of Queensland, and she had to turn that business around from a situation where uh, it wasn't doing too well, it had some internal issues, and she turned that business around successfully uh, and carried the weight of turning that business around. And that weight includes the weight of managing the cash flow, uh, dealing with the uh, paying all the expenses, the weight of knowing that the employees who are employed by that business are relying upon the business owner to provide their future employment, the weight of dealing with customers, the weight of dealing with supply chain issues, regulatory issues, all the issues which employers in this country face. I reflect on my own background in the mining industry, uh, and I worked for a mid-tier copper gold mining company that successfully built two mines in one of the poorest countries in the world called Laos and lifted thousands of people out of poverty, and we did it to the highest environmental standards, safety standards and uh, social, with, a, with a very deep uh, and uh, committed uh, social licence program, which included microfinance programs to lift local village uh, people out of poverty and provide micro in opportunities for them to introduce micro-industries. Ind at the height of the global financial crisis, it nearly all came crashing down. Uh, the price of copper went from approximately $4.30, $4.20 a pound to $1.30 a pound in the course of two weeks. 
the share price of that company went from about $1.12 a share to eight and a half cents. And I can remember having a discussion with a good dear friend uh, who was a fellow senior executive in that company, and he was going on a family holiday, and he said, Paul, um, just make sure if the receivers and managers are appointed, if the administrators come into the business, try and get that painting out of my office, which was um, his own personal property and meant a great deal to him from a family perspective. That's how bad the situation was. And we got through that with a lot of support from shareholders, uh, from suppliers who we had to negotiate with, but it was difficult. It was extraordinarily difficult. And uh, we were on the precipice, absolutely no question about that. And that experience left a deep mark on me. Uh, and I can then remember coming out the other side when we got hit with a wave of regulation from the previous Labor government, when Wayne Swan was uh, treasurer of this country. And we sat around a table, a board Senator, table. Senator Scar, you'll be in continuance. It, as much as it pains me to interrupt your speech to the House. Pursuant to order, the sitting of the Senate is suspended till the ringing of the bells to enable senators to attend the Prime Minister's statement on closing the gap in the other place. All right, we shall now go to Senator's statements. Senator Polly. Thank you. I rise to speak about why we need a National Anti-Corruption Commission, and the main reason is Scott Morrison. To introduce into law in Australia for an independent anti-corruption commission was a cornerstone of the government's agenda to restore public trust and strengthen standards of integrity in the federal government. Ask anyone and they will agree with you that trust in Australia's democratic process has dropped to all-time low after a decade of rorts, ministerial scandals, jobs for mates and secret ministerial portfolios under the former Morrison government. To clarify, let me just run up a tab of scandals that come to mind. Sports rorts, community grants rorts, car park rorts, the MMI grants rorts, 
the former Prime Minister's office, reckless behaviour regarding border force and asylum seeker vessel on election day this year during caretaker convention and the piece of de, of, um, de resistance, secret ministerial portfolios held by the former Prime Minister. I put it to you. Do you think Scott Morrison secretly sworn himself in to be Santa Claus this year? No, it wouldn't be Santa Claus. It's more likely to be Ebenezer Scrooge. History will remember the former Prime Minister as someone who secretly kept power, who secretly swore himself in to five separate portfolios, in secret from his own ministry and those opposite, and in secret from the Australian people. A shameful act which he will never live down, and our country will never live that down as having a Prime Minister that was so deceitful. And those opposite know it. They may not have uh, supported the censure motion in that other place, but they know it. In the 121 years since Federation, what the former Prime Minister did was single-handedly undermine our country, undermine the principle of responsible government, undermine our institutions and, once again, undermine everyone's trust in our democracy. The Solicitor General found this to be the case, and so did Virginia Bell's independent investigation. Ever since the Liberals came into power in 2013, trust in our political institutions has bucked down to cynical levels. Political trust actually declined to its lowest ever recorded level in 2019, according to the Australian electoral data. Since 2012, Australians have slipped 12 points on the Transparency International Annual Corruption Perspective Index. At the same time, our rank in the global index has fallen 11 places from 7th to 18th. Of all the OECD countries, Australia tied with Hungary in dropping to the highest number of points over this period. If people are to regain faith in politics in our community and across the country, we must act decisively. We must be open and we must be transparent. That is why the Albanese government is ensuring a National Integrity Commission is independent and powerful, having the power of a standing royal commission. It would not be a toothless commission like the previous government recommended. Mind you, that was their recommendation, but they never even acted on that. It's going to deal with serious systemic um, corruption. It's going to be able to receive allegations from a whole range of sources. It's going to be able to, at its discretion, hold public hearings. And all of those are important features and also very important differences to the former Morrison government's model. For a moment, can you imagine adopting a Morrison model of National Integrity Commission? What a farcical joke that would be after his record of impropriety. Importantly, the Australian government's model will be able to investigate the past. That's another deficiency of the former government's proposal. All of the state and territories' anti-corruption commissions have the power to explore past instances of corruption <coughs> at their discretion and where they think it's appropriate. Anti-corruption commissions serve the public by uncovering corruption and ensuring that members of the government, including politicians, are held accountable for their conduct. Every Australian state and territory has now established its own anti-corruption commission. But despite overwhelmingly having public support, there is still no anti-corruption uh, commission at the federal level. In December 2018, 2018, the Morrison government was finally dragged kicking and screaming to commit to establishing what is called a Commonwealth Integrity Commission. However, three years later, they still failed to honour that commitment. The Morrison government's ever-increasing list of scandals and cover-ups has reinforced the urgent need for a powerful, transparent and independent national anti-corruption commission. The Albanese government has worked with the Australian preeminent legal and integrity experts to develop design the principles that will ensure the commission is the most effective anti-corruption watchdog 
in the country. Under these design principles, the Commission will have broad jurisdiction to investigate Commonwealth ministers, public servants, statutory office holders, government agencies, politicians and personal staff of politicians, carrying out its functions independently of government with discretion to commence inquiries into serious and systemic corruption on its own initiative or in response to referrals, including from whistleblowers and complaints from the public. To ensure the Commission's independence, the Commissioner and any Deputy Commissioner will serve for a single fixed term and have security of tenure comparable to that of a federal judge. To be overseen by a statutory bipartisan joint standing committee of the parliament. To empower, to require the Commission to provide information about its work. To ensure bipartisanship and to ensure that support for the Commission's work, that committee would be responsible for confirming the Commission's nominated by the government, having the power to investigate allegations of serious corruption that occurred before or after its establishment, have the power to hold public hearings where the Commission determines it is in the public's interest to do so. Be empowered to make findings of fact, including a finding of corrupt conduct, but not to make determinations of criminal liability. Findings that could constitute criminal conduct would be referred to the Australian Federal Police or the Commonwealth Department of, Prose of Public Prosecutions for further consideration and operate with procedural fairness and its findings would be subject to judic judicial review. The Albanese government policy for some time now has been to establish the National Anti-Corruption Commission, which will make a permanent and much-needed change to standards of integrity and accountability in the federal government. The Australian people deserve nothing less. The Australian people deserve to have a federal parliament and representatives that they can trust. Corruption in the federal government has been growing over recent years, and the Liberals have failed to take any action to tackle it, leaving the Commonwealth the only Australian government without a body dedicated to uncover and stamping out corruption by public officials. Maybe the enduring legacy of the Morrison Liberal government will be a National Integrity Commission a legacy because of the former government's corrupt actions in government leading to the need to establish such a commission and to try and restore integrity back into our democracy. I sincerely hope so, but there is nothing more fundamental and more important to the Australian people than to have faith and trust in our democracy. People have fought in so many wars to ensure that we have be, stayed a free and democratic country. So this place, in this chamber and in the other place, we all have responsibility to make sure that there is integrity, that we stamp out any corruption and the Australian people, when they vote, they know they are going to get a government that is trustworthy that is transparent and that is accountable for their actions. And unfortunately, over the past decade, the Morrison government and the Turnbull government and the Abbott government have led to a situation where this legislation that we've put through the parliament has been so necessary. I sincerely hope that this commission reflects on past actions of the former government. Thank you, Senator Polly. Uh, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. And today I rise to talk about uh, something that is desperately needed in our own home state of Western Australia, and that is upgrades to the Henderson uh, Industrial Precincts. Western Australia has a very long and a very proud history of supporting our nation's defence and defence industry, both in times of peace and also in war. Today we have world-leading advanced manufacturing capabilities that are supported by training and upskilling of using the latest defence technologies. But the Henderson Maritime Precinct, which is 23 kilometres south of Perth, is home to some of the most innovative defence supply companies 
and workforces, particularly uh, related to shipbuilding and maintenance. The Australian Marine Complex and its common user facility was an initiative of the state government and in 2003 was funded by the federal government. Uh, at the time it was built it, and we hope they will come, and industry has certainly come over the preceding nearly 20 years. But it is time for this facility to get a much needed upgrade to turn it into now a world leading uh, facility. Sadly, the WA state government is doing what it does best, and that is contemplating an issue, conducting a review, then conducting another review, and then doing absolutely nothing. And it is now time to get into gear. We know what needs to be done, and it now just needs to be done. And just for those of you who are not aware of uh, Henderson, since opening in uh, mid-2003, uh, the Australian Marine Complex has generated more than 21,000 direct jobs and delivered projects worth billions of dollars. And it has almost single-handedly facilitated the fabrication of millions of tonnes of uh, goods and manufactured goods, particularly for our oil and gas sector in the North West. And, uh, since 2017, I have been taking many state and federal colleagues, uh, ministers and also prime ministers to Henderson to see just what our state is capable of and is delivering. Now, while Henderson didn't make its way into the 2016 white paper as a major, officially as the second uh, major shipbuilding uh, facility in Australia, we did manage to remedy that, although it didn't quite make the white paper. Now, the precinct itself is made up of a unique mix of agreements between the West Australian state government, the federal government, and defence industry companies, including BAE, Austal, and our industrial powerhouse, Civmec. Uh, it's home to around 150 other businesses in five designated zones shipbuilding, technology, support industry, fabrication, and a recreational boating precinct. Uh, but it is bursting at the seams, and it desperately now needs latitude 32 to be developed by the state government, which has sat on for five years, so that we have uh, a much increased uh, capacity to develop our logistics, freight and supply and manufacturing supports to the, not only to the shipbuilding sector but also to our mining and oil and gas sectors. So Western Australia's naval shipbuilding industry is going from strength to strength, largely off the back of the coalition government's investment in 70 new ships to be built in Australia, naval ships. The shipbuilding precinct itself is located on the beautiful Western Australia coast uh, overlooking Garden Island and HMAS Stirling. The Anzac class frigates are currently and have been for a number of years uh, upgoing their mid uh, life cycle capability assurance program and it is quite an impressive sight to th see three of our Anzacs uh, up on uh, the dry dock. Uh, actually up on the docks itself, uh, being maintained. But that's not all. Uh, we've also got Austal uh, shipyards uh, who, are building, who have built hundreds of vessels, both here in Australia and overseas. And they are currently in the process of delivering at any one time up to five Guardian-class patrol boats and also the Cape-class patrol boats uh, for the Navy. Uh, their vessels are on schedule and are complete to deliver a further five uh, in coming months. In total, 21 Guardian-class patrol boats are scheduled to be built, and again, production is well underway and delivery is also well underway. Now, the state government at the Australian Marine Complex owns and runs a common user facility, and also most of the key infrastructure such as wharves, the floating dock, the self-propelled uh, modular transporters and also vessel transfers. And there are very long-standing and well-documented uh, deficiencies and infrastructure challenges, which is now becoming a considerable constraint to industry in the area. Now, all of these have been known for uh, a long time. But again, we have the, uh, the minister and the premier in Western Australia constantly saying they're ready for business, they want more uh, from Navy and from, uh, civil, from civil companies. 
but they are not providing the facilities that are required to keep growing the industry in Western Australia. So, what are the sort of things that need to be done? Well, in May 2018, I started a very constructive three-way dialogue between the State Minister Paul Papalia, uh, the then uh, Defence Industry Minister Christopher Pine, on how the federal and state governments can work together to transform this remarkable precedent. So that was in 2018. Not only did we talk about what was required, uh, but I also did send correspondence to both. And we had a very amicable and agreeable exchange, and we agreed on what was required to be done. And the McGowan government did agree back then in 2018 that a failure to upgrade state infrastructure would limit, it, would limit the chances to take advantage of emerging opportunities, opportunities which are well and truly with us now. But the state is now in danger of losing a number of these projects because they simply have not provided the infrastructure. So in November of 2020, the McGowan government released two planning studies, and they allocated just under $90 million for four projects to fund some of the major works there, but still not the majority of works that were needed. So in the correspondence with Chris Pine and Paul Papalier at the time in 2018, I went through and we agreed on the priorities. So the priorities that I saw were the mapping and establishment of a high and wide load corridor and the sinking of overline, overhead power lines that are clearly restricting access for oversized freight. Uh, the local and regional road network needed uh, upgrades uh, to support the efficient and safe access to the precinct now and in the future. And anybody who drives through the Henderson precinct uh, at change of shift hours will know just how congested and just how dangerous uh, those roads are due to the lack of uh, ability. The traffic signals at all da dangerous intersections uh, need, either need to be put in or they need to be upgraded. And workers uh, find it incredibly difficult, if they don't have a car, to get in and out of the area. Now, the Thornley to Coburn rail line will improve accessibility, but the problem is it is still kilometres away from the Henderson precinct, and the state government for four years is going to be putting in new bus routes uh, from that and the Fremantle Railway so that we can get apprentices and workers in and out efficiently into that area. There is also a pressing strategic need for a second shipping channel to both the Australian Marine Complex and, in particular, HMAS Stirling, which is a state government responsibility. In fact, the work had started under the previous uh, Liberal government, but it has not proceeded, and that is not only a strategic barrier for any visiting submarines and ships to HMAS Stirling, but also it is a significant constraint just having one channel. Again, delayed and delayed and delayed. We know what needs to be done at Henderson. The state government has had a ten, nearly $10 million study paid for by the federal government when I was Minister for Defence. It said exactly the same things uh, that we did in 2018 that needed to be done. There is a very good master plan that has been developed with the federal government with Defence and the WA state government, and yet again they simply will not act. I don't know why, but again it is review, review. They've got the money, they've got the plan. We know what we need to do to attract not only defence for the, you know, for the next few decades, but also to expand uh, the other industrial uh, industries there. Uh, finally, I'm also incredibly concerned that the Albanese Labor government in, the last, in their first budget uh, was silent on what has happened to the $4.3 billion that the previous government have allocated uh, for a large vessel uh, dry berth at Henderson, and it's time for the federal government to come clean. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise today to uh, acknowledge the amazing um, work and life that the Australian music industry uh, brings to each and every one of us in this country. And the Australian music industry, uh, artists, the producers, the managers, the writers, they have had it pretty tough the last few years. Today is the last day of Australian Music Month, and uh, we've got a bunch of uh, musicians and artists 
promoters in the building, um, uh, showing us exactly what their industry uh, is made of and what the industry needs. We've got representatives from ARIA and APRA. We've got, uh, we've got uh, the brothers from Lime Cordial, uh, Lewis and Ollie, who are here. And of course, we've got um, the amazing Amy Taylor from Amel and the Sniffers in town. The music legend, Michael Chugg, or Chuggy, Mr Acting Deputy President, as I know uh, the two of you are, are, are good friends, is here as, as well. And these representatives from the Australian music industry are here because they are calling on us uh, as the parliament to start standing up for them, to protect their industry, to help their industry, to get back on its feet after the uh, horrendous couple of years from the bushfires on the uh, summer of 2019-20 right through to COVID and now the industry that is struggling to get back up on its feet because of the extreme weather uh, as the next summer festival season comes around and we're de dealing with extreme flooding. And we've seen all those pictures and stories, Mr Acting Deputy President, of uh, artists and festival uh, goers having to, to manage uh, in the midst of uh, events that are being washed and flooded out. The contemporary music industry in this country has largely existed uh, and grown successfully in spite of a lack of support uh, from a national policy uh, perspective. We know that the Arts Minister, the Minister for the Arts, Mr Tony Burke, is currently undertaking a uh, culture uh, policy review, uh, and we look forward to seeing uh, the uh, results of that handed down, hopefully in coming weeks. One of the things the industry has been calling for is the creation of Music Australia, similar to a, uh, the agency that already exists for Screen, Screen Australia. It's kind of crazy that we're in 2022. Our music industry is one of our most successful exports in this country. It contributes billions of dollars uh, to our economy, uh, and yet it is the one part of uh, the arts industry and creative industry in Australia that does not have its own dedicated government agency. I think it is time for us to establish Music Australia, to allow a, a government agency that can bring together the uh, government policies, the industry expertise, advice, all in one place, just as we have for Screen Australia, which is so important to underpinning uh, the growth uh, and uh, expertise within our screen industry. In the cost benefit of investing in our music industry is so obvious. We know that the live music industry alone is worth around $16 billion, and that's the live music industry. You can think about all of the jobs that come from that, the life that is put into our suburbs and our cities and our towns, the ability for people to uh, engage, to uh, connect. It is a, truly about uh, enriching community. But then when you think about the amount of uh, export that the Australian music industry uh, contributes is phenomenal. So why wouldn't we, if we are reviewing Australia's uh, artistic policies, our creative policies, why would we not look ahead and say, look, a Music Australia agency in this country is exactly what we need and we should fund it? And I call on the Minister for the Arts. Uh, he's got all of the evidence in front of him. I know uh, he uh, is uh, a dedicated um, uh, lover of Australian music. Well, let's turn those words into action. And here in this place today, that's exactly what these musicians and promoters and uh, those working within the industry are calling for. A hundred million dollars in recurrent funding for the establishment and continuation of Music Australia. It would be money worth spent, and it would ensure that Australia's musicians and our artists can continue to grow uh, and invest, not just locally, but of course uh, to continue to grow uh, on the international stage as well. <clears throat> 
So it's wonderful to have them in, in, in the building today, and I hope that my colleagues here in this place and the other engage and listen and talk to them about really what is needed. But a warning sign for this government. We've had a decade of attacks on the creative industry. The last government did virtually nothing but tear down artists in this country. And then when they needed us more than ever in the midst of COVID, when we know it was our artists who were hit hardest and, and, and first because of COVID and are still struggling to get back on their feet, the previous government said tough luck. Well, we have seen a change of government. We have seen a change of many seats, uh, and uh, the, the, the makeup of this place has changed. And it is time that we listened to the Australian community and our artists and said, actually, that's not good enough anymore. The creative industries is essential to making this country lucky, to making this country the best country on earth to ensure that we can tell our own stories and hear our own stories and reflect on who we are through the various creative memes. This is essential if we are to uh, progress Australia in a positive light. Our kids deserve it, our artists deserve it, and uh, those who are here today deserve to be heard. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Senator Smith for the one or two minutes remaining. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, in the very few minutes that remain, and it's a great shame I've only got a few minutes because uh, the topic I did want to talk about is a matter of great importance to our region and a matter of great significance to me. I just want to extend my deepest appreciation to the Chin Human Rights Organisation and the people of Mizoram State in India. Uh, a few weeks ago, I had the privilege of travelling independently by myself to India in order to get to the border with Burma in the northeast of India to see for myself the unfolding Burmese refugee crisis that is happening in the northwest of Burma across the border with India. I particularly want to congratulate and thank the people of Mizoram State because unlike the government of India, Mizoram State, who share ethnic and religious similarities to the Chin people of uh, northern Burma, have been tremendously generous in their support in providing safe haven and refuge to many of the Chin people that have crossed the border into India. And I wanted to use this very brief opportunity today to extend my deepest appreciation for the great warmth and hospitality that was shown to me when I travelled all the way to Aizal on the border uh, between India and Burma, to thank the government of Mizoram State, the chief minister and the governor who made their time available to meet with me, to the many religious leaders that came out and supported my trip. I just want to say a very, very generous thank you. I gave the people, the Chin people who are sitting and in refugee camps on the border with India a commitment that I would come back to Australia and that I will fight for their cause so that those with humanitarian visas that have already been issued by the Australian government can get an exit permit, can get an exit permit from the India government so they can come and find a new future for themselves here in Australia. And I commit I recommit myself to that commitment I gave to them when I was in India a few weeks ago. Thank you, thank you. Senator Smith. We're now moving to two minute statements. I call Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, the most recent OECD data on the disciplinary climate uh, has Australia ranked 70th out of 77 countries, meaning we have some of the most disruptive classrooms by international standards. Now, disruptive classrooms, of course, lead to disrupted learning for our students, contributing to declining literacy and numeracy results and denying them the opportunity to reach their full educational, economic and social potential. Now, data from the Program for International Student Assessment showed 15-year-old students, so year 10s, in classes with a poor disciplinary climate are around seven months behind in their learning compared to their peers in more disciplined classrooms. The research has consistently shown that structured classroom environments are better for our teachers and our students, uh, both in academic terms 
and for the wider well-being. Now, this is not at all an indictment on teachers or even the schools or educators. This is a criticism levelled is not a criticism levelled at those nurturing or teaching our children. Uh, what we want to see is teachers and educators supported and empowered to help students learn to thrive during their time at school. So it's important for our teachers and educators to be properly equipped with the tools that they need to help manage disruptive classrooms. And it's essential for the government to be able to work together with the relevant state and territory governments to provide the support and training that our teachers and educators need to deliver the best learning opportunities possible for our children. So I look forward to the Education and Employment References uh, Committee upcoming inquiry on how we can best support our teachers and students and address this growing challenge. And I want to encourage all stakeholders to participate in the inquiry. If you've got a view on this, if you've got some experience on this, we want to hear from you. So please make a submission. Thank by you, the Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, Senator Grogan. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise to celebrate the passage of the, anti -corruption, the National Anti-Corruption Commission legislation, which passed the Senate last night and which has just in the last hour been back through the House of Representatives and will now actually be delivered. This is legislation that delivers the single biggest integrity reform this parliament has seen in decades. It's a powerful, independent, transparent commission. It will investigate serious or systemic corruption in the federal public sector. And for those who are asking the question, no, politicians are not exempt. No, the Labor Party is not exempt. This is real. This is transparent. This is going to make a fundamental difference. It has the power to investigate ministers, parliamentarians, their staff, statutory office holders, employees of all government entities and contractors. It has the power to hold public meetings. It will have a mandate to stop corruption and educate Australians about corruption. This was a promise made in the lead up to the election by Labor, and we are now delivering on that promise. Everywhere I go in South Australia, people raise this issue with me. I've had people come up to me in the supermarket, in the petrol station, at street corner meetings, representations to my office. This is a really important issue for the people of South Australia and the people across the whole of Australia. But in my home state, it is the most common issue that is presented to me that people are concerned about. So I'm delighted that it has passed and that we will now get on with the job of delivering exactly what we have promised. Thank you. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. 2022 has been a year of really mixed emotions for me. A bit of a roller coaster, you might say. As travel opened up, I was ecstatic to be able to visit my Ammi in Pakistan and my daughter in the US, who I hadn't seen for over two years. It was a year of deep loss as well, as my beloved cousin Imran, my brilliant teacher, my friend and mentor, Dr. Ronnie Harding, and my bestest long boy, Cosmo, passed away, leaving a big hole in my life. In the political world, there was upheaval too, some good, some bad. In Australia, we got rid of the toxic Morrison government. And let's not forget the green slide. In Iran, we are seeing a massive women-led revolution for justice. However, in the US, there was the devastating overturning of Roe v. Wade, a big step backwards for women's rights. No matter which way you look at it, it has been a big year. We worked bloody hard, and it's time for some rest and recovery. I, for one, am really looking forward to putting my feet up for a couple of weeks, watching The White Lotus and The Newsreader. Senators might be surprised to know that I quite enjoy The Crown as well. <laughs> and I will be visiting my daughter in California and might even make use of their very progressive cannabis laws. I'll be ready to greet 2023 re-energized to fight for climate action, for gender equity, and for racial justice. From the bottom of my heart, thank you to all of you who work here and support that the work we do, including the clerks, the cleaners, 
the chamber attendants, the committee staff. Thank you. Thank you. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much. Well, it gives me great pleasure to rise and talk about the Saturday election in Victoria, where it wasn't a green slide so much as a Nats slide. Uh, the Victorian National Party had our most successful results since the Second World War. And I'm proud to stand here in the Australian Senate and say the party that's over a century old has gotten rid of rural independence, a failed experiment in regional Victoria. Our strong values, our positive vision for the future and our pragmatic approach to policy uh, has seen our party room at the Victorian level significantly grow, and I want to congratulate Peter Walsh and our whole team back at home, all our volunteers, for making that happen. So to Annabel Cleland in Euroa, Kim O'Keefe, former mayor um, from Shepparton, and Azim and the whole multicultural community at Shepparton, thank you for voting national. Jade Benham, uh, strong Italian heritage. She's going to do a fabulous job in Mildura. And Gail Broad. Uh, in Bendigo, a strong national with strong values. And Martin Cameron, the only guy in the new crew, um, local footballer and tradie down in Morwell, where the Latrobe Valley rejected the Labor Party's uh, renationalisation of uh, the SEC and voted for the National Party in that seat. I'm particularly proud that as a conservative party and a, a party that doesn't resolve away from our conservative values, that we are, at a Victorian level, have sent our federal representatives and our state parliamentary representatives. We have 50 per cent female representation at a federal and state level. There's not a quota girl amongst us, all pre-selected by our party, and we are going to do an amazing job on behalf of rural and regional communities that have sent us to Spring Thank Street you, and Senator Canberra. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Senator Green. Thank you very much. The response we saw in the House from the former Prime Minister Scott Morrison to the findings of the Bell inquiry and the censor motion against him requires calling out, because there was an opportunity today for the former Prime Minister to apologise to the parliament and to the people of Australia and to apologise to our democratic traditions and to put on record that mistakes were made. And I think most people in this place and people in the community would have heard and taken appreciation of an apology today, but that is not what we got from the former Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, today. We got defiance and denial that anything was wrong. And I say this today because I want the parliament to understand that this is not partisan or political. It is more important than that. Some things matter more than politics. As Bridget Archer said in the other house today, sometimes these things are not a game. This is not a game. When senators come in here and when ministers go to the Governor-General, they swear an oath to serve the Australian people and to be honest to them and to be upfront with them and to keep them informed about their decisions. That is not what happened. That is not what happened under the previous government. And it is an opportunity now, I think, for members all across this chamber and all across this House and every person who, ha who loves our democracy and loves our parliament to call this behaviour out because it should never have happened and it should never happen Thank again. Thank you, Senator Green. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. I rise to speak to an alarming report published in the Daily Telegraph on Saturday about a massive increase in the number of Australian adolescents being treated for gender dysphoria. The causes of this huge increase in, ju in children being treated for gender dysphoria need to be investigated urgently, and I will later today move to refer this matter to the Senate Community Affairs References Committee. According to the report, a Freedom of Information request has revealed there were 2,067 people aged under 18 enrolled in public adolescent gender clinics, almost 10 times the number in 2014. 
The report notes these are only figures for public clinics. It is likely the total figure, including children being treated by GPs and private clinics, is much higher. The number of adolescents being prescribed puberty blockers in 2021 was 624, up from only five in 2014, while 204 adolescents were on cross-sexone hormones, up from 27 in 2014. These treatments have been conclusively shown to cause long-life negative health impacts such as reduced bone density, leading to an increased risk of osteoporosis and fractures, impaired fertility, impaired sexual function and libido, potentially negative impacts on brain development and possibly increased risks of developing hypertension, cardiovascular disease, obesity, high cholesterol and type 2 diabetes. Mental health experts in Australia and overseas are very concerned by these developments, by the influence of ideology amplified by social media and manifested in the so-called affirmation approach to treating children with gender dysphoria and at the debilitating long-term um, physiosocial impacts of these treatments. Ultimately, we all want the best outcomes for young Australians. Thank, Thank you. you. Senator Cash. Thank you. And Western Australian Premier Mark McGowan has betrayed Western Australia by backing the Albanese government's radical shake-up of the industrial relations system. Mr McGowan should be telling Mr Albanese and Tony Burke and Minister Tony Burke that they should immediately exempt the mining and resources sectors from this disastrous legislation. Mr McGowan knows that Western Australia relies on this sector like no other state in the nation. He made much of how this sector kept Australia afloat during the COVID-19 pandemic. Western Australians accepted being cut off from the rest of Australia for so long because they knew how important it was to keep the mining and resources sector going throughout COVID-19. And Mr McGowan, as we know, loves the revenue the sector provides for WA as well as the jobs. In fact, this year's WA state budget highlighted the huge contribution the sector makes to WA coffers, with a cumulative contribution of $12.58 billion, and the sector provides over 65,000 direct full-time jobs in Western Australia. But what Ms McGowan needs to do is take note of the recent comments made by BHP Chief Executive Mike Henry, where he said there is no case for multi-employer bargaining in the mining industry. And Mr Henry quite rightly points out that the current approach in the industry has been working well and workers in the industry are paid well. He also says, and he is right when he says, Australia's global competitiveness will be harmed by aspects of the bill that risk reducing flexibility and give rise to increases in industrial action. And then, of course, we have the Rio Tinto boss, uh, Simon Trott. He says the legislation will be a handbrake on mining and the wider economy and a handbrake on economic growth, productivity and wages. Mr McGowan should stand up for Western Australia, our mining and resources sector, and condemn this radical legislation. Thank you. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Acting President. Tonight is the parliamentary launch of Sydney World Pride, a celebration but also a reminder that we have much more work to do to dispel long-standing myths about LGBTIQ people. I take this opportunity to break a few of these myths about trans people and the use of puberty blockers. Trans people and trans young people are not new. There are many historical and cross-cultural examples of trans people, including in First Nations communities. There's nothing inherent about being trans that makes them more vulnerable to poor mental health. It is, however, a lack of support, a lack of health care and discrimination that contributes to poor mental health outcomes. Puberty blockers are not permanent. They're a health care option at an enormously stressful time for young trans people, giving adolescents a chance to develop emotionally and cognitively before making further decisions. Data shows these treatments save lives and reduce self-harm. Contrary to the common belief put forward by Senator Hanson, the common belief that children can access invasive medical treatment, this is not true. It is in fact difficult to access gender-affirming medical care. It involves multiple assessments, multidisciplinary teams and long wait times. The College of Physicians provided advice to the former uh, Minister for Health 
noting that an inquiry would not increase the scientific evidence available regarding gender dysphoria but would further harm vulnerable patients and their families. Every Australian child and family deserves to have access to the care and support that they need Thank to you, thrive. Senator, Pratt. Senator Orman Payne. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Federal and state governments are due to negotiate a new funding agreement for our schools, and it's a critical time in those negotiations. It comes at a time when private schools are receiving more and more funding, which they increasingly do not need, while the public sector is being run into the ground. Because of sweetheart deals being struck by previous governments, both Labor and Liberal, private schools increasingly have the cash to outcompete with the public sector. And that is the core of the problem. Governments have allowed our education system to crumble to the point that public schools are in danger of being poorly funded social safety net while private education becomes the default option. It is no exaggeration to say that public education as we know it may cease to exist unless radical funding reallocations are made. Minister Clare knows this, and he has said that the educational divide between rich and poor, city and country, I quote, ricochets through generations, end quote. But his words are not being met by action. The government continues the long-standing bipartisan policy of privatisation. As Gonski panel member Ken Boston says, the Gonski reforms have been politicised, bastardised and cherry-picked. No other country in the developed world pumps as much money into private schooling as Australia does. We are an outlier. With every stitched-up budget, with every hamstrung bilateral agreement, with every cent extra for private schools, our kids' futures get darker and the inequality gap gets wider. This is the last chance for public schooling in Australia. If we don't start pumping money into the public sector and taking it away from overfunded private sector, we are giving up on equity in Australian education. Thank you. Senator Babbitt. Thank you. To all the UAP candidates and volunteers who worked very hard, very hard during the Victorian election, although not the result that we all wanted to see, I say thank you. It gives us a target to work towards for the next election, which will be here before we know it. To our candidates, you work long hours, day in, day out. You sacrificed personal events, time with your family, and you were always available after hours to get on with the job of running a campaign. Well done to you. To our volunteers, thank you. Two long pre-poll weeks through all four of Melbourne's seasons. Bristlingly hot one day, windy and cold the next. You got to love the Melbourne weather. You did it, and you did it with a smile on your face. You stood up for the values that you believe in. Across our great state, from Warrnambool to Wodonga, from Warren to Wallen, out you went day after day. I congratulate Premier Daniel Andrews on his election victory and wish him the best for his next term as Premier of Victoria. We should take heart in the fact that the best of our state is in front of us and not behind us. We must now come together as Victorians. Together we can do more than if we are apart. We must move on from the past and instead look towards our future and what we can achieve. We will, of course, continue to hold the Premier's government to account on all matters and continue to provide alternate solutions and ideas to the status quo. We will not stop championing what we believe in. Fiscal responsibility, traditional Australian family values, individual liberties, a smaller government, less bureaucratic red and green tape, lower taxes, freedom of speech, of thought, of association and the support of free enterprise. To the candidates, members, volunteers and supporters of the UAP, thank you. The best is yet to come. Senator Little. Thank you, Acting President. Racially charged attacks and offensive language has no place in a national conversation on a voice to parliament, not at any time. Before we even have the legislation to trigger a referendum, I'm seeing and hearing references to rednecks, race-based conspiracies and personal attacks that contribute nothing to sensible, safe discussion, discourse and debate. Whether it is in our parliaments, in community meetings, consultations and conversations with workplace colleagues, 
with family and friends or simply at a barbecue, no Australian should be silenced on this. Delivering an outcome in an environment of fear, intimidation and bullying is not cultural, and nor is it an Australian value any of us should aspire to. Sure, make it robust and loud, but be careful about what we say and platitudes that could silence or shame, such as being on the right side of history. To take an alternate position is not giving up culture, being racist or rednecked, or means you are diminished, a loser, discredited. I've got concerns and questions about detail, and I would have them even if I wasn't a member of parliament. And as an Australian, I don't want that space filled with diatribe insults and public attacks, even if they're not directed at me. For informed consent, I need comprehensive quality information. All I seek is the facts. I will continue to speak out against those in debate, in organisations and in communities that seek to control through fear, undermining, intimidation and silencing, because it is disgraceful, distasteful and shameful, and above all else, diminishes contribution and involvement. Thank you. Senator Billick. Thank you. Earlier this week, I presented a notion of motion to the Senate noting Holodomor. So today, I wish to acknowledge that last Saturday, the 26th of November, was the 89th anniversary of the enforced famine known as Holodomor. This famine took place in Ukraine between 1932 and 1933 and resulted from the deliberate actions of Joseph Stalin's communist government of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, where up to seven million Ukrainians were starved to death. In fact, the word a lot more translates from Ukrainian as death by starvation or murder by starvation. The cruel policies of the USSR at the time were aimed at suppressing Ukraine's resistance to the regime, as well as destroying their aspirations for democracy, nationhood and the assertion of their unique cultural and religious identity. The Soviet Union's denial of the famine continues today as an official policy of the Russian Federation. And it's estimated that up to seven million Ukrainians starved to death, as I said, as a result of these policies. These actions must be acknowledged, remembered and condemned. Just as we condemn Russia's attacks on Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity since the country declared independence in 1991, culminating in the illegal annexation of Crimea and this year's unjustified, completely unjustified invasion of Ukraine. Russia's decision to pull out of a deal to allow the export of grain from Ukraine from Black Sea ports marks a continued use of food as a political weapon. In the same way we commemorate the Holocaust, it's vital that the story of Holodomor is told and acknowledged by the global community just as it is in Ukraine. We need to honour the memory of those who suffered and teach true history of this event to future Thank generations. You, Senator, Senator Steelejohn. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Disabled people are awesome. This year, on International Day of People with Disabilities, our Australian disability community is more politically engaged than ever before. This year's global theme is all about the transformative solutions for inclusive development that we need. And I would love it. I would love it if this government would urgently adopt transformative solutions that would improve the lives of disabled people. However, this government has adopted this year a very different theme. The government wants us this Saturday, I kid you not, to spend the day hashtag looking beyond our disabilities. As in, look beyond our disabilities. Now, this government wouldn't tell. First Nations people, ahead of the International Day of First Nations people, to look beyond their skin colour. This government wouldn't tell a woman, ahead of International Women's Day, to look beyond their gender. And so why is it appropriate that this government would ask disabled people to look beyond the reality that we are disabled people? Imagine how a vision-impaired person feels about that. Imagine how somebody with an invisible disability feels about that. How about we try something radical, folks, and look at the wheelchair? 
To address ableism, we must authentically engage disabled people. To address ableism, everyone must look directly at how we can improve our places and spaces. To our allies and supporters, see us. Don't look past us. To fellow disabled people, I hope you feel seen and celebrated today and every day. And to this government, do better. Thank you. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I was hoping to give a 10-minute piece on this, but the government did away with Senator's statements, so I'll try and do it in two minutes. Visiting COP27 in Egypt the other week was a, a life-changing experience, as some of my colleagues will already, who have been there will already acknowledge. It was clear to me that the whole world uh, was there, and there is no doubt that the world is committed to decarbonisation. With other world leaders there, including President Biden, Prime Minister Sunak, it was a shame that our Prime Minister didn't go and that Minister Bowen only showed up for a couple of days. There were more coalition members there than ALP and Greens members combined, and I acknowledge that our Deputy Pres Acting Deputy President was there. Why? We need to care about Why were we there? We need to care about a cleaner, healthier planet. And we also need to care about sovereign energy security. It is why the, co the coalition is there at the table, because we recognise that the transition is vital, but it's also going to be long, hard and very expensive, far more expensive than the government is currently telling you. Rewiring the nation is going to cost an awful lot of money, and the estimates that the government are telling you are just blatantly wrong. We should be putting these renewables where the energy is needed, not hundreds of kilometres away. That is going to cost families huge hits on their energy bills, and electricity prices are only going to go up. The other issue being ignored by Labor is the firming of those renewables, and batteries won't do it. It was reassuring to hear uh, John Kerry talk about the role of nuclear power in firming up renewables to decarbonise the planet. Thank you. Can I, just before you start, Senator Brown, just remind senators that we're still in the middle of two-minute statements and have their final speaker. Senator Brown, you have the call. Thank you, Mr. Um, Acting Deputy President. I know people are looking forward to a well-deserved break over this holiday season. But the holiday and this holiday season, I'm asking drivers on our roads to drive so others survive. Over 1,200 <coughs> families will be sitting around a dinner table this year with an empty chair for a loved one killed on our roads. In some cases, more than one seat will be empty. We need to think of those families when we are buckling up for a drive locally or when a road trip is calling. Make sure your car is roadworthy and make sure you're in a state to drive safely, because no other family deserves to have an empty seat at the dinner table. Rural and regional roads account for two-thirds of our road deaths each year. Although it is easy to blame the concentration of rural and road deaths on visitors, we know locals are just as vulnerable to being killed or seriously injured. We, we don't need to be a hero out there and pretend that we know the ins and outs and twists and turns of every road. Take the time to know your route, where the next rest area is. Check if the driver revivers are open. My message could, be, could not be more clear. Never ever Thank you, Senator Brown. The time for safety. this debate has now finished. Just before I move to question time. This morning in my statement I implied that the codes had not been uh, presented to the parliament, but I advise uh, the Senate that they were indeed uh, um, yesterday uh, lodged in the Senate and the House. So thank you. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, President. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. I refer the minister to the words of the late Harry Evans, the longest serving clerk of the Senate, who said, and I quote, the value of estimates hearings in improving accountability and probity of government has long been widely recognised. The hearings allow apparent problems in government operations to be explored and exposed and give rise to a large amount of information 
which would not otherwise be disclosed. They have come to be recognised as a major parliamentary institution of accountability. Minister, won't the government's plans to axe a full week from the traditional four weeks of Senate estimates lead to less accountability, lower standards of probity, reduced disclosure of information and mean that any problems in government operations are not properly explored and exposed by the Senate? Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Order. 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 I'm waiting to call the minister. Order. Senator, Wong. Senator Watt. Minister Wong. Thank you, uh, President, and thank you very much for that question, uh, especially on a day where the House is just censured. The former Prime Minister for dual, for dual. No, I'm happy to take the questions. You know, you did nine years. You had nine years, uh, and Minister Wong, please resume your seat. Order, order. Senator Cash, Senator Henderson. Senator Dean Smith. Minister Wong, please continue. I'll, ta I'll take the interjection because you're right. That, you know, the, 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 your, the parliament under you was a parliament which was not respected. Uh, the parliament under you was a parliament because the Westminster system does actually Senator require McGrath ministers to be accountable Carr. through the parliament to the Australian people. Who was the accountable minister in that place? Mr Morrison and another. So don't come Senator in here telling, telling Australians you care about accountability when they saw nine years of cover-up, saw nine years of sports rorts, saw nine years uh, where you refused uh, the basic standards of probity. Minister Wong, now the, uh, I, please I resume didn't your know. seat. Sorry. Order on my left. Your leader has asked a question. I cannot hear the response. Minister Wong, please continue. Thank you. Uh, and I'll remind those opposite uh, of uh, some of the, their, their, their standards of accountability. Changing Senator the law to hide significant energy price increases from the Australian people until after the election. Refusing to release the State of the Environment report because it contained too much damning proof of the environment was in a poor and deteriorating Order. state. Uh, and, uh, and of Order. course, something that was refused to be answered in estimates, uh, all of the sports rules questions, which in estimates you never answered. Um, Senator Wong. You never answered. Senator Wong. Now, what I would say to those Senator opposite, Wong. As, as those opposite would know, Senator I was Wong, a great. Please resume sorry. your seat. Order on my left. Order, Senator McKenzie. I have called Senator McKenzie. I have called the chamber to order. I expect to be able to hear the minister in relative quiet and to stop yelling louder than the minister is speaking. Minister, please continue. Uh, uh, I, I knew at Carrie Evans, and I had a lot of respect for him. Uh, and, uh, and what I would remind those is additional estimate statements are associated with MAIFA. We have had a budget, and we are uh, having you, estimates Minister, associated with it. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Uh, Senator Birmingham, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Minister, Prime Minister Albanese has said again and again and again that the Australian people deserve transparency and accountability. Won't the axing of a full week of Senate estimates lead to less transparency and less accountability? How can the axing of this week be anything other than the Labor government taking an axe to government accountability and transparency? Order. Order. Minister Wong. Uh, uh, well, uh, I would invite those opposite, if they want to talk about accountability, to perhaps consider uh, some of what is being disclosed through the Royal Commission into robo debt and the extent no, and the extent well you know what you know it, it is really interesting you know Senator Birmingham aren't you a Johnny come lately aren't you a Johnny come lately to this issue of integrity you were a Senator senior Birmingham. minister in that government did you have the spine to stand Senator up McGrath. and tell Scott Morrison he was wrong did you have the spine to tell up and tell Mr. Uh, Taylor Senator he was Wong. wrong. You know, you're Senator always Wong. talking, aren't you? Where's the Senator spine? Wong. Show me the leadership. 
Everyone will know. Senator Wong, it's on. Senator Wong resume your seat. We, uh, there's a senator. Order. 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 I have a senator on his feet, and uh, Senator McGrath. Senator Scott. Uh, President, I, I think uh, the Leader of the Government uh, in this Senator place should— Senator Scar, what is your point? Directing comments through you, President, as opposed to put gesticulating rudely at the Member of the uh, Opposition and not referring to him Senator directly. Thank you, Senator Scar. Minister Wong, please continue. I, I remember how, how long they fought against an anti-corruption commission. I remember how long they fought against yep. that. Yep. And now this man, who is a member of the leadership group, has the temerity to come in here and tell us about transparency. He's discovered it. Now he's on that side. Order. Everybody Order. knows no leadership, no backbone, and a cajoni come lately on transparency. Uh, thank you, Minister Wong. Your time has expired. Senator Birmingham, second, sub <laughs> second supplementary. <laughs> Order. Order. This is a most disorderly start to question time, and I'm going to ask those on my left and my right to listen with respect. Senator Birmingham. President, President together with Senators Babette, Hanson, Lambie, Pocock, Roberts, and Tyrrell, I have just written to Senator Wong. And minister indicating that we do not accept the arguments put forward by the government to defend its cutting of Senate estimates and that we will not be in a position to support the proposed sitting schedule for 2023. If, as you say, you're all for transparency, accountability and respect of the parliament, will you listen to the crossbench senators and the opposition and revisit your decision to axe this estimates week? Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Uh, Senator Wong, please wait for the call. Senator Wong. Uh, th th thank you, President. Uh, it's interesting how quickly uh, conventions which we observe for nine years are junked by those opposite. Oh, no, let, me, let me just finish this. For nine years, the Greens moved amendments to your sitting pattern, which we never supported. Oh, it didn't take you very long, did it? Didn't take you very long. There are a few other conventions Order. in this place if you want to go down this path. There are a few other conventions that we can go down this path. The my my additional list. estimates are for the purpose of examining the estimates from my EFO. That is actually what they are for. Uh, and we have, we have. Do you want? Order. Order, Senator Cash. I'm calling your side in. Uh, Senator Watt. I'm waiting for quiet until I call the minister back again. Minister. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, the additional estimates have been for the purpose of examining a, a mid-year economic and fiscal uh, outlook update. We, uh, a technicality. It's because the, constitutionally the, the budget appropriate. Oh. Would you like to answer the question? Maybe, Senator, you didn't answer the questions in government. Would you like to answer them now? Thank you, Minister Wong. Your time has expired. Before I call you, Senator Dodson, it would seem to be an appropriate time to draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the Gallery of Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins, Chair of the Parliamentary Leadership Task Force Kerry Hartland and the Secretariat. On behalf of all senators, I welcome you to the Senate. <laughs> Senator Dodson. Senator McGrath, I have a senator waiting to ask a question. Senator Dodson. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Uh, can the Minister update the Senate on the findings of the Closing the Gap report? Minister. Uh, I thank Senator Dodson for his question. I thank him for his leadership in this parliament and his leadership for Australians, uh, First Nations peoples and non-Indigenous Australians for decades. Uh, today, the Prime Minister tabled the Commonwealth Closing the Gap Annual Report 2022, and regrettably, deeply regrettably, the progress is, progress is mixed, with only four out of the nine targets for which we have updated data being on track. Uh, 
There is some good news, some areas where we are on track. More than 89 per cent of babies are being born with a healthy birth weight. That is on track. 96.7 per cent of children were enrolled in preschool in 2021, also on track. But there, have been, there has been unacceptably slow progress in other areas, and some metrics have gone backwards. This includes children being school ready, rates of incarceration, the number of children in out-of-home care and deaths by suicide. For the majority of socioeconomic targets, there is little new data available to reliably, reliably track trends. Work has started to improve this data, so we will have a clearer picture of how we are tracking in future years. But I think we are all obliged on all sides of this chamber to recognise that decades of inadequate government policies have failed First Nations people and have failed to close the gap. We must reverse the entrenched inequality, disadvantage and structural racism faced by First Nations peoples. Uh, and we on this side of the chamber, and I hope all are com across the chamber, are committed to doing this, to ensuring sustained progress over the life of the 2020 National Agreement and the Commonwealth Closing the Gap implementation framework, implementation plan. It is clear that the closing the gap architecture can only work if we work together when there is coordinated efforts from all jurisdictions and, most importantly, in genuine partnership with First Nations peoples. It is only when, we can when Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples— Thank you, peoples Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Dodson, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, can the minister uh, <clears throat> outline how the government is working to accelerate progress towards closing the gap? Thank you, Senator yeah. Dodson. Minister. Uh, thank you, Senator Dodson, and thank you again for your contribution to uh, the government's uh, the commitments in this area. They include, in the October budget, $54 million for 500 First Nations health workers and practitioners, $164 million for vital health infrastructure, $33 million to make early education more accessible, uh, and $100 million to improve remote housing, particularly in the Northern Territory homelands. And importantly, and I know Senator Dodson has spoken about this, $81 million in around uh, up to 30 community-led justice reinvestment initiatives to seek to divert young people from the criminal justice system and to reduce crime. Uh, but, uh, President, we must do more. We must do more. And I think what is the a compelling uh, message from this report is why it is so important for uh, First Nations people to be heard and to be part of uh, ensure delivering, designing and delivering thank the solutions to this disadvantage. Advice. Senator Dodson, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, can the minister uh, outline how the voice to parliament supports the objective to close the gap? Thank you, Senator Dodson. Minister. So-called solutions conceived in Canberra and imposed on communities without consultation are more likely than not to end in expen expensive, ineffective and into even counterproductive failure. This is what the Prime Minister said today. But when a government listens to people with experience, with earned knowledge of kinship and country and culture and community, when we trust in the value of self-determination and empowerment, then the results are always better. And that, at its core, the, the Closing the Gap report asks us if we're going to continue to do the same thing whilst expecting a different outcome. Uh, the, the Uluru State from the Heart had a humble request at its core. We seek to be heard. It is the same message that we see uh, in this report today. Why it is so important for that hand outstretched, which is the Uluru Statement from the Heart, uh, to be met generously. Uh, by all Australians. Thank you, Minister. Senator Little. Thank you. President, my question is to the Minister representing the, the Minister for Government Services, Senator Farrell. I refer to media reports today that over 1,000 contractors have been axed with little notice just 26 days before Christmas, Shame. with employees quoted as saying, it's not great to get this kind of news right before Christmas. Is this what the government means when they say they want secure jobs for all Australians? <laughs> Good question. Thank you, Senator Little. Minister. Uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator uh, Little for her, um, <coughs> her uh, question uh, at, this, uh, at this time. Um, 
a number of uh, commercial ICT contracts uh, at Australia, uh, sorry, Services Australia, uh, have recently um, ended their uh, their terms, um, and uh, <coughs> the impacted uh, contractors will end in line with the relevant terms and notice uh, period. Um, so, in other words, um, these contracts were uh, coming to uh, to an end uh, in accordance with the, the terms of the contracts, uh, and uh, the government, uh, and in particular, um, Services Australia, have um, applied the terms and conditions that relate to those um, uh, contracts. Um, these uh, ICT uh, uh, providers uh, have supported Services Australia to significantly um, bolster the ICT systems to meet unprecedented demand uh, on our systems and services during emergencies such as the pandemic. And uh, we do thank them for, for their support. Well, well I, I'll, I'll take that uh, intervention. These, these, these were Order. contracts. These were contracts that were Senator freely Cash. entered into by the former government. They were freely entered Order. into by the former government. There was a set of terms and conditions, and the government is simply complying with those terms and conditions. Now, I've had some, I've had some experience of what you did with ICT contracts, and I'd like to refer to the PEMS contract, Thank which I am. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Your time has expired. Senator Little, first supplementary. Thank you. So clearly, you didn't mean them. Given the significant number of job losses, can the government guarantee there will be no reduction in access to services or an increase in any backlog of claims by this decision? Thank you, Senator Little. Minister. I didn't finish my. Thank you, uh, President. And thank uh, Senator uh, Little for her uh, her question. Um, <clears throat> I've actually seen what you've done with uh, ICT uh, contracts, and the perfect example is, uh, is the PEMS contract, a contract that was supposed to uh, deliver services for uh, members of parliament, originally cost $48 million, uh, now up to $66 million and counting, uh, and it's now been referred to the uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Little. Point of order, President. Um, the question was about uh, reduction in services and backlog. Thank you, Senator Little. I'll draw the minister back to the question. Thank you, Minister Farrell. Um, look, I, I'm not. Thank you, uh, President, and thanks for that uh, clarification from uh, uh, Senator uh, Little. Um, essentially, Services Australia consists of. Um, a workforce that's uh, made up of the, the Australian public service staff. Um, these uh, staff are, from time to time, supplemented by uh, contractors, and that's the people that we're talking about uh, at the moment. These numbers go up and down depending on um, on uh, uh, government priorities and changing uh, changing circumstances. Um, and between uh, uh, your time has expired, Senator Farrell. Uh, oh. Minister, uh, Senator Little, second supplementary. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Can you confirm that none of these contractors were working on cyber security programs and projects, which would deal with vulnerable Australians' data, and that this decision will not see any reduction in the protection of their data? Thank you, Senator Little. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, President, and um, uh, thank you, uh, uh, thank you, Senator uh, Little. Um, I um, obviously this is not um, my own personal portfolio. Um, I would not expect that there would be any reduction in services uh, through Senator this uh, through this process. Um, and particularly uh, as it relates to the issues that you've just uh, mentioned in your uh, in your question, uh, but I will um, have a chat with the uh, the minister, and I'll come back to you if um, if there is any issue different to what I've just uh, said. Thank you, Minister Farrell. Senator Cox. Thank you, 
is to Senator Watt, the Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government. In this government's first budget, $1.9 billion in equity investment was allocated for the development of the Middle Arms Sustainable Development Precinct in Darwin Harbour. Part of this funding is for a common-use marine infrastructure. Can the government rule out this port will have a fossil fuel component, such as a gas-fed petrochemical hub? Thank you, Senator Cox. Minister Watts. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Cox, uh, for your question. Um, as you are aware and as you have said, the government will provide $1.9 billion in planned equity to support the development of the Middle Arm Precinct uh, in Darwin, together with regional logistic hubs along key transport links. Uh, it is intended to be a multi-purpose uh, precinct, uh, so I am not at a position at this point in time uh, to rule in particular developments or rule out particular developments. But this investment will enable the precinct to be globally competitive and sustainable, uh, with a focus on low emission uh, uh, production, uh, green hydrogen and critical minerals processing. Uh, demand, as you're probably aware, Senator Cox, uh, is growing for clean energy sources, particularly in the Northern Territory, and Labor's investment will help position the Northern Territory and Northern Australia to diversify their economy and create new jobs. Uh, this investment is not a subsidy for fossil fuels in the way that some people have characterised it. Rather, funding will go towards infrastructure that will support users to export clean energy, critical to meet our commitment to net zero, like green hydrogen and lithium batteries that are critical to decarbonisation. Uh, now, particularly in my previous role as Shadow, Shadow Minister for Northern Australia, uh, I spent a lot of time in the Northern Territory uh, with my good friend Senator McCarthy, uh, along with the uh, House of Representatives members from the Northern Territory, uh, Luke Gosling uh, and Warren Snowden, the former member, and now Marianne Scrimgeour. And I know they are passionate advocates uh, for the Northern Territory to diversify the economy up there uh, and uh, to take advantage of some of the incredible natural uh, and mineral resources that the Northern Territory has. Um, there's, there are extremely exciting projects in the offing in the Northern Territory in that uh, clean energy space, and I think they offer an opportunity to produce lots of very important jobs for that part of the country. You, Minister Watt, Senator Cox, first supplementary. The Northern Territory government's investment website recently changed its description of the Middle Arm project by deleting references to petrochemicals. Did the federal government ask for this public information to be, in fact, edited? Thank you, Senator Cox. Minister. Uh, well, I don't know what evidence Senator Cox has for suggesting that the federal government may have been involved in this, and I really think that questions as to what the Northern Territory government puts in documents are questions that should be directed to the Northern Territory government. Uh, we're um, not Minister Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Cox. On a point of order of relevance, it was about whether the government, the federal government, gave permission for this to be edited. Thank you, Sorry. Senator Cox. The minister is being directly relevant. Minister Watt, please continue. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. As I say, uh, President, uh, questions as to what the content of Northern Territory government documents uh, do or do not contain should be directed uh, to the Northern Territory government. And uh, I mean, it's all very well for the Greens to roll in as they like to do and say, "Did you do this? Did you do that?" Promoting some kind of conspiracy theory without any evidence for it whatsoever. Um, so Order. perhaps Senator Cox Order. would like to present any evidence that she has to suggest that the federal government was involved in that. Uh, I could, uh, so, as I say, this is a really important development for the Northern Territory that uh, the federal government is very pleased to back, uh, and it provides an opportunity for uh, some very important job development in the Northern Territory going forward. Thank you, Minister Watt. Senator Cox, second supplementary. When I attended uh, COP27 this year in Sharm el Sheikh, I heard about the government's commitment to the protection of mangroves. Darwin Harbour has significant mangroves. Uh, how many hectares of mangroves will be destroyed by blasting on the creation of Middle Arms federally funded marine infrastructure? Thank you, Senator Cox. Our Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President. And uh, I'm very well aware that the Albanese government does take issues of environmental protection, including mangrove protection, extremely seriously. Uh, and we, uh, I know that Minister Plibersek uh, is doing a lot on this front, particularly as the environment minister for that country. Um, uh, minister Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Cox. Again, point of relevance. Um, a point of order on relevance. How many hectares of mangroves are going to be destroyed 
by this marine infrastructure being developed? Thank Very you, Senator question. Cox. And uh, you also referenced COP, and I do believe that the minister is being relevant. Minister Watt. Um, thank you, President. And again, thank you, Senator Cox. Of course, this development, like every development that is proposed for uh, Australia of the scale of this development, will have to go through an EIS process. Um, that EIS process would consider the very matters uh, that Senator Cox is questioning, uh, and that is the appropriate process uh, in which to make those sorts of decisions based on expert evidence uh, about what all of the environmental impacts of this development would be, whether they be about mangroves or any other uh, feature of the development. Um, so, as I say, and as I have continued to say, this is an important development for the Northern Territory, and it's an important development for the entire country. Uh, we support it. We support the jobs that come with it, and we support the clean energy that will come with Thank it as you, well. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Your time has expired. Senator Walsh. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Gallagher. Uh, and in asking it, I acknowledge the early educators, disability workers and hospo workers from the United Workers' Union in the gallery today. Welcome. Yeah. Can the minister give an update on how the government is working across the parliament to progress recommendations from the Set the Standard report? Minister. Uh, thank you, President. I thank Senator Walsh for the question and welcome those uh, representatives uh, from the unions um, joining us today and also acknowledge Kate Jenkins and Kerry Hartland and the team from um, supporting the Parliamentary Leadership Task Force. And of course, um, Kate Jenkins is the author of the Set the Standard report, and so fabulous to have you here as well. To, today, we acknowledge the one year anniversary of the Set the Standard report and its findings that Parliament House was lagging behind the rest of the country when it came to a safe workplace for staff and, in particular, women. It was all there gender inequality with a lack of women in senior roles, a lack of accountability in systems, a work hard, play hard culture that left some, particularly young staff and young women, vulnerable to exploitation and sexual misconduct, and high levels of power and discretion in relation to employment combined with insecure employment. I would like to thank all of those current and former Parliament House staff who came forward to talk about their experiences working in Parliament. Many of those experiences are harrowing, and speaking out must have required enormous strength and bravery. A centrepiece reform from the report is the establishment of a new HR entity body for parliamentarians and their staff to provide independent advice and support and drive an agenda of professional development and best practice, training and continuous improvement for staff. The recommendation flowed from the Set the Standard report, and staff across the parliament have been consulted on how this new HR body should operate in practice. And I would like to acknowledge the work that's gone in um, by Meg Brighton and her team in the Parliamentary Workplace Support Service, uh, which has made such a difference in such a short amount of time. We know that staff trust it, they like using it, um, and it's been a really welcome addition to the infrastructure here. Cultural change in parliament will only happen when we all work together, and I'd like to acknowledge Senator Farrell, Hume, Davies and Waters for their work on us and joining us on the Parliamentary Thank Leadership Task Force. Thank you, Minister. Senator Walsh, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Can the minister update the Senate on how Parliament House can work towards becoming a model workplace? Minister. Uh, thank you, President. I thank Senator Walsh for the question. Ensuring our parliament reflects the community we serve is critical to becoming a model workplace. The parliament is a different place from a year ago, with the highest number of, on record of women across both houses—38.4 per cent in the House of Representatives and 56.6 per cent in the Senate. There are now 10 women in cabinet, the highest number ever to hold positions in an Australian cabinet. At the heart of the continuing work to become a model workplace is the experience of staff. So thank you to all who continue to advocate for change and to your respective unions. Labor strongly supports the uh, creation of a staff advisory body to support the multi-party parliamentary leadership task force and are committed to ensuring that staff voices are heard. Yesterday, the Joint Select Committee on Parliamentary Standards tabled their report on codes of conduct. This represents a historic milestone for the parliament, and I acknowledge the Deputy Speaker in the other place for her leadership as chair of the Joint Select Committee. Thank you, Minister. Senator Walsh, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, President. Can the minister please update the Senate on why these reforms are so critical to improving conditions that will benefit workers in Parliament? Thank you, Senator Walsh. Minister. Uh, thank you. Well, we strongly believe that Parliament 
and the workplace in Parliament should lead the country in terms of culture and standards. And we also want to attract the best and the brightest to work in Parliament House. We want to retain them and we want to ensure that they have a positive work experience in this building. Too many bright and hardworking people left with their careers cut short, their mental health affected after experiencing bullying and sexual harassment in, after working in Parliament House. We will only achieve the best outcomes for the Australian people if we have a safe and a supportive workplace for those that serve the public. The Parliament has already passed laws to clarify workplace protections and make clear that Age Discrimination and Disability Discrimination Act applies to MOP staff. The implementation of the MOPs Act review will drive systemic change for staff and deliver a professional and modern employment framework, and every one of us has a responsibility to ensure that we achieve what we are setting out to do. Thank, Thank you, you, Minister. Senator Hanson. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Gallagher. Contrary to the claims of Labor Senator Pratt this afternoon, clinical evidence shows that puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones used to treat adolescents diagnosed with gender dysphoria cause negative long-term health outcomes such as reduced bone density and impaired fertility. Does the Albanese government support these treatments being administered to young Australians? Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, President. I thank uh, Senator Hanson for the question. I didn't hear what Senator Pratt, um, what her contribution was earlier, but I um, know that she understands this issue and she has a level of knowledge that probably exceeds most people in this place uh, on the subject. Uh, and so I even without knowing her comments, I have no problem aligning myself with them. Um, I would also say that the well on this issue, on is, this issue with which I have talked to Senator Pratt and she has educated me, I take that unusual step. Um, on the broader um, on the broader question which you raise on gender dysphoria and the Albanese government's position on it, our position is that every child and every young person should ac have access to the, all of the necessary supports that they need to ensure they access appropriate health care, regardless of the reason for which they might be um, seeking that care. That is our position. That is a responsible, mature position. This is a matter between young people, their families and the treating health professionals, whatever they might be, doctors psychologists, other health professionals. That is the position that we would take. We also think that every time you know, issues around this get raised, people listen and they hear and, they, and it affects them. And so we also think that there should be a level of responsibility in this chamber to deal with these matters sensitively and carefully because young people's wellbeing depends on it. Thank you, Minister. Senator Hanson, first supplementary. Um, Minister, in re reference to your comment saying that children and parents are listened to, I'm sorry, talk to the mothers of these parents who have had these puberty blockers. They have no say whatsoever. They're listening to children under 18 years of age. They have no say Senator in their Hanson. children. Do so, you have a question? The Daily Telegraph newspaper last weekend reported a tenfold increase in Australian adolescents presenting the, pu the public gender clinics for treatment for gender dysphoria over the past eight years. Will the minister please explain to the Senate what the Albanese government will do to understand this alarming has increase? Minister. Uh, thank you. Well, I'm not familiar with the article um, that Senator Hanson refers, but I would uh, go back to my original answer, which is that if young people and their families are, are seeking support and assistance for health care and health advice through whatever means, if there is an increase in that, that is not necessarily, in fact, that's, that's not a bad thing. I mean, we want people to be accessing the services and care, health care, legal advice, um, you know, mental health support, whatever they need in order to get the services they want and need and should receive. These are really, really difficult and complex situations that young people are navigating and they need access to the full range of support. If they are accessing those services, then good on them. Um, and I hope their families are getting the right support as well and that they are able uh, to receive the care that they need from a country 
um, that provides uh, Thank you, uh, Minister. That kind Your of time has expired. Them. Senator Hanson, second supplementary. Thank you. As responsible leaders, we all want the best evidence based outcomes for young Australians. Will the Minister support the referral of these matters for inquiry so the Senate may investigate the causes of this increase in gender dysphoria and explore the long term health impacts of puberty block and cross sex? hormone treatments on Australian's young people. Regardless of the fact of what Senator Pratt has said, it is about having an inquiry so all Australians can hear what's being said by parents, by children, by um, the medical profession as well. Thank you, Senator so Hanson. Your time has expired, Minister. Uh, I understand that's a motion that will be moved later today, and our voting intention um, will be made clear when that question is put. Um, I haven't specifically looked at the referral closely. Um, it doesn't fall under my area of responsibility at this stage, but uh, we will have a voting position that is clear on that. Um, but again, I would say these are not necessarily matters that the Senate is best placed um, to determine um, on access to health care services. Um, we would ensure, I think the responsibility of the federal government is to make sure that the service system is there and that young people and their families are able to use them if they need to in a whole range of health care circumstances. Uh, Senator Cadell. Thank you, President. My question is to Minister Wong, the minister representing the Prime Minister. Minister, I refer to the secret Labor government report based on October data titled Estimated Impacts of CFPS, Coal-Fired Power Stations and Associated Mine Closures in the Australian Today. Is it correct that this report models regional job losses in the Hunter, projected unemployment, loss of income to local communities, loss of taxation revenue and loss of household consumption expenditure in local communities? And when will the minister and the government release the report in full? Thank you, Senator Cadell. Minister Wong. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and thank you to the Senator for the question. I, I regret to admit that uh, I may not have read every report in The Australian recently. I find it so often uh, better to be selective uh, about what I read. Um, but but I, I would uh, uh, make this point. Uh, what we, we saw under um, the last nine years in the electricity sector uh, is that uh, we saw, uh, I think it was four gigawatts of dispatchable power exit the system, um, uh, only one gigawatt to come in. We saw decisions made by the market. Our Minister, please resume your seat. Anything. Senator Cadell. Of order on relevance, this is about a specific government report. Uh, thank you, Senator Cadell. You, your question was extremely wide ranging and it also referred to a report in the Australian order, order. It's not a debating point. You also referred to a report in the Australian and asked the minister to comment that. Minister, please resume. I, I was simply making the point that there have been already closures, um, uh, and the market refusing to invest in coal-fired power because of the lack of policy certainty. And I appreciate the tone with which the Senate asked the question, so I'll try not to divert into uh, the, um, the response which talks about the last nine years. But I, I would make the point that, that uh, uh, we, we do believe providing the market with certainty around transition uh, is important. That is the lowest cost way for this transition to occur, uh, unlike uh, you know, it, it, those on this side actually think you, you try to get the market to work uh, rather than having taxpayers fund prop up uh, coal-fired power, which was the position that some on the other side argued. Uh, I, I'm not familiar. I, I, I've been upfront with you, Senator. I'm sorry. I'm not familiar with the actual article in question and whether it refers to a. Well, uh, uh, yes. Okay, I don't read every article in the Australian Senator Mackenzie. I apologise. <laughs> no, it's it's Order. just it's not it's Order. it's it's just not the, the sort of first priority in terms of reading. But anyway, that's that's okay. Uh, but I will endeavour to see Thank you, Minister, if the report. Your time has expired, Senator Cadell. First supplementary. Thank you, President. Uh, I again refer to this secret report. Again, named estimated impacts of CFPS coal-fired power stations and associated coal mine closures. From your there, it has been reported in that report that this secret report shows a spike in hunter employment and local jobs of about 800 jobs. 
Is this, dis is this distressing news for the Hunter region correct or is it erroneous? Minister Wong. Uh, uh, I, I'm not accepting uh, the assertion around secret report uh, in an article that I have been upfront with you, Senator Cadell. I have not read, but I can say to you that the worst thing for communities is a lack of. Um, Senator Wong, please resume your wow. seat. Senator Cadell. I seek leave to table the. Uh, is leave the, uh, the senator is seeking leave to table a newspaper article? Is leave not? Report. Uh, I think the answer is no, Senator oh. Cadell. We want to keep it secret. <laughs> Minister Wong. Well, there, there is a. There, uh, if, you, if you. Order. Order. Uh, there, there is. Are you Order. Done? Can I keep talking, or would you like to make Minister, a please continue. We're always so pleased when you and Senator Rennick make their con uh, contribution, <laughs> Senator Van. Um, what I was going to say to you, Senator Cadell, uh, two points. One is that there is a usual process for consideration of tabling, which we will observe as a courtesy and a convention. Uh, secondly, I would make the point that what is bad for communities is lack of policy certainty and unplanned exits from, uh, of a generation from the system, which is what occurred under uh, the chaos of the previous government. We have no intention of that repeating. Uh, we are going to ensure we, we deal with this transition, uh, which we have been upfront about, in a way that recognises the need to ensure su uh, you, security of supply time and. Senator Cadell, second supplementary. Thank you, uh, President. Again, I refer to the same document: the estimated impacts of CFPS and associated mine closures. Minister, can you confirm that it's correct that the report is modelled on the assumption there will be a loss of 30% of income for coal-fired power station workers and mine workers in the Hunter? And is the Hunter region the sole focus of this report, or is it wider? And is the government got job losses across Australia? Thank you, Senator Cadell. Minister. No, I'm not going to confirm uh, that for the reasons I've articulated previously. And if you, what I would say, what I would say to those opposite is, is this: uh, the majority of the global economy has committed to net zero by 2050. Uh, uh, if we are not in a position to compete in that global economy, that is what will affect Australia's Australia's GDP growth, Australian jobs, and the prosperity of future generations. And I know you all want to think that you can live in the past. We can live in the past Order. and we can go, go back to Order. the 1950s, but if you're committed to net Minister. zero, you're committed to a transition Order. the Australian economy. The difference Minister. between you and Minister us Wong. is we will have a plan. We will have a plan. We will Minister implement Wong. a plan. We will ensure, we will ensure Wong, that we increase Australia's seat. cost. Minister Wong, please resume your seat. Order. 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 I had to call the minister then about five times because there's so much noise in here my voice can't be heard. I ask you to Senator Canavan. I am asking you to listen in silence to the remaining time the minister has. Minister. If those opposite are also committed to net zero, I hope they have a plan too, because we have one and we will implement it and we will give people certainty. Thank you, Minister. Senator McKim. Thanks, President. My minister is... Uh, <laughs> that, could, that could actually be a Freudian slip. Uh, <laughs> that could Senator be a Freudian Scar. slip. Senator Scar. <laughs> <laughs> Order. <laughs> President, I, I'm, I might start again. Uh, my question is to Minister Watt, representing uh, the Minister for Home Affairs. And uh, despite the jovial start, it is a serious question, Minister. According to the Department of Home Affairs, there are 92 people who arrive by boat to seek asylum in Australia still stranded on Nauru. It seems from answers in Senate estimates this week that the government has no idea how many have been lang left to languish in Papua New Guinea and, in fact, couldn't care less. But I can inform the government that that number is 94. Minister, it's been almost 
10 years since a Labor government first exiled those people offshore. Why will your Labor government not offer those 186 people temporary resettlement in Australia so they can be cared for and supported here while arrangements are being made for their permanent resettlement in a third country. Thank you, Senator McKim. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator McKim. Uh, this is a very serious question, and I don't think that any uh, Australian is happy about the fact that people have been in detention offshore for as long as they have. Uh, but our government was very clear going to the election uh, that our policy in relation to people on Nauru uh, was that we would support uh, third country resettlement, uh, and that is something that we said ver a very long time before the election. And the fundamental problem here is that it took so long for the former government to do anything about the resettlement of these people. I mean, we all remember the years. Uh, that an offer was on the table from the New Zealand government to resettle people from Nauru, and it didn't happen. Uh, if, if the former government had taken up that option of resettling people Order. in New Zealand, we should Order. have been in a position where no one was still in Nauru. But of course, that was not taken by the former government, and that offer from New Zealand remain un remained unanswered. Uh, we are certainly continuing to work uh, with a number of uh, third countries. Uh, to consider facilitating resettlement, and that remains our policy. Uh, in the meantime, as Senator McKim may be aware, uh, we have also made a commitment to uh, make permanent uh, the very large number of people who are in Australia on temporary protection visas, uh, uh, who have been on those for far too long. Uh, and have been left to languish in that situation while on Australian soil. So we are doing a lot of work across a range of visa categories. I was talking yesterday about the work that we're undertaking to clear the visa backlog as well. Uh, but our position remains uh, that people on Nauru uh, uh, should be resettled in third countries, uh, and we continue to work very hard with those countries and the people themselves to enable that to happen. Thank you, Minister. What Senator, um, Senator McKim, first supplementary. Thanks, President. There are over 5,000 people who arrived in Australia by boat to seek asylum since 2013, and over 2,000 of that 5,000 were never actually transferred to either Manus Island or Nauru. People from the same country arrived on the same boat at the same time, and they were separated to totally different futures by completely arbitrary decisions. Why are some of them now worthy of permanent protection in Australia, while others remain abandoned in offshore detention? Thank you, Senator McKim. Minister Watt. Um, thank you, President. Well, thank you, Senator McKim. Senator McKim. Uh, and I, I welcome Senator McKim recognising that our government uh, has committed to make permanent uh, the very large number of people who the former government left languishing on temporary protection visas. Uh, that is a position that we always opposed. Uh, we thought it was, we thought it was extremely unfair uh, for people who had been granted those temporary protection visas to remain lacking certainty uh, from year to year. Uh, and of course, there's a, ma a massive ta uh, cost to taxpayers in requiring the regular uh, processing and reprocessing of people on those temporary protection visas. So we are undertaking a lot of work to make that happen. Uh, it's not an easy process because of the, of the sheer number of people who are on those temporary protection visas, but it's something that we remain uh, committed to. Uh, the uh, people, of course, who are on temporary protection visas have been found to be refugees and are owed our protection, and that's why our government. Uh, is committed Senator to McKim. ensuring that they get uh, a permanent protection, which is what they Thank should have been Minister, granted in the first place. Expired. Senator McKim, second supplement. It's like an episode of Utopia in this place at times. Minister, nearly a year ago, the Morrison government callously washed its hands of responsibility for the people in that cohort still in exile in Papua New Guinea and abandoned them in a place which is not safe and does not support them. Some of them are dying there now. Will your government reverse that cynical decision and accept responsibility for the people that the Labor Party sent there 10 years ago? Thank you, Senator McKim. Minister Watt. Well, it's good that Senator McKim has been able to get his video for his social media, which is what we know that was all about and what it's always about from Senator McKim. Uh, because if Senator McKim was actually genuinely concerned about these issues, he'd be Order. working with our government Order. to assist our, us to implement the policy that we took to the election. Uh, but we know it's never about the, the facts, it's never about the Senator substance McKim. with the Greens. 
It continues Minister, to be. Minister what? Here's Minister some more what? video for Senator McKim. Minister what? Senator McKim, you have asked your question. I would ask that you listen in silence. Minister, please continue. Uh, Senator Wish Wilson, I don't need commentary from you either. I've asked for silence. I've asked for silence. Minister Watt. Um, thank you, President. And as I say, it's disappointing that for the Greens these issues are always more about the social media clip or about the stunt rather than about the substance. Uh, uh, exhibit Minister A, B, what? C, D, Minister E and what? F. Please resume your... uh, Senator McKim, please resume your seat. I have a senator already on his feet. Senator Scar. President, I refer to Senate Order 193 in relation to the imputation of improper motives. Yeah. Senator McKim cares deeply about this issue. He has a right to ask questions without having, in, in, without having improper motives imputed to him. Uh, Senator Scar, Sen uh, Senator McKim, please resume your seat. Uh, I, on the same point of order? Yep. That was exactly the point of order I was about to make. You're entitled to ask your questions in this place without having your motives impugned in such a way. Uh, that is, quite frankly, a disgraceful accusation from Senator Watt, and he should withdraw it. Um, I'm going to ask both senators. Uh, your, sen your question, uh, Senator Wong, I'm responding. Senator McKim, your question, in my view, was asked in an extremely aggressive way. I do appreciate you have a lot of passion about the question, as do a range of senators in here on the questions that they ask, but in my view it was asked in a very aggressive way. I would remind uh, Senator Watt of the point of order, and I would ask him to uh, answer your question in a respectful way, but I'm asking all senators to listen respectfully as well. Minister Watt. Senator Ruskin. Point of order. The, the fact that the question was asked as to whether the motives of the asker of the question were impugned by the comments by the minister, are you actually not requesting for him to withdraw that imputation? Uh, Senator Rustin, I, what I heard was that Senator Wong. Uh, what I heard, and I am more than happy to look at this on the record, Senator Wong, please resume your seat was a comment about the party, not the individual. If I'm wrong on that, I will come back and correct. To I have, I have ruled on that. I don't, uh, Senator Hanson Young, I will come to you. I will come to you. I've got Senator Scar on his feet. So just so that I'm clear, what I heard was a reference to the Greens. Senator Wong. Uh, I, I understand that Senator McKim has asked the minister to withdraw, uh, and I'd ask you to call the minister. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President. Um, I withdraw any imputation against uh, Senator McKim that I may have made, but the, the point I'm trying to make is these are very serious issues. Um, and Senator McKim knows that not only I, but every member of the government takes these issues very seriously. And that's why we have been putting so much effort into both third party resettlement since taking office and also the processing of people, thousands of people who were left languishing on temporary protection visas when we took office. We will continue to do that and we don't uh, need uh, the sort of performances that often uh, are undertaken in this Thank chamber you, by the Greens. Your time has expired. Senator Billick. Earlier this week I met with participants in the Pacific Australia Emerging Leaders Summit. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Wong. Can you tell us how the Albanese Labor government building stronger partnerships with the countries of the Pacific family and the Pacific region as a whole is going? Thank you, Senator Billick. Um, Minister. Uh, Minister Wong, it's your question. I apologise. I, I, I was distracted by a discussion with the leader. I, I, I regret. I will, I will, uh, would you mind repeating the question and I'll make sure there's additional time post three o'clock. Thank you, uh, Minister. Senator Billick, please Thank repeat you. the question. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Wong. Order. Order. Earlier, earlier, this week, earlier this week, I met with participants in the Pacific Australia Emerging Leaders Summit. 
So can you tell us how is the Albanese Labor government building stronger partnerships with the countries of the Pacific family and the Pacific region as a whole? Thank you, Senator Bellick. Minister Wong. Bellick, and I apologise that Senator Birmingham was, and I was so engrossed that I didn't hear a question that I had, in fact, spoken with you about the importance of asking. And, and I, I acknowledge, and I will come to them, those members of the Pacific family who are here today in the gallery. Uh, we are seeking to build a stronger Pacific family by showing up and listening, by acting on climate change, and by boosting our security cooperation and development assistance. Uh, the government's investment in maritime security, climate action, labour mobility, health and education will help our regional partners become more economically resilient, develop critical infrastructure and provide their own security. The investments the Albanese government uh, has put in place will deliver on our commitments to build a stronger and more united Pacific family and a peaceful, prosperous and resilient region. Uh, as Foreign Minister since the election, I've had the privilege of undertaking seven separate visits to the Pacific, uh, visiting 11 countries and, importantly, attending the Pacific Islands Forum in Fiji with the Prime Minister and Minister Conroy, the Minister for International Development in the Pacific. In addition, the Deputy Prime Minister has visited PNG, Nauru, Tonga and Fiji, where he signed a landmark status of forces agreement. Minister Conroy has visited Fiji, PNG, Solomon Islands and last week attended the first in-person Pacific Community Ministerial Conference SPC, since the onset of the pandemic in Vanuatu. Australia is a proud founding member of the SPC, which is the largest scientific and technical regional organisation in the Pacific. Uh, for 75 years, SPC has brought the Pacific together in the Pacific way for members to achieve our shared ambitions and face our shared challenges. Uh, and I know Minister Conroy was so pleased to represent Australia in this important forum. Thank you, Minister. Senator Billick, first supplementary. Thank you. How is the Albanese Labor government responding to the needs and the priorities of the Pacific family? Minister. Uh, thank, thank you uh, to Senator Billick. And one of the things that we have been very focused on communicating is that our partnerships in the region will be guided by Pacific priorities. Communities and leaders across the Blue Pacific have been clear about the impact of the three Cs. This was part of the discussion at the Leaders Forum at Pacific Island Forum. Uh, leaders discussion. The three Cs, climate, COVID and contest. Uh, this is articulated in the 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific Continent, endorsed by forum leaders this year, and I was very pleased to uh, be with um, uh, Prime Minister Bani Marama and other Pacific leaders in, in, at the UN uh, when uh, this was launched. It is a vision for the Pacific's economic, environmental and strategic future written by and written for Pacific nations and Pacific peoples. At the heart is a simple concept that the Pacific knows best what its priorities are and how to achieve them. Thank you, Minister. Senator Billick, second supplementary. Thank you for that answer. Minister, how is the Albanese Labor government elevating Pacific voices on the world stage and supporting Pacific emerging leaders? Uh, Minister Wong. Uh, thank you. Uh, when it comes to climate action, the nations of the Pacific have led the way for a long time. And I remember as climate minister being struck by the power and sincerity of the voice of Pacific Island nations on climate change, well ahead uh, of where the domestic debate wa was in Australia. They have called on us to act, and we have heard them, and we have responded. And we are honoured that all Pacific Island Forum governments have supported support Australia's bid to co-host with the Pacific COP31. How we deal with the climate crisis is now essential to the future we leave young people and future generations. So I want to acknowledge uh, and welcome the impressive group of Pacific scholars and researchers joining us here today. I pay tribute to the work you are doing to chart a course for your, their, your own futures and the futures of our shared region. Young leaders from, from Fiji, Sa Samoa, Aotearoa, New Zealand, Papua New Guinea, Kiribati, Tonga, Solomon Islands, New Caledonia have been participating in a colloquium through ANU, and we welcome you here today. Thank you, Senator Wong. Your time has expired. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. During the federal election campaign, the now Prime Minister and now Treasurer promised there would be no changes to Australia's franking credits regime. In January 2021, he said, I can confirm Labor will not be taking any changes to franking credits to the next election. Does the recent budget measure titled 
improving the integrity of off-market share buybacks involve changes to franking credits? Thank you, uh, Senator Smith. Uh, Minister Gallagher. Thank you. It, this, um, the measures that were announced in the budget are completely unrelated to the proposed changes to dividends in the 2019 election, which, as those in this place know, we, we did not take to the, the 2022 election. Uh, Senator Smith, second, uh, first Mr. supplementary. Is it correct that this budget measure will see retirees and investors pay $550 million in extra tax? Uh, thank you, Senator Smith. Minister. I'll refer the member to the uh, uh, figures outlined in the budget papers. Uh, thank you, Minister Gallagher. Order. Order. Senator Smith, second supplementary. President, the budget measure clearly says uh, $550 uh, million Smith, is this your in second extra supplementary? tax. Was that your second no. supplementary? No, it wasn't. I've invited you to make your second supplementary. Thank you. Thank you, President. Can Minister Wong. So the she's got a thing. Order. Jared. She's got a order. thing for you. Is that Senator standing Smith. order 193? Ah. Um, can, the minister, can the minister rule out further changes to the franking credits regime under this government? And can the minister explain how retirees can trust anything this government says, given its broken promise on franking credits? Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister Gallagher. There's no broken uh, promise on franking uh, credits, and the measures that the government has agreed to around um, focusing on tax loopholes. Uh, have been announced in the budget. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Wong. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Senator Farrell. President, uh, during question time, I committed to uh, Senator uh, Liddell to provide additional information, which I now do. Uh, in the cyber security space within Services Australia, uh, there are day-to-day -day operations as well as administrative functions. There were contractors uh, that will be leaving the agency that work on administrative functions in the cyber security space, but not in the day-to-day -day cyber security operations or hardening of the cyber security systems. Services Australia is confident cyber security will be maintained. Senator McGrath. Take note of Oh, sorry. Senator Watt. Yeah, President, in question time last week, I took elements of a question asked by Senator Patterson, uh, sorry, Senator Hanson to me on notice. I've written to Senator Hanson to provide an answer, and I'll now table that answer for the information of the Senate. Thank you, Minister. Are there any other ministerial statements? Senator McGrath. No. Uh, thank you. Mr Deputy President, I rise to take note of all answers to all, all questions. Please proceed. And I'm, I'm going to start with the, the responses from, from Senator Wong to Senator Birmingham's question about estimates and accountability and transparency. And it is clear with, with this, this Labor government that it's, it's not what they do, but it's what, it's what they say. And because they're not being transparent, they're not being accountable, but they're saying they are. Indeed, the Prime Minister before the election said that, that the Australian people deserve transparency and accountability. But what we found out in the last, I suppose it's 14 hours, 16 hours, is that this Labor government are reducing estimates, the time for non-government senators to ask questions of the government as to how public monies are expended, that we have found out under Labor's proposals for the sitting schedule in the coming year that they've reduced the estimate schedule by 25 per cent. By 25 per cent. So what the, this, this has overturned decades, decades of convention that there are at least four weeks of estimates each year. Estimates where non-government centres, regardless of who is in power, Labor or, or the coalition, that non-government senators can ask questions of, of the government. And so what we find with this, this Labor government, who have promised, promised transparency and accountability, that they're doing everything but that. In, indeed, transparency and accountability have just popped outside of this building. Uh, they've called a cab or an Uber and they're heading to the airport and they're getting the hell out of, sorry, they're getting, they're getting the heck out of, of, of Canberra. Because this is 
what we're seeing under this Labor government. Uh, we're seeing a Labor government who, for example, with the sitting schedule, promised family-friendly hours. Now, I'm happy to sit here each night to, to, to midnight. You know, my, my family's uh, not, not here in Canberra. Many senators here, their families, most senators, their families are not here in Canberra. Labor promised family-friendly hours, Mr. Deputy President, but under the sitting schedule, they've made it harder, harder for senators from states like WA, where my colleague Senator O'Sullivan comes from, to actually get home and see their families on, on, on weekends. They've extended the sitting hours. They continue to extend the sitting hours. On this side of the chamber, we, we don't have a, have a problem with trying to assist the government in achieving its legislative program, but we do have a problem with the hypocrisy of a Labor Party who come into this chamber and talk about transparency and accountability and yet do anything but be transparent and accountable. And I, I wonder, Mr Deputy President, is this reluctance to hold four weeks of estimates in calendar year 2023 something to do with secrets, something to do with, I don't know, dodgy deals, something that the Labor government don't want us to ask questions about. Because we just have to go through the estimates over the last couple of weeks. And we've found out, for example, through looking at the budget papers, and through asking questions of officials at the table, that at that, that jobs fest, you know, that talk fest that was masquerading as a jobs fest, that this Labor government spent $7,000 on a band. Now, fair play to the band. We all love live music. Brilliant. But they spent $7,000 on a band uh, for an official function. Now, is that a good use of taxpayer money? Taxpayer, Senator O'Sullivan, paid for this. We found that out through the estimates process. But, but is it because the government does not wish us to prosecute and ask questions about energy policy in Australia, remembering that this Labor government, this Labor Prime Minister, promised 97 times before the election that they will reduce your power bills by $275, yet under in their budget papers we were able to find out, actually, the power bills are going to go up by 56 per cent. So what this government is doing is deliberately limiting the ability of non-government senators to ask questions of ministers as to policies, but also to ask questions of officials as to how public money is being expended. This is about accountability. It is about standing up for the rights of taxpayers who fund the government of Australia and ask on behalf of taxpayers where that money is being spent and is that money being spent appropriately. And what we find out from this Labor Party is that they are scared of transparency and accountability. No matter, no matter the words that come out of them, they all want to go and hide under the doona because they do not like being held to account. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, for Deputy President. I've got to get the terms right. Because there has been a change of government. And this is the government that is letting the light in and the hypocrisy of those who've come in here with this faux outrage about having one week uh, less to review at an event that's not occurring is simply a complete misrepresentation of what's going on. To be clear, my EFO, the mid-year economic forecast and outlook that is provided to the Australian people we would be familiar with that. It normally happens around Christmas time. And when we return after the Christmas break, the MyEFO document with all of that financial information is then generally subject to review by the process of estimates. That is how it works. But we've had an election this year, people. The government, the former government seemed to have missed that. There was an election, and because their figures were so lacking in transparency because they were so dodgy and so unclear, like their own leader who has been censured on this very day in the other chamber, like their own leader censured by the parliament in this very parliament today, they try to construct a, a false narrative here about what is going on. The reality is we are all for transparency unlike the government that was under Mr Morrison. 
And I think Minister Birmingham should be a bit careful with these sort of questions. He, he should know something about this lack of accountability, about the government that he helped to lead. He was the minister representing that Prime Minister, minister Scott, uh, Prime Minister Scott Morrison. Did he stand up to him? Did he stand up then? But as recently as a few months ago, Senator Birmingham was part of the cover-up that we have now seen revealed since the government's changed. The transparency that we finally see about a Prime Minister who was so hell-bent on keeping everything secret that he didn't even tell his own cabinet ministers that he'd taken over five of their jobs. Five of their jobs he'd taken over. Questions. They want to ask questions about a document that does not exist because we just had a budget in October. How many questions did they actually leave unanswered before they left us? It wasn't just parliamentary questions on notice that were left unanswered. The Prime Minister, as he left, had a total of 128 unanswered parliamentary questions on notice. 128 that he hadn't answered. Parliamentary questions on notice were just one part of it. The Prime Minister's own department had a total of 391 unanswered questions from Senate estimates. 391. So for this group of members of the now opposition to come in here and say, we need transparency, we need accountability, we agree. So did the Australian people. That's why they turfed you lot out and brought us in. They were sick of the deception. They were sick of the lies. They were sick of the cover-ups, the cover-ups that have become clear since we've come into government, had a look at the books and put out a proper budget in October to let the Australian people know what's really going on with the finances of this country. But that's not the only thing they covered up. And we tried so hard in this place, in this Senate, to hold that government to account. I've got uh, notes from a, a, a matter of public importance speech that I gave last year. And the title of that debate was the matter that the Prime Minister's inability to accept responsibility for any failures and policy stuff-ups that have littered his three years of office. The Prime Minister's answer to the car park rorts, the minister made no decision. His answer to sports rorts, the, he, was, he said that that was misleading parliament. His answer to about an alleged rape in the ministerial wing, no idea about it. His answer to the bushfires that burned homes in my home estate, I don't hold a hose, he said. And his own members were asking him about what was going on with the government and he hid from them that he'd taken over five of their jobs. This is an opposition that has not a leg to stand on in terms of coming in and asking this transparent government that is telling the truth to the Australian people, that's not hiding behind a prime minister who is such a deceiver that he can't even tell his own people what he's doing. The truth has to be told. Senate estimates should follow a, a, a traditional procedure. It should be available to ministers on the other side, or shadow ministers, to ask questions, no doubt. But this, this is a stunt because my EFO doesn't exist. There is really no need for Thank a you, review Senator of a document that will not exist Senator in Van. this year. Senator Birmingham, please. Senator Van is anxious to begin his contribution. Oh, I am indeed, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, and I rise to take note of the question to Minister Watt um, about power generation, something I know something about. Unlike those on the other side, I spent the best part of my career working in and around the energy uh, industry, so I know something about it. I also would like to take note of uh, Minister Wong's slur against me. Uh, when she was comparing me with Senator Rennick. Or, uh, she was in the chamber when I was giving my two-minute speech about my visit to COP27 and how important I thought it was for coalition senators to be there. Now, I didn't see my very good friend uh, um, Senator Rennick there. I know Senator Cox was there, but I, I didn't see her there also. Um, in this place, only a, few, a matter of weeks ago, and when we were debating the uh, the legislation legislating of the 43 per cent target, uh, I said in my speech, and I, I quote, uh, and maybe those opposite can show this, um, Hansard to Senator Wong, I said, I'm personally, I am more ambitious than those opposite 
to what I would like to see our emissions reduction target be. However, I am not blind to reality, unlike those opposite. I believe we need to be as pragmatic as we am uh, ambitious. Now, why am I saying that? Well, it was said by in JP Morgan's annual energy paper, which explicitly stated that countries that reduce production of fossil fuels under the assumption that renewables can quickly replace them, uh, them face substantial economic and geopolitical risks. If the energy transition is to succeed, we cannot disconnect the generation methods we currently have before we have a replacement for them. And that's what those opposite have not yet addressed. They've talked their plan, which was put together by uh, Reputex, I think it was. When I last worked with them, uh, when I was consulting, they were a polling firm. So I'm sure they've learned a lot about energy policy since then, uh, but I'm not sure how those opposite see that as a viable energy plan. Anyone who starts talking about renewables without talking about firming doesn't know what they're talking about when it comes to energy supply, sovereign energy security and bringing down emissions. The two just aren't the same. None of this can work in isolation. You can't just string wires out to some place out in Whoop Whoop where someone's decided to build a solar farm or a wind farm and think that that's going to give you a good return on your money or not push up power bills. Because I guarantee you it will. The 23 or $24 billion that was in the budget, add a zero to that would be my best estimate. And I'm sure I can find ways to cite that and prove that up. Batteries are not going to be the answer to firming. They're just not. There's no way, there's no, no one that's showing now, and no one at COP was talking about batteries being a grid scale firming source. Now, they may be in the future. Hopefully, technology will allow them to be. Hopefully, China might still sell them to us at some point. Hopefully, Australia could even be a manufacturer of our own, since we have, uh, we are, produce a lot of the minerals that are critical for batteries. But at the moment, and in the foreseeable future, out to 2030, they are not going to be grid scale. So JP Morgan's annual energy paper stated putting more renewable energy on the grid will not guarantee lower prices because energy prices rest on an average cost of generation, not just the actual cost of power. No, it's not just the photons or the knots of wind. It's how it's delivered on a continuous, supported basis. And that's the bit that we're not hearing from the other side. As AEMO's 2022 ISP states, we need to treble the firming capacity from dispatchable storage, including pumped hydro and gas-fired generation, to firm renewables that are coming onto the grid. Now, I do my homework, and I've seen and I've found there are actually some Australian companies that are producing firming sources that deserve to be backed, that might actually provide grid-scale firming. There's also uh, Australian companies delivering uh, printed solar that we can put at the source of use, not where we want to run some wires to. Thank you. Senator Chicane. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. Um, and I rise um, just to respond <coughs> to the line of questioning that have been put by the opposition to the government today with respect to the proposed uh, parliamentary sitting calendar for 2023. Um, so you know, we come into this place, and yes, it is getting very close to the end of the year, um, in a week where this government has and looks likely to be passing some significant legislation reforms, not just only with integrity and uh, the NAC bills, but also uh, providing some of the lowest paid workers with some real wage increase opportunities and increase in the productivity in this country. But yet, the op but yet those opposite choose to go down a route of distraction, pretending that somehow the parliamentary calendar for next year, the, and the way that we conduct ourselves in this place, is the biggest single issue of the week. 
And regardless of what um, they may say, uh, Deputy President, the reality is that a lot of people will be watching this place would be going, what on earth, what on earth are the coalition senators on about? When their cost of living is going through the roof, you lot, you lot come into this place and use our sitting calendar as somehow the biggest political issue of the day. Talk about being in the bubble. Talk about being in the bubble. And just for the record, Deputy President, as everyone should, always go to the source of the documents. So what I did was during question time, I went and downloaded, downloaded last year's, uh, so this year's calendar from the start of the year when you lot were in government. And what I, I can inform the, the, the uh, chamber today is that there weren't four weeks of estimates. There were just three. Just three weeks of estimates. So there is not a 25 per cent decrease of estimates. Your government only proposed three weeks of estimates for this year. Three weeks only. In addition to that, when you compare to what this government's proposal is in this chamber, we are sitting on every single Monday. Every single Monday. Unlike the coalition, who had proposed that we sit three Mondays less when compared to the calendar proposed by the government. In addition to this, this government has also put onto the table four additional days on a Friday, if required. Four additional days, if required. Then, on top of that, Deputy President, we have an additional week making our sitting calendar for 20 weeks of the year. 20 weeks of the year compared to your 19 weeks. So it's important that we deal with the facts. It is important that we deal with the facts. All you have to do is download the calendar from the start of this year that your lot had proposed and put to this chamber. It is important that we deal with the facts because it is something that the opposition are not very good at doing. They are not very good at dealing with the facts. Um, Deputy President, I also wanted to, uh, also wanted to, to note, um, and I know Senator Birmingham has raised these objections with Senator Wong in the chamber and just made some interjections earlier, but it is the case that there won't be a MyEFO this year, and as been the past practice, there is no need to have that extra week of estimates. That is what the Leader of the Government in the Senate has articulated today in the Senate during question time. That is a very simple explanation as to why we don't have that week of estimates. That is a very simple explanation as to why we're not having an additional week of estimates as per the proposed draft before us today. But it is important that we always look, always look at what previous governments have done, but whether they're on the Labor side or the Liberal side, but it is important that we always look at the previous sitting calendars, because it is always important that we look at what the facts are. So I just wanted to make those few short points uh, today, Deputy President, because it is hypocritical coming from the opposition who also didn't want to sit on Saturday. I mean, they made it very clear they did not want to sit on Saturday, this Saturday, to deal with the, the, the work, the changes to the Fair Work Act, Senator Colbeck, to give the lowest paid workers in this country a pay rise. Your, your side of politics had said no way to sit in longer, no way to for giving low-paid workers an increase to their wages. I'm happy to sit here on a Friday. I'm here to sit here on a Saturday as long as the low-paid workers get a pay rise, Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Senator Shikoni. Uh, Senator Colbeck. Deputy President, and I've got to say desperation comes to the fore, I have to say. Uh, Mr President, there's a pattern emerging here from the government. Uh, they, they talked a big game before the election. Uh, then they come into this, this place having been elected. Uh, they slip sliding away from their promises, left, right and centre. No mention of 275 in this place from the government anymore. $275 uh, energy price reduction that was promised by uh, the government. That's, that's gone. Uh, and also gone with it, Mr President, is any sense of transparency. Uh, Senator Giacone, he comes and puts on a Se Senator, Senator Giacone comes in here and puts on a brave face. Puts on a brave face. Well, I've been here nearly 20 years, Senator Giacone, and I've never seen a year where there's only three weeks of estimates. And, and Senator Giacone, can I tell you, 
Um, additional estimates in February is not just about my EFO. It's about annual reports. It's about a range of other documents that are tabled and published in the public, Parliament so that the Senate can scrutinise those documents and those processes. That's what it's about. So the government tries to narrow down the target and narrow down the story to suit their rhetoric, but really what's happening is here there is a 25 per cent cut in scrutiny next year. 25 per cent cut. Well, Senator, your maths is pretty. Your, 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 your maths is pretty shabby because normally there's four weeks of estimates in a sitting year, and as I said, I've been here a little while and seen a few years, and sat around the table for a few years of estimates, uh, and so a 25 per cent cut next year in scrutiny by this government, when normally, when normally they, uh, and when when they said they were going to have more scrutiny, they wanted to be a more open government, they wanted to see more scrutiny, Mr. President, uh, but. That's not what we're seeing in practice. Senator Wong said during uh, her answer to Senator Birmingham's question that we wouldn't answer a question about sports grants and estimates. Well, Senator, uh, Mr. Uh, Deputy President, I sat there through all those estimates, the sports minister, and I answered every question. I, went, I, I underwent, Mr. President, I underwent the forensic questioning from Senator Farrell. Every estimates, the forensic questioning from Senator Farrell at every estimates, and I answered every question. I answered every question. So Senator Wong can make the accusation, Mr Deputy President, but I was there. I answered every question. So they try to deflect, they try to blame somebody else, Mr President, but at the end of the day, they're not interested in scrutiny. They're trying to slide from scrutiny. Uh, and they, and, and they, talk about, they talk about us coming to the chamber, which is the process. They talk about us coming to the chamber with support of other parties around, around uh, uh, the chamber. Uh, in respect of the sitting schedule, and yet there was no consultation with the opposition with respect to what the sitting schedule might look like. And in circumstances where there have been major changes or significant changes to the way the schedule looked, there's always been consultation. Now I don't expect the Senator Ciccone to understand that. He hasn't had uh, that level of experience in that process. I understand that. I understand that. But there have been plenty of occasions when there's been significant changes to the sitting schedule that it's been done in consultation, particularly with the opposition, so that we knew that we could get agreement in the chamber, uh, and in fact sometimes under the threat of using the chamber to come in here. But what we have this time a 25 per cent cut in scrutiny through estimates. Additional Fridays for which there is no standing orders or schedule of programs. So do we get a sitting do we get a question time? You can't answer that question. There's no process been undergone there. How come this hasn't been referred to procedure committee so that there can be a process set up in the case that we, so, so there's no process, no process there. Uh, it is a complete shambles, and the government come in here and try and pass it off. Well, there's no my EFO, so we don't need to do it. So they're not looking at all the processes uh, of the government that are scrutinised at estimates, including annual reports and other reports that are tabled in this place, and the opportunity for senators of all parties across the whole parliament to scrutinise, uh, and we should, have that, we should have that opportunity. We should have that opportunity. Uh, but they talk about transparency. They don't practise it. The secret report that we hear about today about the impacts on the coal industry from the government policies, they don't want communities to understand what the impacts of those policies are going to be, so they talk a big game before the election about what, might be, what they might do and they slip, they slide, they try to blame everybody else. The real pattern, it's always somebody else's fault. Could be a department. What was it we heard the other day? It was a typo that it was in, 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 in one particular circumstance. Uh, but they're not prepared to provide the scrutiny and the transparency they talked about before the election. I put the question, those for the question say aye, against no, the ayes have it. Senator McKim. Thank you, Deputy President. I move that the Senate take note of the responses from Senator Watt to the questions asked by Senator Cox and me. Well, uh, Deputy President, uh, it's been almost a decade since people were first exiled to Manus Island and Nauru, and uh, we should never forget they were exiled there by a Labor government. And now, nearly a decade later, Labor is back in power. But what's Labor actually doing to address the crisis and the human rights calamity 
the humanitarian nightmare that it actually started nearly a decade ago? Well, you know what the answer is to that? Nothing. Labor is doing nothing to address it. It's been a decade of murder, rape, child sex abuse, armed assault, the deliberate destruction of countless lives, the deliberate denial of the necessities of life—food, drinking water, electricity, medical support. This has been a foul chapter in our country's story, a dark, dark chapter, a bloody chapter in our country's story. And it's time we wrote the ending to that chapter. But this is a bipartisan policy of cruelty. The people left in Papua New Guinea and Nauru are like the corpses that used to be impaled on the walls of medieval cities to send a message to other desperate people that they should not try to enter. They are human billboards exploited by the Labor and Liberal parties. And what is the Labor Party, the government of the day, doing about this? Absolutely nothing except continuing the cruelty. They continue to wash their hands of the people who were in Papua New Guinea and they continue to abandon the people of Nauru. It's not good enough. This country is a better country than this and the government must do better. Senator Cox. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. And my question to Minister Watt was very, very clear about Middle Arm. The sustainable uh, precinct uh, in the Darwin Harbour. $1.9 bi uh, billion dollars we heard uh, here, just right here in this chamber, given to, uh, through the equity fund. And you heard me talk about how um, the fossil fuels, uh, the 75 per cent emissions that would be released uh, through the Northern Territory on this one project. Now, the name of it suggests that it is a clean energy project. Well, that's greenwashing, we know, and, uh, and actually it's, it's greenwashing now that's been government endorsed. You know, that they are removing words like petrochemicals from uh, websites in the Northern Territory. And the, and the minister couldn't even answer whether they actually had any hand in that. Yet when you go onto the website, it's very clear that they're in partnership, the federal government and the Northern Territory government. So there's been lots of conversations. And when they cop some flack, because they go off to COP27 and their minister talks about how great it's been that they co-chaired the Global Climate Fund and helping other nations, but they're not helping First Nations people. Larrakia people in the Darwin Harbour area have rejected this actual project. The lack of consultation is unbelievable. And yet this government will, say, will not even answer the question about the public information that appears on this website. That miraculously just disappeared disappeared weeks ago when the minister says, oh, well, I don't know where that, how that information, he should look at the paper maybe one day and actually have a look and see uh, where that information is, because clearly uh, they may be asleep at the wheel just like the last government were. Um, this was all part of the gas-fired recovery and from COVID, this, uh, this rain project came from. And then we talk about the mangrove alliance. Well, Here's Minister Plibersek from the other place coming out, her and Minister Bowen in a, in a joint statement talking about signing up to the International Mangrove Alliance, protecting and restoring, wanting to increase uh, to 20 per cent by 2030, mangroves absorbing more carbon. Well, you can't do that while you're opening up fossil fuel projects in the same precinct. You cannot do that. You are not going to store any carbon. Doing that. Thank you, Senator Cox. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator White.
President, on behalf of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I give notice of my intention at the giving of notices on the next day of sitting to withdraw Business of the Senate Notice of Motion No. 5 for five sitting days after today, proposing the disallowance of the financial sector reform Hain Royal Commission response hawking of financial pro products regulations 2021. Thank you, Senator White. Are there any other notices of motion to be given for another day? There being none, uh, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Urquhart. Thank you, President. I seek leave to move, move a motion relating to leave of absence for a senator. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Ayres for today for personal reasons. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Urquhart be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The aye, those against say no. I believe the ayes have it. <laughs> Senator McKim. <laughs> Thank you, President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Thorpe for 30th of November for personal reasons. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Well, now, um, uh, Yes, there's some postponement. I'll call the clerk. Uh, President, postponement notifications have been lodged in respect of business of the Senate notice number one for today, postponed to the 8th of February 2023. Business of the Senate notice number two for today, postponed till tomorrow. Business of the Senate notice number four for today, postponed to the 6th of February 2023. And general business notices 109 and 110, postponed to the 6th of February 2023. Thank you very much. And Senator Lambie is seeking the call. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I just seek your guidance, if I may, please. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to seek. Um, I would like to seek leave for general business order of the day number three relating to the establishment of a, of a select committee. Do I do that now? Um, I understand, uh, Senator Lambie, that's going to be dealt with at the end of formal business. If that assists you. Yep. Um, <clears throat> I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. I'm going to proceed to the discovery of formal business, and I would go to government business number three, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher. Senator three. Gallagher. Thank you. I ask that government business notice in motion number three proposing the approval of a determination made under the Health Insurance Act 1973 be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being formal? There being none, I call the Thank minister. You. I move the motion. So the question is that the um, government business notice of motion number three, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I now move to uh, general business notice of motion number 71, standing in the name of Senator Faruqi. Senator uh, thank Faruqi. you. Thank you, President. I ask the general business notice of motion number 71, proposing the introduction of a bill to free student debt be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Faruqi. Thank you, President. I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to higher education, vocational education and training, social security and student assistance, and for related purposes. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you, President. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. The bill for an act to amend the law relating to higher education, vocational education and training, social security and student assistance and for related purposes. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, President. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Faruqi. Um, thanks, President. I table an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. I now move to 
uh, General Business Notice of Motion Number 107, standing in the name of Senator Wish Wilson. Senator McKim. Oops, taking the wrong thing off there. Thank you, President. I, on behalf of Senator Wish Wilson, ask that General Business Notice of Motion Number 107 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I move the motion. So the question is at General Business, notice of motion number 107, standing in the name of Senator Wish Wilson and moved by Senator McKim, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I now move to General Business, notice of motion number 108, standing in the name of Senator Canavan. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Madam President. I, I inform the chamber that Senator Babette will also sponsor the motion and the bill. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion Number 108, proposing the introduction of bill, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Canavan. <coughs> Thank you. I move that the following bill be introduced: a bill for an act to protect children born alive, including as a result of terminations and for related purposes. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Canavan be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Canavan be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to protect children born alive, including as a result of terminations and for related purposes. Senator Canavan. Uh, I move that this bill be now read a second time, and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Canavan. I table an explanatory memorandum, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Canavan. I now move to general business. Notice of motion number 111, standing in the name of Senator Henderson. Oh, beg your pardon, Senator Askew. Um, on behalf of Senator Henderson, I ask that general business notice of motion number 111 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call uh, Senator Askew. I move the motion. So the question, uh, Senator Chisholm. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Chisholm. The government opposes the motion. Senator Henderson's attempts at obtaining certain details of ABC salaries echoes previous attempts by One Nation and smacks of a personal vendetta against the ABC. The government supports transparency and accountability with respect to the ABC, and as a Commonwealth entity, the ABC already discloses executive remuneration in its annual report in accordance with its obligations under the PJPA Act. The ABC also conducts an annual gender pay equity review and reports this in its annual report. The ABC claimed public interest immunity in respect of Senator Henderson's recent attempt at obtaining details from the ABC as part of the recent budget estimates process. The Senate Environment and Communications Legislation Committee carefully considered and ultimately accepted the ABC's public interest immunity claims. That the provision of the information requested may result in unwarranted privacy concerns for identifiable employees, as well as commercial and confidence concerns for the ABC more generally. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. So the question is that the uh, that general business notice of motion number 111, standing in the name of Senator Henderson and moved by Senator Askew, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
lock the doors. So the question is that um, general business notice of motion number 111, standing in the name of Senator Henderson and moved by Senator Askew be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order, there being 21 ayes and 35. 31 to oh, that's wrong. Sorry, what was it? 31 to 35. Sorry, the technology didn't work. There being 31 ayes and 35 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. And I advise senators there may be further divisions. Uh, and we'll now move to general business. Notice of motion number 112, standing in the name of Senator Henderson. Is that you? Senator Askew. <laughs> On behalf of Senator Henderson, I ask that general business notice of motion number 112 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Askew. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 111, standing in, I beg your pardon, 112, standing in the name of Senator Henderson and moved by Senator Askew be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. No. Ayes have it. Ring the bells for Are you happy with one minute. Lock the doors. 
So the question is that general business notice of motion number 112, standing in the name of Senator Henderson, moved by Senator Askew, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order, there being 32 ayes and 35 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. We now move to general business notice of motion number 101, standing in the name of Senator Shoebridge. Senator Shoebridge. Thanks, President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 101 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Shoebridge. I, I move the motion. Uh, thank you. Uh, Senator Chisholm? I seek leave to make a short statement. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute, Senator McKim. Uh, Senator <laughs> Chisholm? Uh, the government will not be supporting this motion today. The subject matter for this order of production of documents covers matters that could prejudice Commonwealth state relations and international relations. The Commonwealth supported the recent visit by the UN Subcommittee on the Prevention of Torture and makes significant efforts to facilitate the Committee's access to places of detention. We encourage the Subcommittee to resume its visit and will continue making efforts to that end. Thank you, uh, Senator Chisholm. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 101, standing in the name of Senator Shoebridge, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. Aye. Ayes have it. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 101, standing in the name of Senator Shoebridge, be, agree uh, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I, and I appoint uh, Senator McKim as teller for the ayes and Senator Askew as teller for the noes.
order, there being 15 ayes and 45 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I now move to government business number one, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher. Senator Gallagher. I seek uh, leave to amend government business notice of motion number one and number two uh, relating to the days of meetings for 2023 and estimates hearings before asking that it be taken as formal. Is leave granted? Yes. Leave is granted. Thank you. Well, thank you. Minister. I amend the motion as uh, circulated and ask that it be taken as formal. So the question is, the, can, uh, I, can I talk to this? Can I understand I the motion this? has been circulated. No one's indicating it hasn't. So um, I'm going to put the amended motion. Uh, ask that taken that it be uh, that the amended motion be taken as a formal motion. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Minister. Uh, thank you. I move the motion as amended. Senator Birmingham. Once I've moved it to to make a short contribution. Yes. So I just seeking leave for a one-minute statement, or well, I just want to make a few okay. remarks if sure. with leave of the yep. Senate, uh, just to explain the changes um, that we've made. And I thank colleagues um, for discussing the Senate program and the estimates hearing. Um, we have been working um, with senators to uh, tweak uh, the the program that was um, circulated uh, constructively, as Senator, as Senator Chisholm said. The original, um, program, the, orig Order. the original program did not have estimates in February as there had not been, as there had not been a MIEFO um, since the budget. The budget served as the MIEFO. The estimates hearings have been conducted. In fact, they're still underway. Um, and so the next scheduled estimates would be after the budget. However, we have responded to the feedback from the Senate that they would like um, estimates in February. Uh, the government will agree to that. So one of the amendments is to have the order. One of the order. One of the amendments is to have the week of the 13th of February to the Friday the 17th of February removed as a sitting week and inserted as estimates. And I'd like to thank Sarah Hanson Young uh, and uh, her Senator Hanson Young. Sorry, Senator Senator Hanson Young for uh, discussions about how to accommodate um, the wishes of the Senate for an extra sitting um, extra e estimates week. Uh, there's a further amendment which would move. Um, the June sittings up by a week, and also to remove the if required out of that final sitting week in December. I thank colleagues for constructively engaging where they have, um, and we've been able to respond as much as we can to get a setting program for next week that meets next year that meets everybody's needs, uh, ensures that we can get the business done, and and that we're responding to the, um, the wishes of the Senate for an extra estimates week. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, uh, President. I seek leave to make a few remarks. Uh, yes, I believe leave is granted, Senator Birmingham. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, President. President, uh, imagine the Labor Greens' outrage if a coalition government had sought to axe one week yep. of the traditional four weeks yep. of Senate yes. estimates. Imagine the even greater outrage if this was done, along with other unprecedented changes to the sitting schedule, without any consultation having occurred across the chamber. The outrage would have been off the Richter scale from Labor and the Greens. And so whilst we've seen in question time yesterday and today uh, Senator Wong show a level of outrage at being questioned over the sitting schedule, can I welcome, can I welcome this tweak as the manager of government business has described it to the government's program? Perhaps more than a tweak, let me welcome this backflip and capitulation by the government to reinstate the four weeks of order, Senate estimates. Order. They should never have sought to axe it. The attempt to axe a week of Senate Senator estimates Birmingham, could was you clearly. Your seat, please, Senator Wish Wilson. The point of order, President, was the clock not running? Um, uh, could because, we set a time uh, for this, if please? If you were listening, Senator Wish Wilson, uh, 
Senator Birmingham was given leave to make a few short remarks. Senator Birmingham. To wrap up. You, you love transparency. Senator Birmingham. You love transparency. Thanks, sir. Uh, thank, thanks, President. This attempt to axe a week was clearly an attempt by the government to take an axe to the conventional transparency and accountability processes and procedures of the Senate. It was extraordinary to see the Greens also play patsy to this attempt uh, to erode Senate accountability, but I do thank all six crossbench senators for standing firm with the coalition in support of Senate conventions, and I acknowledge and welcome the government's backflip and with that indicate that the opposition will not be proceeding with the amendment circulated in Thank my you, name. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Hanson-Young. Thank you, Madam uh, President. I just seek to make a few, a few short remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator uh, Hanson-Young. Thank you. Um, I would like to uh, say that the Greens are happy with the amendments as circulated. Uh, we are pleased to see estimates back in, in February. We are pleased to see more sitting days than there has been in this place for a very, very long time. Under the last government, all they did was Order. cut, cut, cut. And so what we've done is put, put, put them back in. That is what this sitting calendar will look like for next year. I think I look forward. I look forward to working with everyone on all sides to make this parliament as effective as possible. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Uh, I'm going to put the motion. So, Senator David Pocock. President, I seek leave to make a, a very short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator Pocock. I, I thank the government for the. Uh, extra week of estimates, but would, would like to draw to the attention of the government the fact that there are a number of senators in this place, uh, 12 in fact from the great state of Western Australia, and in moving towards a more family-friendly parliament, Fridays uh, do cut into their, their weekends. I think something to consider. No one's complaining about working more, but I would like that to be considered. Thank you, Senator Pocock. I'm order. Thank you. Order. I'm going to put the question. So the question is order. Order, senators. Uh, just a moment, Senator Gallagher. Order on my left. Minister. I seek leave to just make two additional quick points that have come up. Well, one, one you'll leave want. Granted. Uh, Leave is granted. So the first one, which thank you, um, colleagues. I'm sorry to do this again, but the first one was a referral to procedure committee for the structure of the Fridays, um, which um, Senator Rustin and others had requested. So I've signed that letter. That's done. Uh, just to let you know, so we'll have discussions about the routine of business for the day. On the second point, which was raised by Senator Pocock on the Fridays, acknowledging um, issues have been raised. In Set the Standard, it wasn't just around family friendly, it was also around hours of work. And by having an extra working day, we are hopeful that we can reduce the requirement for senators to work 16 to 20 hour days and sit extended hours, sit extended hours which Order. has directly Order. contributed to a poor workplace culture for staff, which we are trying to address. Thank you, uh, Minister. Order. Order, Senator Davey. Senator Davey. I remind senators that this question was well ventilated at question time to the point that the whole chamber was out of order. I'm asking for quiet now to put the motion. So the question is that the motions one and two, which have been joined and amended uh, by Senator Gallagher, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against. I believe the ayes have it. We will now move to uh, business of the. Oh, beg your pardon, Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Madam um, President. I seek leave for general business order of the day number three relating to the establishment of a select committee on Australia's disaster resilience to be considered immediately. The Whips have agreed that this item can be brought on for consideration at this time, with a question being put without any further debate. The motion has been, has been recirculated. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Lambie. Uh, I, move, I, I, move the, uh, I move the motion. Thank you. So the question is that the motion as circulated by Senator Lambie 
be agreed to. Those of that opinion, Senator Davey? Sorry, I seek leave. I was waiting for the government. I seek leave to make a short statement. On the on, yes. On Senator on Lambie's, Senator Lambie's, yes. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator Davey. One minute. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, given the current flood circumstances across much of the eastern seaboard, coupled with lessons learnt from the Black Summer bushfires and the March 2022 Lismore floods, it is timely to review existing call-out procedures and demands on the ADF and other volunteer organisations with a view to ensuring Australia develop a best practice humanitarian assistance and disaster relief model that is efficient and consistent and does not undermine core ADF capabilities. Thank you, Senator Davies. So the question is that the uh, motion is put by Senator Lambie um, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Minister Gallagher. So I'm sorry, I seek leave to move a motion to provide for consideration of formal motions tomorrow in the constructive, consultative way that we are seeking to work with the Chamber. They were inadvertently omitted from the changed um, routine of business for tomorrow, and so this motion would reinsert, reinsert it. Uh, is leave agreed? Yes, leave is agreed. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Move that, I move that the order of 29 November 2022, relating to the routine of business for Thursday, the 1st of September, uh, 1st of December 2022, be amended to allow formal motions to take place after a report from the Selection of Bills Committee has been considered. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. So we now, uh, I'm now going to put business or ask Senator Hanson to speak, uh, move business of the Senate number three, standing in her name. Thank Senator you, Hanson. Thank you, Madam President. I ask that um, business of the Senate notice of motion number three be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Hanson. I move the motion. Uh, Senator Rice? I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Uh, I believe leave is granted for one minute, Senator Rice. Thank you. The Greens will not be supporting this referral. First up, I want trans and gender diverse people, especially young people, to know that we see you, we hear you, and you are loved, and you deserve to feel safe and supported. Instead, Senator Hanson is using you as a political football to manufacture outrage. The Royal Australian College of Physicians gave advice in 2020 about whether there was a need for an inquiry into the care and treatment of trans and gender diverse children and young people. They found that a national inquiry would only harm vulnerable young people. They supported the current guidelines for care and found that limiting health care for such a vulnerable group would be unethical and further that gender affirming health care for trans and gender diverse young people should be a national priority. So no, we do not need such a Senate inquiry. So the question is that uh, business of the Senate number three, standing in the name of Senator Hanson, be taken as a formal oh, oh, sorry, uh, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Yes, it
lock the doors. So the question is that business of the Senate notice of motion number three, standing in the name of Senator Hanson's name, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the left to the um, the nose of the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the eyes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the nose. Order. There being 21 ayes and 39 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. That concludes our formal business, Senators. <clears throat> I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents. The documents are listed on page four of today's order of business. I'm waiting for someone to be seeking the call. I'm now moving on to the tabling and consideration of committee reports, and I'll move our Senator Urquhart. And on behalf of the Chair of the Education and Employment Legislation Committee, Senator Sheldon, I present additional information received by the committee on its inquiry into provisions of the Fair Work Legislation Amendment Secure Jobs Better Pay Deal at Better Pay Bill 2022. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. Uh, I present Delegated Legislation Monitor 9 of 2022 of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of De Delegated Legislation, together with ministerial correspondence relating to the report, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Urquhart be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Are you seeking to speak? Sure. Thank you. The tabling of the Senate Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation's Delegated Legislation Monitor No. 9 of 2022. This monitor reports on the committee's consideration of 50 legislative instruments registered between uh, the 8th and 21st of October 2022. It also details the committee's ongoing consideration of instruments registered in previous periods and the instruments of which it has decided to conclude its examination. 
I would first like to highlight the committee's scrutiny of the financial sector reform Hain Royal Commission report response, Hawking of Financial Products Regulations 2021. This uh, instrument amends the corporation's reg regulations to create exemptions to the pro prohibition of a hawking financial products set out in the Corporations Act. The committee engaged extensively with the former Treasurer regarding its concerns about parliamentary oversight in this instrument. The committee raised the, uh, concerns that this instrument made by the executive creates exemptions to the primary law on an ongoing basis, as it is also exempt from the sunsetting regime. It is the committee's view that the modifications to or exemptions from primary law should be set out in the primary law itself. When these measures are in delegated legislation, the committee expects they will be time limited to ensure frequent parliamentary oversight. This would also provide the executive with the ability to assess whether the measures remain appropriate and necessary. The committee raised its concerns about parliamentary oversight with the former Treasurer on four occasions without resolution. The committee continued to raise the matter, the matter with the new Assistant tre Treasurer. I am pleased to report that yesterday the committee received an undertaking from the Assistant Treasurer that the instrument will be amended so that it ceases to operate within three years. This will facilitate greater parliamentary oversight of these measures. I thank the Assistant Treasurer and officials from the department for their constructive engagement with the committee. The committee has now concluded its consideration of this long-standing matter. The second matter I would like to draw to the Chamber's attention is uh, to is the anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing rules amendment instrument 2021. This instrument also contains measures which insert an ongoing exemption from primary legislation. The committee first raised its concerns with the former Minister for Home Affairs on two occasions, but in, unfortunately the issue was not resolved. The, com the committee raised the matter with the Attorney General, the new Attorney General, requesting that the measures either be moved into the primary legislation or at a minimum be time limited to five years to facilit facilitate greater parliamentary scrutiny. I'm pleased to advise that on the 18th of November the Attorney uh, the General undertook to amend the instrument so that the exemptions it inserts cease within five years of commencement. He also indicated that the exemptions may be revisited to determine if they are still necessary. On this basis, the committee was able to conclude its consideration of this instrument, and I thank the Attorney General for his continued engagement with the committee. The committee will continue to carefully scrutinise delegated legislation, which contains ongoing measures that modify or create exemptions to primary legislation, noting that the parliamentary oversight is a key consideration for the committee under the standing orders. With these comments, I commend the committee's delegated legislation, Monitor Number 9 of 2022, to the Senate. The question is: Does the Senate take? Well, does the Senate take note? Those who say yes, say aye. Those who say no, the ayes have it. Senator Askew. So, on behalf of Senator Dean Smith, the chair of the committee, I present Scrutiny Digest 8 of 2022 of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. So the question is that the Senate take note. Those that say yes, say aye. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. Are there any ministerial statements? Senator Wong. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. On behalf of the Prime Minister, I table the annual report on closing the gap and accompanying ministerial statement, and I seek leave to make a very brief statement relating to the documents. Is leave granted? Uh, I thank the Senate, and I first acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we gather and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, and I pay tribute to the First Nations parliamentarians here in the chamber for their leadership and contribution. And I will speak but briefly, as Senator Dodson and Senator McCarthy will speak for the government today, uh, because it is important that First, Nation, First Nations parliamentarians have their voice and perspective heard and that we all listen. I want to make some brief points. Whilst the Closing the Gap report shows there has been some progress, on the majority of measures progress has slow, been slow and even gone backwards. This government takes responsibility for where we go from here and for doing better. As the Prime Minister said today, 
So-called solutions conceived in Canberra and imposed on communities without consultation are more likely than not to end in an expensive, ineffective, even counterproductive failure. But when First Nations people have a genuine say in policy design and an empowered role in service delivery, the results are remarkable. The Albanese government is a government that listens to people with experience, with earned knowledge of kinship and country, of culture and community. And it is this which underlines our commitment to the full implementation of the Uluru Statement from the Heart, including a constitutionally enshrined voice to parliament, to empower First Nations people to take control of their own lives, not have policies and laws dictated to them by politicians. The voice is about enabling a better future, a future to, that in, in which the lives of Indigenous people in the community are improved, to achieve better outcomes in health, in education, in housing, and to close the gap. And that is why we believe it is so important for the call from First Nations to be heard and to have a voice is answered by all Australians. Senator Johnson. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. President uh, I move to take note of the uh, uh, National Agreement on Closing the Gap, the annual report. Uh, the first Commonwealth Government's annual report under the National Agreement on Closing the Gap shows we have a lot of work to do. While there has been some progress, the previous government's efforts over the last decade in government has been very ineffectual. Please, the progress across most uh, socio-economic outcomes for those areas have stalled, while the national agreement and the partnership with the, Co the Coalition of Peaks <coughs> provides a uh, helpful architecture the previous government's implementation leaves much to be desired. <clears throat> Since coming into government just six months ago, our government has demonstrated our commitment to improving outcomes for First Nations peoples. In the October 2022 budget, we have locked in significant investments across portfolios seeking to address these disproportionate outcomes. We are investing in First Nations health workers, vital health infrastructure and community-led uh, justice reinvestment initiatives. In all of these commitments, we are working with First Nations peoples. This concept of working with First Nations peoples to make decisions about policies and programs so that they are more effective is not new. I and many other leaders uh, have been talking about this for decades. It is grounded in the evidence. Outcomes for our people are simply better when we have a say, have choice and make decisions about our lives. The National Agreement provides one piece of architecture to improve outcomes, and my colleagues uh, will work with, the, with this framework to continue important progress across the socio-economic areas. But to achieve better outcomes after a decade of stagnation, we must fundamentally change how governments work with First Nations peoples. We cannot allow these outcomes to continue in this way. That is only, uh, uh, that is only a shame on governments for failing to listen to First Nations communities. To make meaningful and lasting change and progress, it requires systemic and structural transformation of how we are going to go about it on all sides of government for, for, for so long. And the voice to the parliament and to the government will do exactly that. Our government is steadfast in the commitment to the full implementation of the Uluru Statement from the Heart because we know that it will lead to better outcomes for First Nation communities. That very statement calls for constitutional reform through a voice so that the First Nations children can flourish. The voice will give our people a real opportunity to advise Parliament and the government on how to do things for the better of our people. After 250 years, that's not such a bad idea. The voice to Parliament will be a significant shift for our nation, a structural change that will lead to better outcomes for our people and all Australians. To take the two concepts of closing the gap 
and the voice to parliament is mutually exclusive is flawed and misses the point. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, as we do at the commencement of every day of sittings, uh, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners uh, of the land on which we meet and pay respect to elders past, present and emerging as part of this recognition of the Closing the Gap statement. Now, the 2022 Closing the Gap report is the first since the launch under the previous coalition government of the 2020 National Agreement and the Closing the Gap implementation plan released just over 12 months ago. The new implementation plan provides new targets established in genuine partnership with First Nations peoples, including notably the Coalition of the Peaks, who I again thank for their detailed work through that process. It also includes state and territory governments who play a critical role in delivering outcomes in Indigenous communities right across Australia. The intent of the changes that were made to the Closing the Gap targets and the process of measuring them was to ensure that enhanced granularity uh, of programs and targets to close the gap across areas of health, of education, of life expectancy, of the range of different measures applied were even more measurable, even more effectively verifiable, so that we are able to ensure better progress of policies against those targets. When the former Prime Minister released the plan last year, he included $1 billion in new measures across a range of Commonwealth programs and strategies to help to ensure that the actions across all areas of national government work towards closing the gap and achieving what we all seek, to improve the lives and circumstances of our first Australians. To see young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children having the same health, education and employment opportunities as anyone else in Australia, so that they too can share the same hopes, the same aspirations for their own future and that of their families. I'm pleased that we see today the first Closing the Gap report to measure against the new priorities and the new more granular targets, which reflect very genuinely the input from First Australians to establish those targets and priorities. Sadly, though, yet again we have to acknowledge that there is still much more to do. In too many areas, we are still not making progress or even going backwards. School readiness, adult incarceration rates, suicide rates, all statistics that paint a bleak and continually concerning picture. They must provide a clarion call to all of us across the Australian Parliament and in state and territory parliaments to redouble our collective efforts. But we should also not overlook improvement where it is being achieved. To actually highlight improvements is to try to enhance confidence in the processes and the policies applied by governments to seek to close the gap. Healthier birth weights, more children enrolled in preschool, fewer young people in detention, these are important steps forward. And we should celebrate those steps, seek to redouble progress on them, but make sure in doing so we say to Australians we can make a difference, we can make progress when we work together and apply those policies. In acknowledging those gains, I pay tribute to those who work every day with individuals and across communities, from inner cities, suburbs, through to the remotest parts of our country, to deliver the outcomes that the policy actions of governments seek to achieve. I reaffirm to the Senate the commitment made by the Leader of the Opposition and the Shadow Minister for Indigenous Affairs in the House to work with the government on addressing the challenge to truly close the gap. Together we must continue to act to ensure specific and detailed policies deliver, are delivered to close the many gaps that continue to exist. That may mean sometimes difficult conversations, may mean sometimes doing things that do not necessarily fit neatly into our own party's policy agendas. After many decades of efforts by parties of both sides when in government, we know that closing the gap has no simple answer, no easy solutions. That is why we must persevere, persist and, where necessary, adapt policies to make sure that pro progress is made and improved. If in the years to come we can stand here, but more importantly than standing here, stand alongside Indigenous Australians acknowledging a list of improvements against the Closing the Gap targets, but more importantly a list of improvements in their lives, their children's and grandchildren's lives, 
then that will have been effort well worthwhile. Senator Waters. As Acting Deputy President, as Greens leader in the Senate, I pay respects to the First Nations owners of this land over which sovereignty was never ceded. So this is, it was and it will always be Aboriginal land. And I acknowledge and pay respect to all First Nations members of this parliament. I rise to take note of the deeply disappointing results of the annual Close the Gap report. We are not closing the gap anywhere near fast enough and on many indicators have shamefully gone backwards. We know and acknowledge that the injustices we see documented in the Closing the Gap report are symptoms of colonisation. First Nations people are wearing the consequences of racist decisions successive governments in this country have made. It is on all Australians, but especially those of us in this chamber, to right the wrongs that started with invasion and absence of treaty and continue through child removal, incarceration and suicide. The rate of First Nations child removal is at an all-time high. Survivors of the stolen generation are now witnessing a new generation of First Nations children being stolen from their families and communities. The United Nations Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide defines forcibly transferring children of the group to another group as an act of genocide. Implementing the recommendations from the Bringing Them Home report will keep First Nations kids with First Nations families. These are self-determined solutions that successive governments have ignored for 25 years. Aggressive policing results in too many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people being locked up in prisons that do not have independent oversight to safeguard their human rights. Systemic racism in our policing and legal system is compounded by the low age of criminal responsibility, exposing kids as young as 10 to the trauma of prison and a criminal record. 65 per cent of children in prison across Australia are First Nations kids. Our minimum age of criminal responsibility is out of line with international jurisdictions and out of line with our human rights obligations. We must urgently raise the age to at least 14 years old. Around 40 per cent of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody's recommendations are about social factors—things like education, health, housing. Access to basic human rights will stop First Nations people from going to prison in the first place. Successive governments have ignored this advice for 31 years. If the Albanese government is committed to hearing and acting on advice from First Nations people, they will implement all of the recommendations from the Bringing Them Home report and the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody and listen to calls from the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child to raise the age of criminal responsibility. This is urgent and it's overdue. First Nations people are resorting to self-harm because they cannot see a future for themselves in this system. The continuing high rate of suicide shows that structural racism and the policies made for First Nations people but not by them is killing First Nations people. Often they don't have access to their land, water, sacred sites or even their own children. This is up to us to change. We've inherited a centuries-old regime, written entirely by white men, that has not undertaken any fundamental change since colonisation. We know the confronting truth. The basis of the Australian nation was terra nullius and the idea that First Nations people didn't need human rights or decision-making power because they were subhuman. We have an opportunity to do things differently in this country. A national grassroots treaty process will close the gap by restoring First Nations people's rights to make decisions for themselves. We know that self-determined solutions work because Aboriginal people know what's best for Aboriginal communities. Everyone thrives when they are free to set their own course. On this, there must be a standalone national plan to end violence against First Nations women and children that is developed, delivered and evaluated by First Nations women and community-controlled organisations. I'm pleased that work on this has begun. Adequate funding must be allocated to get it done. Despite ongoing injustice, First Nations people are strong and capable. A national treaty process puts First Nations people in the driver's seat when it comes to making decisions about their own country, community and culture. We are one of the only Commonwealth countries that doesn't have a treaty with First Nations people. It was promised by Bob Hawke's Labor government in the 80s. First Nations elders and activists have marched for it for decades. In this term of government, the Greens will work for progress on truth, treaty and voice to meaningfully close the gap. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. And I um, rise as leader of the National Party in the Senate 
to also take note of the closing the gap statement and to put our um, views on how that is proceeding or as the report currently as it has been tabled aren't proceeding as quickly as swiftly um, as we would like, but more importantly, as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders need to occur in this country. Um, today is a day uh, where each time this report is tabled, we take stock as a collective group of national leaders um, on how we can actually better work together to uh, improve the life outcomes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. It's un underpinned by the belief that when Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have a genuine say in the design and delivery of policies, programs and services that affect them, uh, better life outcomes are achieved. And all Australian governments are committed to working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, their communities, organisations and businesses to help achieve better outcomes. Uh, but today, you know, we have to acknowledge that four out of 18 means 12 out of 18 aren't going in the right direction. And so we all need to put our shoulder harder into that wheel to work better with state and territory governments, with um, local governments and with Aboriginal uh, and Torres Strait Islander peak organisations so that the policies thought of and um, designed hit the ground in those communities and really change the dial. Uh, in terms of changes that we made uh, whilst we were in government, we did uh, took practical steps by creating the Joint Ministerial Council, um, led by the National Coalition of Peaks, to inform the work with government and develop the evolving target areas, which was so um, critical to changing the way we looked at um, achieving the closing the gap targets. In order to maintain the momentum on the national agreement's transformative agenda, we've got to foster and enhance those partnership principles. As the party uh, of rural and regional Australia, if you look at uh, the latest um, statistics from the ABS, those, the 20 electorates that have the most Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in them as a proportion of um, population are all in rural and regional Australia, all 20 of them. Um, Lingiari, 40 per cent. Parks represented, the second one, Parks, represented by Mark Colton in the other place, 16 per cent. Mark Colton, a National Party MP, represents more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders than he does farmers. And so making sure that we constructively work with whoever's in government and whoever we're in partnership at the state government level is critical for changing the dial for the people we represent as the party of rural and regional Australia. We've got to um, look at the education piece. We've got to get kids into school. We've got to get great teachers into schools in remote areas um, to really back those young people's future opportunities in. You know, uh, creating supply nation and the procurement policy whilst we're in government with $5.3 billion of money that went into tens of thousands of contracts with small businesses uh, who partnered with local Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders um, in, in great jobs right across the country was a way to really kind of take a creative um, gambit, if you like. Um, to change the dial, and it did. And I'd like to pay tribute to the former minister in this space, um, Nigel Scullion, and thank him for that work. I look forward to working however we can with the current government constructively to close the gap over their time uh, on the Treasury be benches, and we've all got to do better. There's no other way to say it. Senator Hanson. I rise to respond to the closing of the gap report. This is the first report since the establishment of the new national agreement on closing the gap, but once again it makes for disappointing and frustrating reading. I acknowledge some targets are on track, more babies born at a healthy weight and more kids enrolled in preschool. This is very welcome news. However, many targets are not on track and in some areas the gap has widened. 
These include incarceration rates, children in and out of home care, getting children school ready and, tragically, suicide rates. One Nation supports the new approach in the National Agreement on Closing the Gap in Principle primarily because there was some focus on empowering Indigenous Australians to take equal responsibility for its outcomes. We have hoped this approach will chip away at the insidious culture of victimhood unjustly imposed on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. We concede it is early days, but you will forgive my cynicism at the ultimate impact of this new approach considering the uncounted billions of dollars thrown at these issues for many years with little positive effect. Regardless, closing the gaps is an urgent priority for this entire nation. It is appalling that any defined demographic of Australians is so obviously disadvantaged. One Nation looks forward to a future when this disadvantage has been overcome, when we are no longer divided or separated by race in any respect, and when every individual Australian's opportunities and prospects are no longer defined by race. We will never close the gaps as long as we continue to indulge the identity politics of racial division and separatism. This is why it is critical that all Australian people unite to stand against it, and they can do so by voting no in the coming referendum on the proposed voice to parliament. Given the urgency to close the gaps, it is only fair to question why the Albanese government is prioritising such an expensive and divisive proposal, especially considering there is absolutely no compelling evidence the voice will help to close the gap. It is only fair to question if the Albanese government is ignoring a growing chorus of Australian voices, including prominent Indigenous voices, opposing the voice to parliament. It is only fair to question why the Prime Minister did not apparently seek legal advice before proposing his amendment to the Constitution. This draft amendment is of tremendous concern for the future governance of Australia because it threatens to unleash a wave of repeated constitutional crises. Constitutional legal minds much finer than those of Anthony Albanese or Mark Dreyfus have for months been warning the Prime Minister's draft amendment is absolutely ripe for this potential. As we have seen unfolding this week, this debate is not only causing further division between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians, it is dividing Indigenous Australia itself. Noel Pearson has been at the forefront of the yes cause, peddling the transparent lie the voice is necessary because Indigenous Australians are not recognised in their country. This week he has bullied and attacked Senator Price for her stance on the voice, accusing her of being used to punch down on other Aboriginals. I was disgusted, but not especially surprised, by this deeply personal and racist attack on a woman who has articulated practical and sensible concerns about the voice. Mr Pearson would do well to consider that Senator Price's election to the Senate shows our constitution and system of government are no barriers to Indigenous representation. And the Prime Minister would do well to pay close attention to the fracturing of the Australian electorate and the deep divisions being created by this per proposal to give greater political franchise to a minority of Australians based solely on race. One Nation proudly stands against enshrining racial exceptionalism in the founding document of Australia, and we will be campaigning strongly for the no vote so that Australia can move forward towards together, united as one people and one nation, under one flag. Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak uh, uh, to the report tabled today uh, in 2022. Uh, clearly deeply frustrating, uh, as we've heard uh, certainly uh, Minister Burney speak and also my colleague Senator Dodson, deeply frustrating. But I want to use this time, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, to reach out to those people across this country who do so much each and every single day 
in all of these areas that we have the targets for closing the gap. Let's talk about our children. To the woman who intervened in the life of her own son and his five children and knew that if she didn't step in uh, to take those children herself, then they too would be removed into the care of the system that so many First Nations people dread, the system of welfare and the system that removes children that we've seen with stolen generations and redress now, a system that still drives a lot of fear in the hearts of many mothers. To the woman who stepped into that intervention and worked with her other son to take those five children and to try and care for them. She still struggles and her story is emulated across the country, but she did it because she did not want uh, her grandchildren to be part of these statistics. To the grandmother who knew that her grandbabies were with foster carers and those foster carers in the community had raised those babies for about three or four years. And the foster carers now, after nearly five years, want to return to where they come from after living in the community and teaching in the community and caring for so many children there. And they've asked to be able to take those children so that they can care for them interstate. And so the, the grandmothers had a, a meeting and a gathering to talk about well, what does this mean? What does this mean for these children and the kinship care? How will they still understand culture? How will they still understand their language and know that they are so deeply loved but just cannot be cared for? That was an important step in the self-determination of those grandmothers who had known that this was going to be the best way for their grandbabies so that those children will come back and forwards knowing where they come from in an environment of love. To those health workers, health practitioners right across Australia, to many, many of you whom I've met uh, in, in my short time uh, in the ministry as Assistant Minister in Indigenous Health, we have a terrific opportunity to move even harder on improving these statistics. I am ever so conscious that this is the first time I'm speaking to this report from government. I'm ever so conscious that I stand with my colleagues in government <clears throat> to try to improve the lives for First Nations people through closing the gap report. And I do thank the Parliament of Australia for the many, many years that we have had closing the gap. Not because I'm proud of any of the, the reports or the statistics, but because you continually, continuously shine a light on what we know out there in our communities still desperately needs this parliament to never forget, and that is to improve the lives of the most vulnerable. And we fumble about it in our very imperfect ways, but I do believe there is a genuine desire to make sure these statistics lower and lower each year. So as Minister for Indigenous Health, I say to all those in the health sector out there, I am heartened by the fact that we can move now on the renal dialysis units, on the 500 health practitioners that we want to employ in these positions across the country, on the fact that we're going to focus on rheumatic heart disease and really try to eliminate this scourge. And I do hope the next time I stand on my feet I can have something really strong to say. Thank you. Thank you. The question is uh, that the motion put by Senator Dodson now be agreed to. Those who agree say aye. Those who disagree say no. I think the ayes have it.
Minister. Are, are table documents relating to orders for the production of documents concerning unanswered question on notice, superannuation payment disclosure requirements, crypto asset secondary service providers, the special envoy for disaster resilience and the effigy of the sovereign on Australian banknotes? Minister. The President has received letters nominating senators to be members of committees. I call the Minister. I seek leave to move a motion to appoint senators to committees. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that senators be appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. So the question is that those committee memberships be agreed to. Those who agree say aye. Those against say no. I believe the ayes have it. The president has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence. The Aboriginal Grant, Jarvis Bay Territory Amendment, Strengthening Land and, Land and Governance Provisions Bill 2022 and Animal Health Australia and Plant Health Australia Funding Legislation Amendment Bill 2022. Minister. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities and may be taken together and now be read a first time. So the question is that these bills be, now be agreed to. Those who agree say aye. Those who disagree aye. say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. Aboriginal Land Grant Jarvis Bay Territory Amendment Strengthening Land and Governance Provisions Bill 2022, Animal Health Australia and Plant Health Australia Funding Legislation Amendment Bill 2022. Um, Minister. I move that these bills now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that the debate now be adjourned and the bills be listed as separate orders of the day. So the question before the chair is that those bills be agreed to and adjourned for another day. Those who agree say aye. Those who disagree say no. I believe the ayes have it. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Higher Education Support Amendment 2022 Measures No. 1, Bill 2022, for concurrence. Call the Minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. So the question before the Chair is that these bills now be read a first time. Those who agree say aye. Those who disagree say no. I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Higher Education Support Act 2003 and for related purposes. Minister. I table a revised explanatory mem memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in his leave granted. Leave is granted. In accordance with standing order 111, Further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to 6 February 2023. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the ozone protection and synthetic greenhouse gas management reform, closing the hole in the ozone layer bill 2022, and two related bills for concurrence. I call the Minister. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read a first time. So the question is that these bills now uh, be taken together and read a first time. Those who agree say aye. Those who disagree say no. I believe the ayes have it. Clark. Ozone protection and synthetic greenhouse gas management reform closing the hole in the ozone layer bill 2022 
Ozone Protection and Synthetic Greenhouse Gas Import Levy Amendment Bill 2022 and Ozone Protection and Synthetic Greenhouse Gas Manufacture Levy Amendment Bill 2022. Minister. I move that these bills now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. I move that the debate now be adjourned. So the question is that debate now be adjourned. Those who say aye, those who agree say aye, those who disagree say no. I believe the ayes have it, the ayes have it. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House agreed, has agreed to the biosecurity amendment strengthening Biosecurity Bill 2022 without amendment. The President has received a, a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the amendments made by the Senate to the National Anti-Corruption Commission Bill 2022. Clark. Government business order of the day number one, fair work legislation amendment, secure jobs, better pay bill 2022, resumption of debate on the second reading and the amendment moved by Senator O'Sullivan. Well, Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I note how keen you were to uh, take the chair with uh, my speech in uh, continuance and I wore one of your favourite ties for, my, uh, for the occasion. Uh, I would like to talk about some of the specific provisions in this bill and my concern about the drafting of the bill. And bear in mind that this legislation is going to impact on small and medium-sized businesses across this country, many of whom do not have a dedicated human resources function or in-house legal function to give them advice. And we heard during the debate over the last few weeks that the estimates in terms of consultation advisor fees that the government made and as, as provided for in the reg regulation impact statement of $175 an hour are simply underdone, undercooked, not accurate. The reality is small businesses, medium-sized businesses wanting to get legal advice or industrial relations advocacy advice in relation to these measures, which they are going to have to comply with, are looking at a cost just for a junior advisor a junior consultant of in the region of $350 an hour—$350 an hour, at least twice as much as that which the government has estimated in its regulatory impact statement. And that is deeply, deeply concerning. If you're going to change the law, if you are going to change the law and put a cost in position on small and medium-sized businesses, work out what the cost is appropriately. And as has been said by my friend Senator Brockman in the course of this debate, I did exactly the same as Senator Brockman. I rang a, a small business that provides industrial advocacy services in my home state, in Brisbane, and I was told a junior $350 an hour, some are more senior between $400 and $500 an hour. And yet we have a regulatory impact statement which refers to an estimate of $175 an hour, and that is very, very Disappointing, very disappointing. So I want to turn to some of the drafting in the bill, and this is a key clause in this bill in relation to what constitutes a common interest, because it's under this definition that small and medium-sized enterprises may be dragged into an industrial relations dispute. And this is what the definition says. For the purposes of subparagraph 1b Roman 2, examples of common interests, and that's the key definition, common interests, that employers may have include the following: a, a geographical location, b, the nature of the enterprises to which the agreement will relate and the terms and conditions of employment in those enterprises, c, being substantially funded directly or indirectly by the Commonwealth, a state or a territory. And it's up to the Fair Work Commission under the bill to decide on the basis of those criteria as to whether or not there is a common interest. So we then turn to the explanatory memorandum. 
So, for those listening to the debate, the explanatory memorandum is meant to explain what the provisions in the bill actually mean. So then we turn to the explanatory memorandum, and this is, this is what it tells us. Subsection 243.2 would provide examples of common interests that employers may have. This includes the geographical location of the employers, the nature of the enterprises to which the agreement will relate, and the terms and conditions of employment. So the explanatory statement simply restates what's actually in the bill. It doesn't explain anything. It doesn't explain anything. It just restates what's in the bill. So what is, to, what is one to make of the phrase a geographical location? A geographical location. Well, every business in this country is at a geographical location. And putting aside the fact that I guess a, le a location needs to be geographical, I'm not sure what else it can be. What does that mean? Are we talking about businesses which are uh, adjacent to each other or, or uh, in close proximity within uh, a shopping centre, for example? Are we talking about a suburb? Are we talking about a region? So, for example, is Mount Isa uh, considered a geographical location for the purposes of this test? Or would it be northwest Queensland? Or would it be regional Queensland? Or would it be the state of Queensland? What is the actual geographical location we're talking about that triggers this test? There is absolutely no guidance whatsoever as to what this means in practice. Absolutely no guidance to the Fair Work Commission whatsoever as to what this means in practice. And then we turn to the second limb, the nature of the enterprises. And again, as is the case with a geographical location, the explanatory memorandum just regurgitates what's in the bill. It doesn't actually give a definition as to what nature of the enterprises means. Absolutely no guidance whatsoever. So paragraph A, a geographical location. Well, I can tell you every single business in this country is located at a geographical location. So where's that lead us? Where's that lead us? And then the second part, the nature of the enterprises. Again, no explanation as to what that means. So when, then you go to the regulatory impact statement, the famous regulatory impact statement which undercooks the cost of consultants that small businesses and medium-sized businesses are going to have to engage by at least, by at least 50 per cent. And we turn to the regulatory impact statement to see, well, what does this mean? And I go to the case study, which is contained on page 53 of the regulatory impact statement. So this is the case study, right? This is the case study. This is how they think this should work in practice. And this is what it means, case study. This is what it says. Ten medium-sized fish and chip shops with seafood processing plants in Queensland have been decided or been compelled to bargain together in the single interest stream. I'm just going to repeat that. Ten medium-sized fish and chip shops with seafood processing plants. Now, I'm assuming they're not saying that the, each of the ten medium-sized fish and chip shops has its own seafood processing plant. I'm assuming they're not in intending to imply that. I'm assuming that they're intending to imply that each of these ten fish and ship shops sources its seafood from someone external, an external supplier. So our ten medium-sized fish and ship shops with seafood processing plants in Queensland have decided or been compelled, or been compelled, at least the regulatory impact statement is honest in that regard, or been compelled to bargain together in the in the single interest stream. Now, for the life of me, Mr Acting Deputy President, and you are extremely well experienced in terms of industrial relations matters, I cannot see, I cannot see any similarity whatsoever with respect to the industrial relations issues raised in a medium-sized fish and chip shop. This is a retail shop, outward facing, would presumably be more busy during um, hours where people are going to get their fish and chips on the one hand, and a seafood processing plant, which is actually processing seafood which has been caught. Where is the similarity? How in goodness name would our ten proprietors of the medium-sized fish and chip shop sit down with the general managers or owners of the seafood processing plant with the unions and come up with any coherent enterprise agreement? How? 
This is madness. And this is the case study in the regulatory impact statement. Ten medium-sized fish and chip shops getting together with the seafood processing factory. Absolutely. It's, it's hard to fathom. It is hard to fathom. And then we go through the case study and they say, oh, it's fantastic. In their current arrangements, they must enforce four awards to run their business. The seafood processing award, the retail award, the fast food award and the restaurant award. This has led to increased compliance costs. But once they go through this single interest stream of bargaining, they're going to have one enterprise agreement. Seriously? Seriously? How do you sit down and negotiate a meaningful enterprise agreement to cover a retail-facing fish and chip shop and a seafood processing plant? And this is the example we're given in the regulatory impact statement. It's embarrassing. It's absolutely embarrassing. So we look at that example and then we go back to the bill and look at the general comment around the nature of the enterprise, and one is just left. One is just left with the um, unavoidable conclusion that this clause is just so vague and so general that it could be found to adopt, apply to anyone and anything, as long as they're in a, some sort of geographical proximity. And the people who drafted the regulatory impact statement, I, I, don't, I don't want to criticise them. I'm sure they've done their best under very difficult circumstances. This is the sort of example they're giving us. A seafood processing plant, a factory, to put it another way, a factory entering into an enterprise agreement with, which would cover retail workers in a fish and chip shop? Seriously? Seriously? I've never even heard such a thing. I'd love to know if there is any example of that being done anywhere. There's a good reason why there are different awards that apply to restaurants, retail, fast food and the seafood processing plant. The reason why you have different awards is because the context, the facts and circumstances with respect to the place of work, occupational health and safety standards, presumably rosters, all sorts of issues are so materially different between those businesses. It is impossible to fathom how those sorts of medium and small businesses would come together and negotiate a meaningful enterprise agreement. But this is the case study. This is the case study that the government holds up. And uh, it, it is clear to me, Mr Acting Deputy President, that insufficient work and time has been put into the preparation of this legislation. And I fear the consequences for our economy. Thanks, Senator Scar. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. To be honest, I've been consistent in wanting this bill to be debated next year. It's not a surprise I've said I've got issues with it, mostly around the multi-employer bargaining because we just don't know how this will impact small to medium businesses. We haven't had the time to complete our due diligence and consult, listen and understand the real world impacts. It's all well, it's all well here in Canberra to debate and make changes, but even with the changes, we don't know how it will actually work. How are we supposed to get across all of this We've been getting amendments after amendment after amendment, and some and some we've just got a few hours ago, and some we've just got a few hours ago. I'm not even convinced anyone can really predict how the changes this bill will impact productivity and actually result in pay rises. I tell you one thing, though: no one is getting a pay rise before Christmas. Let's make sure that's quite clear. At the beginning of this week, this bill will still sub was still subject to further Senate inquiry because we're all trying to get across all the details. This bill is 250 pages long. The bill was only introduced on the 27th of October 2022, and just a month later it's being rammed through the Senate. Yes, I get the Labor Party is dead keen to get wages moving after wage segmentation for close to a decade. Aussies know and understand and voted on reducing the wage gap, stopping wage theft and better wages. They didn't vote at the election to support single interest multi employer bargaining. It's a surprise, and just how it will bite in the real world is terribly unclear. Businesses are concerned it may lead to more strikes, but of course we don't know. And you know what? Labor can't guarantee that either. What is a single interest? Location, the rules of the industry, or the type of work? The fact we still need to ask this question shows how rushed this process has been. The amendments agreed between Senator Pocock and Labor still doesn't solve the issue. It just adds further exemptions from who is caught. 
However, here we are on the 11th hour. The deal was done apparently on Saturday night, and we still don't have the amendments. Where's the amendments? Where are the amendments? If you're a small business of 15 to 20 employees, you're not caught. And for businesses with less than 50 employees, the union has to justify why the business should be included in multi-employer bargaining. Not feeling comfortable. Provided you're reasonably compa comparable. I mean, seriously, what does that mean? What does comparable mean? Oh, I tell you, no wonder your amendments are taking so long. These last-minute changes haven't allowed any of us the time needed to raise awareness with business, with business and work out how this amended bill will impact them. It is unclear how it will address the wage crisis and even how quickly, if they happen, pay rises will come, especially to reach the pockets of hard-working Aussies. The costs of living are continue to increase. It seems every day everything gets more and more expensive. Since May 2022, there's been seven interest rates in a row. This means the average home loan of $500,000 has now gone up by $760 a month. And the interest rate, this is what you'll get before Christmas, not a rate rise, you're going to get an interest rate just before Christmas. That's what you can expect. And it's all well and good for Mr Lowe, the RBA governor, to apologise to Aussie, Aussie homeowners after he said interest rates were unlikely to rise before 2024. God help all our children out there who have done the right thing, thinking they were investing in their first house, that are more than likely, if they keep going up, uh, being able to um, maintain that and hold them. I see a massive crisis coming on there. And a fat load that's going to do in helping all those struggling with meeting, with meeting their mortgage repayments. And it's not just homeowners feeling it. Renters are also having to tighten their belts because you raise interest rates. That means higher mortgages. Common sense prevail. It means higher rents. And to add to that, Mr Lowe then said that higher wages will mean higher inflation. This means higher gas, petrol and food prices. The high gas prices are a result of bad Liberal government policy and absolute failure to give Australians fair access to a product they already own. There is no way that Australians should be paying the sky-high gas rockets that we are. And it's all because the Liberal government and Labor failed to protect the Australian market and let greedy companies export most of our gas so they could fill their pockets with huge profits. And then profit even more by making Australians pay pay inflated spot market prices for their own gas. I tell you, this country is in a world of hurt, and it's only just the beginning. And even if wages do rise, paychecks won't increase until next year, and no one can say by how much. So even after this bill pa passes, wages are unlikely to increase even enough to cover all these hikes in the cost of living so that Aussies are really better off and getting ahead. I support higher wages. Most people in Australia you do, why wouldn't they? But it's got to be paid for by business. So they matter here as well. Can't help if your shop, shop is shut and no one's getting a wage at all. And they're really worried about this bill as well, and so they should be. I want to get wages moving for nurses and aged care workers and childcare workers. The government could have, could have done that the day they got into power. That's what you should have been hitting. That's what you should have been doing. And they could do it today, but they didn't and they won't. The government has been sneaky and dishonest. And they said they needed this bill to do that, and they didn't. They held the wages of low-paid workers back, and they did it on purpose. They're doing a whole lot of things with this bill. They, they haven't properly examined, explained to us, and that's why I've circulated amendments to take these parts out. The government can bring these parts of the bill back next year, once we've had time to consider the impacts proper, properly. And I'm not going to wear the responsibility of make, making the mistakes of this one. The government of the day can do that, but God help you, if this time next year people are in absolute crisis, they're not getting their pay rises. There is union strikes all over this country because I, I say this to you. That will leave you about a year and a half out of an election, and I don't see that cleaning up very quickly. 
I don't believe you've got this right. I believe there is a lot of union power in this. It's all about political donations, making sure they keep feeding the piggy bank of the union party, or should I say the Labor Party, because that is where we're at. I look forward to standing here next year and holding this Senate back day after day and absolutely, absolutely plummeting you people over there about the destruction that you have done to this country, because that is where we are heading. And by the way, we still have amendments that we have not seen. Once again, there is still more to come. We are rushing through. This is huge impact on this country. It is going to be a huge impact on this country. And I can tell you now, the way we're all looking at it, most people out there that have got some common sense, they know exactly where we're going. We're heading down the gurgler. You've got a problem here, and it's called gas and energy prices. That's your first one. You've got, ho you've got home loans going up through the roof where our younger kids that did, thought they were doing the right thing are going to go under. That's where we're at. And if you think an extra seven or eight bucks a week, if you get that far by next year, is going to assist, I tell you what, you are living in denial. You are living on another planet. But the way that you have rushed this through, it just blows me away. I thought you were going to be a different government to the last one. But seriously, we're getting six months in. Six months in, we're in, and I tell you, we're nearly going back to the, the good old days of the last nine years. So good luck to you. I look forward to standing up here at this time next year and watching you all sitting there in silence on the government side, because that is what is going to happen and trying to explain yourselves. Anyway, I look forward to the committee. I have quite a lot of questions because, once again, we had limited time to ask them. So I look forward to what the government of the day is going to say that the questions that never got answered because we didn't have enough time to get them answered and didn't just four days of inquiry, seriously? Four, actually four, four days and two hours. That's what we got on this bill. I, did, I cannot believe that you haven't learnt from the past what happens when you rush through bills. We watched it for nine years. We watched it. And this is where we're sitting today and you're following exactly the same example. Seriously, you've actually learnt nothing. And if you can't see the future, if you can't see the future of where this is all going, anybody with common sense can see where we're going to be next year. You seriously should not be the government. Senator Henderson. Uh, Acting Deputy President, thank you very much. I rise to speak on the Fair Work Legislation Amendment, Secure Jobs, Better Pay Bill 2022. Uh, Acting Deputy President, this bill should be called the Fair Work Legislation Amendment Union Workplace Takeover Bill, because that's exactly what this is. One of the most extreme elements of the bill gives unions the right to strike under expanded multi-employer bargaining streams, which constitute an early Christmas present for union bosses and the broader union movement. This will inevitably lead to more strikes across the nation. Labor's so-called handbrake on industrial action, which in reality is like being hit by a piece of wet lettuce, the requirement that employers and unions must enter into compulsory conciliation before legal strikes can occur is a complete farce. And I absolutely agree with Senator Lambie in her contribution who said we are all fearful of what's going to happen in the next 12 months. Acting Deputy President, I have had many people say to me, um, some of whom do not support our side of politics, that this is the biggest own goal that Labor could ever deliver. This is a massive own goal. This is giving the union movement, the ability to run the country. The only exemption from multi-employer bargaining is for businesses which employ less than 20 people. So apart from all of the other costs and complexity and fears that businesses will have, some 56,000 businesses employ between 20 and 200 people, uh, it will also stop businesses wanting to employ more than 20. So if you're a business that employs 10 or 15 people, why on earth would you want to grow? Why on earth 
acting deputy president, would you say, OK, I want to put in another 10 people? This is a job destroyer, not a job creator. And I'll tell you how we know. We know because this dirty, rotten plan was not revealed by the Labor Party before the election. If this was such a good policy, and uh, senators know this opposite, if this was such a good policy, Labor would have been championing this policy before the election. But no, it was kept a secret. And it was kept a secret for a very good reason. Because if Labor had gone out and spoken about the elements of this bill, Labor would not have got elected. Not in a million years. Because Australians would never endorse these extreme IR changes. They simply wouldn't. They would not trust Labor to give this power, this amount of power, to the unions. Uh, we know, and when we ask for the modelling and estimates, uh, we know that there is not one scintilla of evidence to support the claim that this is good for jobs and good for wages. This is good for the union's game plan. So in reality, the union movement's biggest gift in, is the election of the most extreme left-wing prime minister in living memory, who doesn't have a ticker, who doesn't have the courage, unlike Paul Keating, unlike Bob Hawke, even Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard, who doesn't have what it takes to stand up to the union movement to get the balance right in the best interests of all Australians. So I condemn this bill in the strongest possible terms. I condemn the fact that this is being rushed through without giving the opposition and the crossbench an appropriate amount of time to scrutinise this bill. I condemn the fact that the uh, very rudimentary committee process has not given Australians a proper opportunity to make submissions in relation to this bill. But in, uh, I'm, and I'm only going to confine my remarks uh, to a couple more minutes. But I, I want to share the response of the Geelong Manufacturing Council. We know that nearly every major employer group, every major employer group across this country has condemned this bill. Even the Geelong Manufacturing Council, which was pleading with manufacturers to be exempt from the bill. So this is the first time I have ever seen the Geelong Manufacturing Council come out and make a very partisan um, and make a very um, strong. St Sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll just correct that. This is the first time that I've ever seen the Geelong Manufacturing Council make a very strong statement like this about a government getting a policy wrong. I mean, when we were elected in 2013, Geelong was on its knees, and we worked so closely with the council and with Geelong manufacturers. After Ford decided to shut down under Labor's watch, when our coal was on its knees, uh, successive coalition governments worked to get Geelong to where it is now. And this is an extraordinary development that the Geelong Manufacturing Council is calling on the Senate not to pass this bill. Uh, in fact, in a letter to crossbench senators, the Geelong Manufacturing Council said that the provisions undermine the system of enterprise bargaining and the comprehensive system of modern award, awards that have served manufacturing and employees well for decades. The provisions risk fairly, unfairly subjecting broad sectors to centralised settings of terms and conditions, reducing individual enterprise level autonomy and competitiveness. Uh, the criteria for access to the single interest bargaining and supported bargaining frameworks may be used to achieve industry sector agreements uh, in a wider range of sectors than purportedly intended. So this is ringing the alarm bells, and I say shame on the member for Kerangamite, say shame on the member for Corio, the Deputy Prime Minister, in their own backyard. They have failed to listen to the likes of the Geelong Manufacturing Council and the threat that this poses not just to manufacturers in our region, where my office is based, but for manufacturers around the country. So I say shame on Labor. 
This is a disgrace, along with a decision to abolish the ABCC uh, and, and the Registered Organisations Commission. Uh, this is appalling that the likes of John Setka, of course, celebrating the abolition of the ABCC, uh, saying we're now back in town, we can now move into non-union workplaces. This is the biggest gift for the union movement and the extreme elements of the union movement, but it shows how weak, it shows how pathetic this Labor government is, it shows how weak this Prime Minister is, how weak this Deputy Prime Minister is, who couldn't even stand up for manufacturers in Geelong. This bill is appalling. It's going to set our country backwards, and in the very limited time that we have left, I can only urge Senator Pocock to please have a dramatic change of heart. Allow this bill to be properly considered. Do not pass this bill this week without much more further work. I absolutely condemn this bill in the strongest terms possible. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Henderson. And I call Senator Shoebridge. Uh, thanks, Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise to speak to the Fair Work Legislation Amendment Secure Jobs, Better Pay Bill. And I want to start with commending the work of my colleagues Adam Bant in the other place and my Senate colleague Barbara Pocock in securing, securing important improvements and amendments to this legislation. The Greens are committed to getting workers a fair deal at a time when wages are flatlining and the cost of living is spinning out of control. Poverty ultimately is a political choice. Whether we're talking about the industrial relations setting in this country that privileges profits over wages or the welfare payments that keep millions below the poverty line, we received a clear mandate for action on this and other measures in the election. And this bill? Well, it's a start. The abolition of the ABCC is absolutely critical, and it's an important Order, feature of this Senators. bill. And you can hear the coalition carrying on over there, carrying on over there, because their decade of delivering for the bosses, their decade of delivering for the bosses, it is finally a decade in the past. I was lucky enough to watch the film Lethal Bias in August in this parliament, and a credit to the construction, the CFMMEU, for bringing that to parliament and telling the truth about the ABCC. It's a powerful film, and I'd recommend those who haven't seen it, and I commend it to the coalition, and it shows the real safety risks, the lethal safety risks that construction workers face just for going to work. And it shows the aggressive anti-union bias of the ABCC, shutting down uh, the unions, prosecuting union officials and union members because they have the wrong sticker on their hard hat or fly a flag on the crane. Well, it's about time we abolish the ABCC. It was nothing more than an attempt to weaken unions, to attack the construction unions, regardless of safety, by the now very former Abbott government and its removal, like the removal of that Prime Minister, like the removal of the coalition government, is well overdue. We also strongly support the multi-employer bargaining as an important way of delivering improved wages and conditions, especially for those precarious, low-paid workers in industry like retail and hospitality and childcare. And I want to express my high regard for the work of RAFU, who have been excellent advocates in this space as they have been excellent advocates for their members, and a part of why we're seeing this change, this, this political change and this legal change um, in the law. And it's critically important. It is critically important to ensure that no low-paid workers, no workers, will go backwards with the passage of this bill, because we know already millions of workers are doing it tough, and a serious rebalancing is needed solely in favour of those workers across the country who need a fair wage. And it was always the Greens' goal. It was always the Greens' goal. As we reviewed this bill and sought amendments to it in the other place and here, it was always our goal to ensure that no worker was worse off. And that's why I particularly want to commend the work of my colleagues, their work on ensuring, for example, that there are secured guarantees that parents will have for an enforceable right to request unpaid parental leave. And I credit uh, Senator Pocock with that work. And I also credit the work of, of Adam Bant and the team that protected the existing better off overall test, the boot test, 
and especially its coverage for, pers for prospective workers. The legislation, as originally drafted, would have removed prospective workers from those protections contained in the boot, the better off overall test. And that almost inevitably would have seen those workers having lower wages and worse, and worse conditions than even applied under, under a modern award, a real danger in the original drafting of the bill. And, and thank goodness for the negotiations and the work and the amendments of the Greens to make that to remove those provisions from the bill and protect the boot test. So let's be clear. This will be an important win for workers, especially those low-paid workers. It's a good check on the work that we're doing in this place to do our own boot test on the legislation. And this legislation well and truly satisfies that test. Workers will now have an enforceable right to unpaid parental leave. There will be better work-life balance. They will be able to be multi-employer bargaining, to lift wages, especially in sectors like retail, hospitality and childcare. That's a really good start, but there is so much more to do. To those out there who are doing it tough, working full-time and still struggling to afford rent and bills, we hear you. And we're working to get laws for workers, not just those designed to deliver corporate, corporate profits or the increased returns for billionaire shareholders. And I've got to tell you, there's a long list of work still to be done with this. Whether it's sick leave for casuals, or it's a move away entirely from casual and insecure work towards solid wages and conditions for all workers, and moving towards a four-day working week where we finally get the balance right between work and our families and our social lives. But for now, for now, we're going to stare down the rhetoric and the attacks and the inflated, angry uh, response from the coalition and their few billionaire mates who are opposing this legislation. And we're going to legislate this bill and we're going to take that first seriously, serious step towards making work fair in this country. Thank you very much, Senator Shoebridge. And I call Senator Tyrrell. Mr. President. I rise to speak on the Fair Work Legislation Amendment Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill 2022. We have been saying since the very start that we are happy with the majority of the bill. Even more than that, we are happy with 85 per cent. We are happy to support the changes around low-paid workers in feminised industries and low-paid workers more broadly. I am on board with this. I have worked in low-paid jobs myself. I have actually got family members who are in the paddocks and the factories. They're doing low-paid jobs right now. My partner works in aged care. So believe me, I know how hard it is to make ends meet. I'm here in this place because I want to make good laws that support people who are struggling, but I don't think this is a good law. Not all of it, anyway. This is good law bundled with bad law, and it could be made better, but it won't be. It promises things that will never deliver. I wish the government was right when it says that this is all that's standing between low-paid workers and a pay rise before Christmas. I don't believe that at all. That's less than a month away. We all know that won't happen, and I'm sorry the government has made this false promise. What also makes me upset is that the changes this bill is making go far beyond what the government said it will do. And the government has pushed these major changes through in a really sloppy way. The government has been a little tricky. There are changes in this bill that they didn't tell us they'd be making, changes they didn't tell the voters about during the election campaign. This bill will change how employees work with their employers on reaching an agreement about pay and other entitlements. It will change how businesses work with each other to bargain with their employees. It will change who regulates the building and construction industry and registered organisations. It will change how and when strikes can take place. People have raised concerns with us about some of these changes. We were told that the wishes of small business and their employees could be vetoed by unions, even if those employees aren't part of the unions. We were told that some employees would be worse off with the changes to flexible work arrangements. Those employees are on a good wicket at the moment. They don't want these changes but they'd have to go along with it. We were told that an employer would be included in a bargaining process, even if they didn't want to be. These things don't seem fair to me. I don't understand why one side should have it better than the other. 
We shouldn't be favouring unions over business. We shouldn't be favouring business over unions. I think there should be equality between both sides in a workplace bargain, and that bill doesn't do this. That's why we wanted the government to split this bill. We were happy to pass the 85 per cent. But there's a whole bunch of changes that will be coming with this bill that we wanted more time to look at. We wanted to look more closely at the concerns that were raised with us, concerns like those I just mentioned. Maybe we need all of these changes. The government certainly thinks we do. They think if we don't support it, we aren't in favour of getting wages moving. Well, I don't agree with that. I'm in favour of higher wages, of better awards. I'd be happy if the government used its power to make those kind of changes as soon as possible. But I can't stand here with my hand in my heart and say that I agree with all the changes this bill makes. I can't honestly tell you that you'd be better off. The parts of this bill that don't work can be fixed, but that takes time and it's what we have been denied throughout this whole process. We need time to get this right. I don't want to get something like this wrong. It's not just me. The negotiations on this bill have been hard. The minister will be the first one to tell you that. I want to talk a bit about the process now because that's important too. The bill is 250 goddamn pages long, and we've just had a month to consider it. A couple of weeks after the bill was introduced, the government put up 150 amendments in the other place—150 of them. That came to 34 pages. This means the government has asked us to consider almost 300 pages of changes to the industrial relations system in the last month. These aren't little changes. They are fundamental changes. And that's not it. There will be more. The government will be putting up a bunch of other amendments that will get Senator Pocock over the line. I haven't seen these amendments yet. How am I supposed to satisfy myself that my vote is in the best interests of the people of Tassie, employees and employers? I'm sorry to say it, but this whole process has been a bit of a mess. Why didn't the government just try to get this right the first time? If the government took the time to draft this legislation well, if it gave us time to consider these changes in detail, maybe I wouldn't be standing here saying I'm going to be abstaining. I cannot, in good conscience, endorse a bill that has been amended in terms I haven't seen, that I haven't been given the chance to see. I don't want to block this bill, but I wish we had a government that would work with us to find a path to back it, all of it, not just 85 per cent. If the government had worked with us slowly and carefully, maybe they wouldn't have needed to introduce 150 amendments in the House and more in the Senate. There are no winners here, but I hope the people back home know that I'm trying to do my best by all of them. And it hasn't been easy. My hope is that these concerns that have been raised with us have been addressed through the amendments in the other place and through the amendments Senator Pocock has secured. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Tyrrell, and I call Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. I too rise to speak in the Fair Work Legislation Amendment, and I can hardly say the word secure jobs and better pay bill, because it will do neither. And Senator Tyrrell, brava to you. That was a great articulation of everything that is wrong with this bill and the utter disgrace it is. And I'm absolutely Many of my colleagues have gone through the many ways that this is destructive, duplicitous, lack of transparency, consultation for the largest change to our IR system in over 30 years. And the government is introducing, as we've heard, 250 pages of legislation that this place has had less than a month to review, 150 amendments plus all of these uh, nurses' ball amendments that Senator Pocock has with the greatest degree of hubris I've heard in this chamber in uh, eight years, that he is suddenly riding in on a big white horse to save us all from having to do the job that we do very well, to scrutinise important, significant legislation for this nation. And all I could help thinking about last night, listening to Senator Pocock's quite extraordinary contribution to this debate, 
where he referred to himself over a hundred times. I've never heard anybody talk about themselves so much in a speech. But it was like he was coming in, this great activist, to come in and to save Australian workers as if he is the only person in this place who wants people to have jobs and to have good conditions and as high wages as can be afforded. But, colleagues, let me tell you, Senator Pocock is not riding in a big white horse into Australia to help us all single-handedly. He is riding the trade union Trojan horse into workplaces right across this nation. And it is a disgrace. And sadly, Senator Pocock, this, the way you have behaved on this legislation, it was clear last night you believed what you were saying, that you can have consultations Order. on behalf of Senator the ACT Reynolds, through the you to make your remarks chair. to the chair. Thank you. Senator Pocock can uh, you know, say that he's saving the people of the ACT through the few consultations he's had with businesses here in the ACT. Uh, and somehow it's okay to do that on behalf of all other Australian workers. Well, through you, Chair, I say this to Senator Pocock. This will be your legacy in this place. As Senator Tyrrell has said, this will have devastating consequences. It has not been properly considered. You have decided, because you are in a very, very important position in the balance of power as a new senator, and you have used it. Now, in one sense, I hope that you have genuinely been duped by Labor and the ACTU uh, on these nurses' ball deals and amendments that you've done that we have not yet to see. And I hope that it's been you've duped and it's not the 30 pieces of silver. Either way, whatever Order, uh, ever reason Reynolds, it is— I just remind you uh, once again to make your remarks to the chair and to be careful in refraining from— I will. From, so uh, I hope, instead of any other alternative, I withdraw that expression. Instead Senator, of any Senator other Reynolds, intention, Senator Reynolds, you haven't got the call yet. Just reminding you to think about the words before you speak and to impugn another senator by a, a lie, a, you know, allocating a motive. We've had a we've had a bit of a riff on that today, so we might avoid that if possible. So if you if you would like to continue your remarks, just please be mindful of those two points. Yeah, I, withdraw, I withdraw that, and I'm sorry, I got a bit carried away with my anger at this bill and what has been done by uh, those opposite, the Greens and Labor, with the support of a new senator to this place, well-intentioned, but who I believe has been completely duped. And I hope it is just duping and nothing, nothing else. So this bill uh, is of great concern to Western Australians. Uh, and unfortunately, there has been no opportunity for West Australian businesses, large and small, to actively engage and comprehensively provide submissions and input into this uh, process. Because, again, this place, those opposite, with the support of uh, Senator Pocock, have denied the normal processes. So I say shame on all of you because we know what is going to happen. It will not result in an increase in uh, real wages for Australian workers. It will increase exponentially the activism and the reach of trade union movements, which, of course, is what this was all about. And Senator Polly gave away the game last night when she interjected, when one of my colleagues was commenting uh, that you know, this hadn't been consulted. And Senator Polly interjected by saying, well, of course, we're the Labor Party. What else did you expect we were going to do? And I think that says it all about the ethics and the behaviour of those opposite on this bill. So I too say to, through you, Chair, to Senator Pocock, as other speakers have done, it is not too late to say, I was wrong. We do need more time. We need time to go through the legislation for the committee to do further scrutiny, for all Australians to have the opportunity to engage those who want to, and for this place to do what it does best on behalf of all Australians, and that is scrutinising legislation and amendments in a careful, deliberate way on a bill that will be the most consequential on Australian workers in the last 30 years. So for all of those reasons and 
all of the reasons that my colleagues here have in great detail uh, said why this is such bad legislation. I would urge those opposite. It is not too late because this is not in the best interests of Australian workers. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Reynolds. Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Deputy President. And, uh, I wasn't intending to give a uh, contribution to this important debate, but I received a letter today which made me think I should actually make sure that these views are put on record. And I won't be uh, taking up too much of the Chamber's time, for I know it is short. Uh, but it was a letter we received, all Tasmanian senators received today, from the Launceston Chamber of Commerce. And I think it is important to put this on record, given the contents of the letter. And I'm going to read it out, and I think it's important. I'm glad I've got a couple of Tasmanian colleagues here um, to hear me do so. I'm sure they've received the letter, but let's give it voice in this debate, because they have been excluded from consultation on this important piece of legislation which will change the IR landscape in this country. So the letter received today at around lunchtime reads as follows. Dear Senator, uh, regarding the Fair Work Legislation Amendment Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill 2022, the Launceston Chamber of Commerce is seriously concerned with the Fair Work Legislation Amendment Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill 2022, uh, otherwise known as the bill, and the effect that it will have on business in Launceston and northern Tasmania, particularly on our small and medium enterprises. In July of this year, Businesses were faced with increasing wage costs, increased super guarantee contributions and now surging electricity prices. Many businesses are still recovering from the dramatic effect of COVID-19 and, uh, and currently there are very few industries that aren't facing the demands of doing business with staff shortages. Uh, with the cost of living increasing, it's expected that discretionary spending will drop and as a consequence, many of our small and medium businesses will see a drop in revenue. The last thing businesses need is rushed new rules and more red tape. According to an article in the Australian Financial Review, the regulatory impact statement prepared by the Department of Employment and Workplace Relations showed that small businesses can expect the bargaining process to cost an, on average $14,638. For medium businesses, $75,148, and large businesses, $94,311. These are costs that businesses may not be able to afford and may seriously jeopardise the future of businesses, particularly small and medium businesses in northern Tasmania. In addition to the above concerns, we're equally concerned with one, the pace at which the bill has progressed through the parliament, two, and while we appreciate that amendments to the bill will see businesses with 15 staff or less excluded from the, the bill, it still means that small businesses with over 15 employees will be forced to adopt workplace arrangements and pay rates that they have had no role in negotiating. And we also question the decision to use actual staffing numbers rather than FTEs. While we appreciate the Australian government wants to pass the bill this year, this is an incredibly busy time for most businesses and we believe it should be held off until the new parliamentary term. Above all, we are seriously concerned that business organisations such as the Launceston Chamber of Commerce were not consulted at all or engaged with during the drafting of this legislation. The Launceston Chamber of Commerce does not support the bill and joins the Australian Chamber of Commerce, the Tasmanian Chamber of Commerce and Industry and other business chambers from around Australia in calling the Senate to split the bill to allow further time for careful examination of businesses' concerns. And failing this, we urge the Senate to oppose the bill. And the letter was sent from Kate Daly, the President, uh, and Will Cassidy, the Executive Officer. Um, and uh, I think it is important to put those concerns on record uh, because um, as I say, uh, the fact that an entity like that had not been consulted in the drafting of the legislation, and uh, to me that is extremely concerning. The LCCI is one of the peak bodies in Tasmania, and I know, uh, Acting Deputy President, that Senator Brown and Senator Urquhart, uh, one very fine southern Tasmanian senator and one very fine northern Tasmanian senator there, uh, Northwestern, beg your pardon, you are quite right, not that parochialism is something that's rife in our state, um, but uh, would be equally concerned, uh, without putting words in their mouths, about the lack of consultation that occurred on the drafting of this bill. The fact that we have legislation before this parliament, when entities like that, that represent employer groups, have had no input, no consultation on the initial draft on the proposed amendments, and I, I note that we have now have Senator Askew here as well, uh, another fine northern Tasmanian senator who would share the concerns that the Launceston Chamber of Commerce have 
uh, provided to us today, another recipient of this letter. And so, look, when we are talking about these extreme industrial relations laws, we have to acknowledge the points that have been made by many in this debate so far. The devastating impact that some of these changes are going to have, particularly on small to medium business enterprises. And we know, and I know you know, Acting Deputy President, that in small regional communities on the beautiful coast of New South Wales, we don't have large employers, we don't have big multinationals occupying hundreds of square metres, employing hundreds of people. They're small to medium businesses, and they're the ones who are going to be hit hardest by this. They're the ones who are going to find it hard to make ends meet with, as uh, the President and the EO of the Launceston Chamber of Commerce and Industry have said, this confluence of increasing costs, it's surging it's a fine organisation, as Senator Bragg says, uh, these increasing costs, surging electricity prices, uh, the costs on maintaining uh, property and assets, the cost of meeting employee expenses, um, they all come together and they put pressure on businesses like there is no tomorrow. And in the end, if a business can't make ends meet, if it can't continue to trade, then what are they going to do? They don't operate in perpetuity. They don't just keep trading uh, forever without facing financial pressure and ultimately closing their doors. And what happens when a business closes its doors? Employees lose their jobs. I tell you what, there is one thing worse than not getting a pay rise. It's not having a job. You don't get paid. And this is the problem with this. I don't think the consequences have been properly enunciated here. Uh, and certainly, as I say, the most alarming thing, uh, and I made the point earlier on, I was not intending to make a contribution on this bill. I think my colleagues have very fairly and well canvassed the concerns that have been raised by those in our community who will be impacted, both employees and employers. Uh, but reading this letter and the fact that this organisation, so central to Northern Tasmania's economy, to small and medium enterprises, has not had a say. And I wonder where Senator Polly, for example, or whether any of the Labor senators from Tasmania have reached out to the Launceston Chamber of Commerce and Industry as proponents of the legislation, as proponents of the legislation, and I, I do admire Senator Urquhart's wishful thinking that when I hear an alarm I might stop. But I will not. I shall continue. I know. I'm uh, alert but not alarmed. So the point being though, I wonder whether any of the Tasmanian Labor Senate contingent have reached out to the Launceston Chamber of Commerce and whether they would accept my invitation today to come on down and I'll join Senator Askew when we get out of this place at the end of this week. I'll drive to Launceston and I will meet you there and we can sit down with the board of this organisation. We can perhaps sit down with some of their members and we can talk through some of their concerns. Now, it will be interesting to see whether they will be able to sit there and look into the eyes of these businesses that are facing these increased costs and tell them, hey, don't worry. It's, it's all a scare campaign. It will make no difference or whether they will hear these concerns and finally realise that these increased costs that are going to get even larger will have an impact on their businesses and will have an impact on the capacity to employ, will have an impact on whether these jobs continue to exist. How can a small business cover the cost, on average, of $14,638 to engage in this process, to have a regulatory, uh, to, to engage in this process, uh, the bargaining process. How can a medium business fork out well on the way to eighty thousand dollars? Where is that in a business's operating capital in, on any given year? How is this fair to mum and dad businesses, where the people who own the business have mortgaged their homes? to ensure that they can keep businesses running. They've taken a risk. They're employing others. How is this in any way fair on those businesses? It is the opinion of the opposition, and I'm sure organisations like the Launceston Chamber of Commerce, that these changes will result in more industrial action. These changes will result in more strikes. These changes will result in a situation where there will be a reduction in productivity. This harms the economy more broadly and, again, is going to have an impact on whether people are able to keep their jobs or not. This is the end result. This is the issue we are talking about here. And everyone wants a pay rise. And you know what? It's good that people get pay rises. 
I know that in my family, who have run small businesses up until very recently, they always paid above award. And that's good because you have to do that to attract good employees. No one wants to employ a bad employee, and you want to treat good employees well so they stay. So you do what you can to keep them. But in this situation where costs are going to become so burdensome on a business, even paying the wage bill is going to become impossible. As I said before, the end result will be a business can no longer operate. It will no longer be solvent, perhaps. It will look at laying off staff to make ends meet. Uh, so, and to that end, uh, I um, share the Launceston Chamber of Commerce's concerns. I do support the views that they've expressed, and I look forward to Senator Brown, Senator Urquhart, Senator Polly and Senator Billick coming on a drive with me to Launceston to catch up with the good folk of the Launceston Chamber of Commerce and justifying to them why they support this disastrous bill. Thank you, Senator Dunningham. Senator Bragg. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. And this is an important opportunity for all of us to make some remarks on this bill and this bill, which is part of the Labor government's agenda for business, apparently, for driving the economy. Uh, and this is one of their major initiatives. Now, um, I have often referred to this government as the government for vested interests, TM, um, trademark, perhaps at some stage. And the reason I call it the government for vested interests is because it will catch on, don't worry. Um, because uh, if you are a class action law firm or you are a super fund, a big industry super fund, or you're a union, you go to the top of the list. Uh, your log of claims, your grievances that you may have about your legal situation uh, are considered very carefully by this government. If you are a punter, you're a consumer, uh, you've got no chance of getting your issues examined by this government because uh, these organisations, who are fellow travellers with the Labor, Labor Party, some of them are financial fellow travellers, some of them are social groupies, perhaps, uh, they, are, they are dominating this government's agenda. Now, I'm not a terribly partisan person, and I um, uh, have sometimes agreed with the Labor Party. Um, over the years. Um, but you have to say that the budget, which is supposed to be the centrepiece of any government's overall economic strategy, was extraordinary in its lack of focus on small business and extraordinary in its lack of focus on driving private investment and growth. And that is because when you are solely focused on working through a log of claims from various bloodsuckers and rent seekers, uh, that you miss the broader economic issues that the country faces. And so what the budget did not have was a set of policies to drive enter enterprise, a set of policies to drive small business. Instead, we see a hodgepodge of random pieces of legislation which have clogged up this parliament, which have all been written down at Trades Hall or Cassenden Place, or wherever all the super funds people live, or down at, the, um, down at the class action law firms. And the manifestation of being the government for vested interests is legislation for vested interests. Now, about 120 years ago, there were these two countries called Australia and Argentina, and they were both similarly quite wealthy. And, and Australia and Argentina went down very different tracks in the 20th century. For the, in the main, Australia has been run generally quite well by people that were prepared to take a broader view, take the public interest into account when creating economic policies. I mean, some of those policies have been bad, but I think they were genuinely created with the view to take the public interest into account. Meanwhile, our friends in Argentina had their governments overrun by vested interests, small cabals of people and groups that put their narrow first interest, their narrow self-interest, 
ahead of the national interest. They put themselves at the centre of the economic and policy settings of that country. And we are now in a situation where a small group of organisations, and that's what they have their organisations, of unions and super funds and class action law firms, are now basically being given the keys to the city. And we have heard in this chamber many times over these past weeks a discussion about Mr Stephen Jones, who is the Assistant Treasurer. And now, so far, he'd be winning the gold medal in terms of the government for vested interests. He would be the chief. He's, he's the chief feather of nests in the uh, in the government for vested interests. But uh, Mr Dreyfus is probably not too far behind with his efforts on class action law lawyers. And of course, uh, the silver medalist here is Mr Burke with this uh, this hodgepodge uh, bill that we're considering here. But it's all part of the same big plan to try and deliver. Now, uh, as I said, I'm not a very partisan person, but I do, from time to time, think about politics uh, as being a sitting politician, parliamentarian, and it's clear that the Labor Party's political strategy here is to pay off all these people, get them off our backs so we don't have to do any more of this crap um, in the next, next two years of our term, because their, their view uh, is that this stuff uh, is probably uh, not too flash for the economy. I'm sure that, that's, their, that's their real view. And they've just got to get these people off their backs. This is the payoff. This is the payoff. So putting the unions back in the centre of the economy, stripping away transparency from super fund members, um, and removing regulations to require class action law firms to act in the best interest of their members. So that's just a pay, pay off. And then maybe, maybe when we get to year two, we might think about um, what are the broader issues that the economy is facing, and what are the, and we might do a budget which might mention small business. Maybe we can discover what small business is, um, one that hasn't been you know, unionised and run into the ground. Uh, but of course, when you hate small business, when it's in your DNA, I guess you tend to forget about it some some days. Um, sometimes you can hate and forget about things. Trust me. Um, so um, we might see a budget that mentions small business. Uh, we might even see a budget which presents some policies designed to increase private investment, because that is actually going to be the measure of whether or not this economy is going to be able to create more jobs in the future. More jobs. More jobs in the future. That is the, uh, that, that is the stated objective, I'm sure. And of course, wages, higher wages we hear about. Now, I've got to say, of all the strange things that people get away with in this building, this is perhaps the greatest of them all. The unions and the Labor Party talking about their concern about wages. But of course, if they were really worried about wages, they would have listened to Mr Kennedy's address uh, to Senate Estimates, uh, where he has said that 80 per cent of the wages increases which are projected in the budget are eaten by increases in compulsory super. So here we are again, another scheme to enrich the f and, and re-feather the nest. I mean, it's a pretty good nest. I tell you what, it's, it's a pretty flash nest. It's warm, you know, get you through a Canberra winter, and uh, it's a good, it's a nice nest. But the nest is eating up the wages increases. So they come into the chamber and talk about their concerns about the lack of wages growth. Well, 80 per cent of the wages growth is not actually going to the workers. It's going off to the bloodsuckers at the super funds to charge high fees on it um, into a locked box that they can't get access to. But of course, that, that, that is a blind spot to these people. The Labor Party has a series of blind spots. And of course, in the budget we see this hilarious policy called the Housing Accord, which is basically that we will pay the super funds $350 million to buy people's houses and build people's houses, perhaps. This is on top of the $150 billion that they receive each and every year in compulsory contributions, as measured by APRA. So we're going to give the super funds public, more public money to own houses, own the people's houses. But of course, we're against the people using their own super to have their own house. So they are so blinded by the, the, by the propaganda and the, the ideology that they've eaten and consumed for 30 years, which is now pushed 
and recirculated by the vested interests, which make huge donations to their party, and of course are filtered through the super funds. And this takes us back to our other favourite issue, the removal of transparency from the super funds. So um, Mr Jones' first act as the assistant treasurer was to remove transparency from the super funds. So, um, by the end of this decade, $30 million will be, be paid from the super funds into the unions—$30 million. Um, but Mr Jones has now made a regulation which covers, covers that up. Now, people are now getting their annual statements, their member statements from their super funds. I got one today. And it's now aggregated, so you can't actually see how much money is going where. Under our regulation, you could see, OK, I'm in super fund A and it sent um, you know, $3 million to this union. It sent $5 million to this related party, and now you can't see any of that information. So it is a very good example of the distorted priorities of this government of vested interests. But in relation to these matters, um, you would have to say that the, the, the king or maybe the chief of the vested interests is probably the ACTU. It could be, though, it could be the CBUS Superfund. Uh, they have a fellow called Mr Wayne Swan is their president. And he's also the president of the Labor Party, and so he's been out in the media this week saying that the Seabus Super Fund will be will be giving $500 million of, of their money to the housing accord, which we have no idea how it will actually work. Uh, but I'm thinking maybe he could have some inside information because he's got the, the dual hat thing happening. He's running the Labor Party and he's running the Seabus Super Fund, so he must know how the scheme works before the rest of the market knows, uh, which is another example of these vested interests. But of course, in relation to this bill, this is designed to smash small business. Labor hates small business. They always have. And they've always hated the idea that there are no union officials on these sites. And this is designed to try and turn the clock back, not to try and create any jobs, certainly not designed to create a higher wage environment. I mean, if they wanted to, to, to do that, then they would have made the super system uh, voluntary in some form. No, this is really about ensuring that there is a role and relevance and funding for their greatest cash cow, the unions. And when the Labor Party talk about a donation reform and a campaign finance reform, I always think that's a great thing to hear about because, of course, they always want to try and capture the political parties but leave out the key campaigners, the people with the most money who run campaigns in this country, the unions, the super funds and all their other fellow travellers. I mean, personally, I think we are going in the wrong direction on this particular issue. Uh, I have long favoured the idea of a very simple, very clean uh, small business award with basic conditions that protect people uh, from exploitation and, and whatnot. Uh, but we are going in the wrong direction. We are going for the full re-regulation by putting these vested interests back at the centre of negotiations. I mean, why, why would a business, a small business, that doesn't have any members of the union, that doesn't want to have anything to do with the union, have to negotiate with the union? I mean, it's just—it's absolutely insane um, to think that 10 per cent of the workforce now is covered by unions, and we're trying to turn ourselves into a, a nimble, nim, nimble, agile uh, economy competing with the rest of the world, trying to attract marginal capital and trying to attract uh, the best minds the world has to offer. And here we are trying to bung up the economy with all these um, additional obligations to, to bring, bring the past back into the future. I mean, it is just absolutely insane. But as I say, when, you, when your frame of reference is, well, we don't put small business in our budget, therefore we don't care about it, we historically haven't liked it, it's probably not, not a great surprise that here we are saying, OK, we're actually now going to bring the unions back into the small business world. But of course, the, the whole idea of multi-employer bargaining uh, which is estimated to cost uh, up to 23k for a small business, which is a significant sum for a small business. Um, I mean, when you've only ever spent your whole life working for a, the public service, I guess you don't really have uh, any sense of that. Of course, it would cost 130k for a medium business, and even more for a large business. But I mean, the, the principles apply. I mean, the segmentation between large and small I've always thought was quite quite weird. I mean. We, we want small businesses to become large businesses. There's nothing wrong with big businesses. Certainly, um, multinational corporations that uh, do things like engaging in base erosion and, and tax evasion should be brought to heel. But there's nothing wrong with a big business. 
Uh, and so the idea that we try and bung, bung up the works with the big businesses uh, actually is the same logic you would apply to the small business. So in terms of the carve-outs that have been negotiated here, um, I mean, I'm not sure how good they'll be because my, my starting principle would be why do you need to have a union involved with these uh, businesses in the first place? Um, um, given you already have extensive legal protections in, in the law, and the people that are saying they're worried about wages growth, I mean, they're the same people that are stealing the money through the compulsory super increases. I mean, they're taking, ta they're taking 80 per cent of the wages increases. So every time I hear these people come in here or talk out there when they're doing their silly press conferences, talk about wages, it is absolute rubbish. This whole agenda and this government's focus is on the vested interests and making that great big cushy feathered nest a goose or down pillow and making it as best as they can for themselves. They're only interested in their own narrow self-interest and unless we're careful we will be the next Argentina, a once strong country run into the ground by dodgy and dirty vested interests. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Senator Rennick. And uh, unfortunately, I have to rise and speak on this bill. Uh, it's disappointing to have to do so because all of my life, uh, you know, I've always categorised the Labor Party as being the wreckers of the Australian workforce. I grew up listening to my father constantly tell me how the Wolfies went on strike in World War II, uh, wouldn't help our troops out, um, wouldn't export our wool, etc., etc. And if this bill, I don't really see this bill as being the final nail in the coffin for a small industry and small business here in Australia. No, no, no. The Labor Party put the final nail in the coffin uh, a long time ago uh, into the coffin small business. I call this the grave diggers bill. Basically, you know, we're now chucking dirt on small business so that they'll be completely forgotten about uh, and erased from history six feet under with this ridiculous idea that we can have multi-pattern and bargaining. But that is the Labor for you. They have to mandate everything. Every rules, they just have to. There's no, there's no individual in the Labor Party's psyche. No, 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 no. It's, it's just communism. We're going to own all the property. We're going to have one set of rules. And we see that constantly. Everything the Labor Party does is all about centralisation, command and control. We saw it with the superannuation in the early 90s, where they have slowly but surely raised the superannuation level from 2 per cent to 12 per cent, and if they get their way, they get a second term, they're already talking about lifting it to 15 per cent. Why don't you just take 100 per cent of it now? Do you know what I mean? This is, this is the Labor Party. It's like childcare. They want to tell parents if you, get, you want any childcare support, you have to, have to give it to the childcare centre because that way they get to unionise parenthood. This is actually why they push childcare so high, because without childcare, the union movement, which is down to about 10 per cent of the workforce, would be much, much lower. Child, the, the only sort of childcare union that is rising in this country is the United Voice because of the subsidies going into the childcare sector. And it goes on and on and on. We see it with the renewable energy target. Started off at 5 per cent, then it went to 23 per cent, then it's got to go to 43 per cent, then it's going to be net zero. And it, it'll go on and on and on. Um, but uh, it, it's important to note uh, just how much damage the Labor Party has done to industry, especially small business. And I, and I just want to reflect on the election uh, last weekend, and of course Labor's gloating because they won. They won the election. That's right. But you know who lost? Victoria. But Victoria didn't lose the election last. Uh, you know, lose lose out last weekend. They started to lose out 40 years ago when the, um, the former Labor senator for Victoria, uh, John Button, introduced a, the Button Plan, which basically saw the destruction, which was the first step in the destruction of the manufacturing industry in Victoria. Victoria was once the jewel in the crown of the Liberal Party because of that strong manufacturing base that has had the guts ripped out of it. Uh, and if they weren't forced to close down, they've gone offshore because effectively we had this crazy neoliberal ideology that somehow we were going to compete against cheap Asian imports, uh, which never happened. And all that's done is destroy Victoria. 
And you combine that, the Button Plan in 85 with the Dawkins Plan in 1990, where everyone got to go to university and get a degree. So because of that, that ridiculous um, policy that was introduced, another crazy Hawke Keating uh, policy, is that we've now got the situation whereby uh, we've got all of these students and these Marxist academics controlling Victoria. And then a couple of years later, we got the compulsory superannuation, which gave us another army of financial engineers uh, in Victoria. And most of the industry super funds are, are, are centred out of um, uh, Victoria, despite the fact that you know th these guys have over, you know, over, well, I think they're well over a trillion dollars, but there's over three trillion dollars now in super and climbing. I mean, it is effectively going to be bigger than our GDP, and this this wealth is is centralised in the hands of unelected uh, board members. Of, you want to talk about democracy, mate? I'm telling you, we are not living in a democratic society in this Australia, in this country. When you have got trillions of dollars of wealth and our infrastructure controlled by unelected superannuation boards, both, both uh, private and, and industry. I'm not taking sides when it comes to superannuation. The whole lot of it is communi communism and Marxism and fascism rolled into one, if you ask me. Um, but I can tell you that with, with the fact that we then walked away from TAFE and hands-on uh, people that actually built things in this country, destroyed our manufacturing sector, destroyed our small business, we have now got more people, more people on the teat of the nation, uh, relying on government handouts, uh, you know, through universities, through increasing, ever increasing superannuation policy, um, uh, academics, you name it, uh, has made our country very, very unproductive, very, very unproductive. And then we move forward two generations when we had the introduction of the Fair Work Act, and of course, there's nothing fair about the Fair Work Act. And interestingly enough, the head of the Fair Work Commission was Ian Ross, who Paul Keating himself admitted uh, was the architect uh, of superannuation, along with himself and Bill Kelty. And of course, they must have been sitting back there in a room somewhere in the early 90s thinking, you know, how, how can we take over this country? I, I've, I've got to hand it. I've got to hand it to the Labor Party, because when it comes to bringing in communism by stealth in this country, you guys have done a very, very good job of it. Because I've got to admit, while our guys are out there talking about free markets, and I can tell you I've had over you know, 30 years in finance, I've never seen freedom as a line item on the balance sheet. If you want to be free, you've got to be productive. Our freedom comes from affluence, which comes from productivity, and we should never, ever forget that. Indeed, Robert Menzies himself said we should not go back to the old and selfish notions of laissez faire. And he also said that the rich and powerful should look after themselves. But what we should be focused on, while we were focusing on the so-called you know, ideology of the free market, the, the, the left over here, the unions, were actually ripping out uh, increasing, ever-increasing amounts of superannuation uh, from workers' pay packets. Now, I, I fail to see how you think we can either live in a country with a free market when the government is taking a percentage of the workers' wages, never even asked them. There was never a referendum about superannuation in this country. New Zealand had a referendum about compulsory superannuation. They voted against it 92 per cent to eight. Right? No, no, we weren't asked about that in this country. The Labor Party just decided to jack it up, jack it up, and they're pinching money. I mean, this is super, right? This is what they do with superannuation, they have that little ad where they do this. Well, I'll tell you what this is symbolic for. This is then what happens is that the industry fees take their fees like this, the industry funds, and then Labor comes along and picks up the fees behind their back just like that. That is the way um, that the Labor Party work, uh, and that is, you know, this is another you know, bit of compliance on small business. When you've got to fill out your superannuation forms, you've got all these rules. It's more compliance uh, for small business, uh, and it takes a lot of time. I've worked. Uh, in uh, public practices before, and it's very time-consuming just to even pay that extra nine, going on to ten, ten and a half percent. But can I say this bill is riddled with so much conflict uh, uh, and complexity and uncertainty? Um, you know, and the industry is extremely concerned. Uh, they don't want to be dragged into multi-enterprise bargaining, and it's based on this very no, uh, uh, vague notion of a common interest. Common interest. Well, I can tell you that common interest is, is, is double speak for communism. Uh, it's effectively, um, uh, you know, how on earth, I can just see this ending up in courts. Can you just imagine fair work, going to fair work, 
uh, with the word common interest and when you've got you know, Fair Work stacked with Labor appointees, they are going to be actually you know, punishing small business every opportunity they get. Uh, and it is going to make it very difficult. And this is going to actually punish the workers of this country because small business just won't want to employ anybody um, when, when they, don't, you know, they, they can be held to ransom by such vague terms as common interest. Uh, and I, I don't know about you, but you know, it, it's all these vague notions just do my head in. Coming from a background in mathematics, I, I've got to find all these warm and fuzzy terms that Labor used to hide their, their communism and Marxism and all of this sort of stuff. It's all very scary. It's all very, very scary. But I can assure you what this bill will do, apart from put people out of work, it's going to increase the cost of living. Um, and if it doesn't send businesses broke, it's going to send them offshore. And it's certainly not going to you know, attract other uh, companies coming in and setting up business here. Because why would you, when you can be held to ransom, uh, by the Fair Work Act, um, it's it's a real concern uh, that um, you know Labor want to bring in, and it's not surprising because this is what Labor do. They aren't going to finish. They aren't going to stop until there is no more private property left in this country, and free thought is completely destroyed. No, 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 no. We don't want private property in this country. This is the way the Labor Party think, and we don't want businesses to be flexible and innovative and to be able to think for themselves. And we don't want the employee and the employer to build up a relationship between each other. Right? That's, you know, and this is what with enterprise bargaining, you know, you could trust you know, the, the employer and employee. You know, we would let them actually negotiate the best terms and tailor the best terms that suited them. That's why I don't believe in any mandates. That's why I took a stand on vaccine mandates, because I think you've got to respect the individual. That is what this party should stand for, which is the dignity and worth of every individual. It's got to uh, stand for the freedom of choice, the freedom of conscience. We've got to have flexibility, the ability to innovate, and that sort of stuff is what creates enterprise and entrepreneurship that will drive productivity in this country. And with productivity comes affluence, and with affluence becomes freedom and the ability not to have to rely on that big Order, sucking monolith. Senator Rennick, uh, the time for your debate has expired. It being after 6:30 p.m., all of the questions on the second reading will now be put. The current question before the chair is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator O'Sullivan on behalf of Senator Cash on sheet 1697 be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
lock the doors. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator O'Sullivan on behalf of Senator Cash on sheet 1697 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator O'Sullivan, teller for the ayes, and Senator Shikoni, teller for the noes. Order. The result of the division is ayes 29, noes 32. The question is resolved in the negative. We have another second reading amendment foreshadowed by Senator Brockman that I am waiting for him to get into his chair to move. Senator Brockman. Uh, I move the second reading amendment in my name as circulated on sheet. One double seven two. Correct. Uh, <laughs> the question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Brockman on sheet one seven seven two be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Teller for the no's.
Order. The result of the division is ayes 29, noes 31. The question is resolved in the negative. The question now is that the bill be read a second time. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for I'm looking for some guidance from the whips. Four minutes. Lock the doors. The question is that the bill be read a second time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Shikoni, teller for the ayes, and Senator O'Sullivan, teller for the noes.
Order. The result of the division is ayes 32, noes 30. The question is resolved in the affirmative. And I'll call the clerk. <laughs> A bill for an act to abolish the Registered Organisations Commission and the Australian Building and Construction Commission and to amend the law relating to workplace relations and workers' compensation and rehabilitation and for related purposes.